اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم تبارک الذی بیده الملک وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فارجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا بمصابيح وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين وأعتدنا لهم عذاب السعير وللذين كفروا بربهم عذاب جهنم وبئس المصير إذا ألقوا فيها سمعوا لها شهيقا وهي تفور تكاد تميز من الغيظ كلما ألقي فيها فوج سألهم خزنتها سألهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم نذير قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير فكذبنا وقلنا وقلنا ما نزل الله من شيء إن أنتم إلا في ضلال كبير وقالوا لو كنا نسمع أو نعقل ما كنا في أصحاب السعير فاعترفوا بذنبهم فسحقا لأصحاب السعير إن الذين يخشون ربهم بالغيب لهم مغفرة وأجر كبير وأسروا قولكم أو اجهروا به إنه عليم بذات الصدور ألا يعلم من خلق وهو اللطيف الخبير الذي جعل لكم الأرض ذلولا فامشوا في مناكبها وكلوا من رزقه وكلوا من رزقه وإليه النشور أأمنتم من في السماء بكم الأرض فإذا هي تمور أم أمنتم من في السماء أن يرسل عليكم حاصبا 
profiting from the resources and opportunities of the digital age the first international conference on global academia during and post covid-19 aims to address the transformation process by bringing together leading policy makers academic scientists researchers teacher trainers and teachers in an international setting to present and discuss the most recent innovations trends and concerns as well as many of the practical challenges encouraged in, encountered during the covid situation its focus is on identifying solutions for the adaptation the solution for the adaptation of education into a digi digital ecosystem by providing a creative platform for inspirational exchanges interactions and scientific debate on practices and research related to the education on use of blended learning in the pedagogical process the rapidly evolving role of a teacher has made teaching profession extremely challenging and more difficult than ever federal college of education has this taken this challenge as an opportunity and has organized this first international event which is unique and a role model for the rest of the educational institution dear participants let me share with you that we received an overwhelming feedback from our participants yesterday especially our worthy minister of education and professional training mr shafkat mahmood passed very encouraging remarks and appreciated us for organizing this international event which was the need of the time yesterday uh, was the first day of this international conference and there were four sessions which were proceeded in that conference five papers were presented and about uh, 16 uh, 16 speakers they participated and uh, discussed the theme of the conference now i would like uh, i'm pleased i'm pleased to announce that our guest of honor federal parliamentary secretary mrs wajia akram has joined us welcome ma'am i request ma'am wajia to please share her thoughts for the theme of the conference today ma'am thank you samia it's always an absolute pleasure assalamu alaikum uh, and a very good morning it's an occasion of happiness and satisfaction for me that i have the opportunity to talk to you to the future builders of the nation in such a great ceremony welcome to all uh, international and national participants and congratulations to federal college of education on organizing its first international conference on global academia during and post covid 19 
teaching and learning process has become more challenging due to pandemic and federal college of education has tried to convert this challenge into an opportunity covid-19 has definitely posed unprecedented challenges to education worldwide while accepting this daunting task the government of pakistan launched tele school on the national television network within 15 days of the pandemic to provide education to the children of grades 1 to 5 1 to 12 from 8 p 8 am to 6 pm daily during the lockdown at the higher education level the bottleneck was not just to access the internet uh, but also the capacity of online teaching therefore there was a learning curve involved for both students and teachers with time the ability of the teachers improved and the government was able to address internet connectivity problems as well the role and importance of distance learning and shared lessons learned during the pandemic one of the key lessons highlighted was that distance learning has to stay for this purpose a distance learning wing has been established at the federal ministry and for this wing um, uh, the pandemic has also taught us that now we can have a blended learning system to teach in schools and at the same time use the technology to reach out to the students therefore with the help of the world bank and unicef we have started working to develop a national education response and resilient plan for covid-19 which will not only help in applying safety measures in school but also in based in content development and assessing the right technological means to benefit the children in this modern age of social media public office holders officers heads teachers have all received severe criticism about the decisions of hybrid learning process but the pandemic has been unprecedented and i am happy that pakistan is doing better than many countries of the world i once again congratulate the federal college of education and the faculty for organizing uh, organizing such a uh, successful international event and the first day of conference was excellently proceeded i wish the best of luck to you for all of you the team for today also thank you very much and have a very blessed day thank you ma'am for your precious time and inspiration inspirational presence ma'am wajia akram has always been there to support federal college of education now i would request our keynote speaker dr abdul hamid former chairman iear university of the punjab to kindly join us and share his significant thoughts on the theme of the conference sir please assalam alaikum wa respected madam baji akram dr saima samia rahman dogar samia bib samia bibi and other faculty members ladies and gentlemen the topic of my presentation is covid 19 and education of the children with disabilities this is my topic today's topic मेरी गुफ्तु जो है वो दो हिस्सों पर मुश्तमिल है पहला हिस्सा जो है वो मैं थोड़ा ये समझने में और समझाने में लूंगा सर्व करूंगा कि सिचुएशन ऑफ द डिसेबल्ड है क्या पाकिस्तान में क्योंकि इस बारे में बेशुमार किस्म क्लेम कल भी किए गए हैं और डाटा कल शफकत मामू साहब ने भी कहा फेडरल मिनिस्टर साहब ने भी कि डाटा की कमी है यकीन डाटा कमी है लेकिन मेरा है कि जो हमारी ऑब्जर्वेशन है उसकी कोई कमी नहीं है हम हम हर रोज ऑब्जर्व करते हैं और जिनकी उम्रें गुजरी हैं इस काम में उनको पता है कि सूरत हाल क्या है नेक्स्ट कर नेक्स्ट राइट प्लेस मैं शुरू करता हूं अपनी जो गुफ्तु है कायदे उनके इस कोर्ट से एजुकेशन डज नॉट मीन एकेडमिक एजुकेशन इवन ऑफ ए वेरी पुअर टाइप दैट वी हैव टू डू इट to mobilize our people and build up the character of our future generation the future generation mein sabhi shamil hai usme sirf hum jo on court court on court jo able bodied hai wohi shamil nahi hai balki able bodied mein bhi wo jo bahut khate peete hai wohi shamil nahi hai baki sari sare bachche jo hai is nation ke is kaam ke wo shamil hai next please next slide 
Next slide, please. I don't have control over us. Can we move on? Next slide, please. Okay. Let me state uh, the state of education in Pakistan. It, these are the uh, different types of reports uh, over 5 million children at primary level are out of school in Pakistan, the second highest number in the world after Nigeria. I'm very conservative, otherwise people say 6 million. Pakistan scores low in every index such as enrollment, academic performance and literacy. Pakistan is far away from achieving the 100% enrollment target it has set for 2030 under SGDs. The national gross enrollment rate in the government primary school has fallen from this is a history of uh, our education kit. It was fallen even. Number of out of school children increased with the increase in grade level I from 20, 23% in primary school to 85% in higher second school. So you go higher and increases. Next slide, please. Major levels of exclusion from school include unfriendly school, poverty, gender, social status of the family, disability, and remoteness. There is an inverse correlation between family income and likelihood of being at, out of school. At the income, there are less chances to be out of school. Gender and disability increases the chances of being out of school. The relationship between poverty and disability is two-way. Disability adds to the risk of poverty and conditions of poverty increase the risk of disability. Next slide, please. This is the uh, graphical presentation of the, the relationship between the out-of-school children and the income level. Uh, this uh, slide has uh, some problem. I think we. How can I open my my own uh, presentations? Because there is a problem in the number. Anyway, I explained verbally. The last uh, small circle says it's a rich people. We have almost zero or 10% uh, out of school children. Then move further, this, this then comes the, uh, these were rich and then, uh, then we have uh, upper middle, lower middle, middle and poor. And the bigger uh, circle, red, red color, is, is that shows that when we talk, we talk about poor families, the rate of out of school children becomes 57%. So the rate of the out of school children increases with the decrease of the income. That's a, that's a dangerous uh, relationship and we have to get out of it. Next please. The children with disability, when we look at the children with disability, children with disabilities are more likely to be out of school it is estimated that 30% of out of school children are with disability. This is a UNESCO 2015 findings. 30% of the out of school children, total out of school children are children with disabilities. So they are disproportionately out of school. In the population of children with disability, about 95% are out of school. And uh, I again uh, object the claim of uh, Madam Bela Jamil, that 75% of the children with disabilities are in schools. They are not 75%. Quality of education of 5% enrolled in ex is extremely low. Those who are enrolled with children with disabilities are 5%. And the quality of these children is very low. They can hardly write a single sentence, sentence in any language, irrespective of the legal level. Well, uh, 
ان کی لینگویج ابلٹی جو ہے رائٹنگ یعنی اردو انگلش جو ہے دونوں بہت اتنی ویک ہیں کہ وہ ایکسپریس نہیں کر سکتے اپنے آپ کو ایوریج ڈسٹینس فرام اسکول ایوریج ڈسٹینس فرام اسپیشل اسکول فار اے چائلڈ وتھ ڈسبلٹیز از ٹویلو کلو میٹر اور ایوریج ایز کمپیئر ٹو دی لیس دین ون کلو میٹر فار چلڈرن ہیونگ نو ڈسبلٹیز دی ڈسٹینس پینلٹی از ٹویلو ٹائمز ہائر دین دی ڈاگ یہ جو فائنڈنگ ہیں یہ اسٹڈی بیس کرتی ہیں جو ڈسٹرکٹ شو پر ہمیں کی گئی اور وہاں پر ہم نے یہ کیا کہ جو اسکول تھے اسپیشل اسکول ان کا جو گاؤں تھے وہاں کے ان کا ایوریج ڈسٹینس ہم نے کیلکولیٹ کافی اس پر محنت کی گئی اور جو ایوریج ڈسٹینس نکلا ہے ایک اسپیشل بچے کا ایک اسپیشل اسکول سے وہ ہے بارہ کلو میٹر اور ایجوکیشن تھیوریز یہ کہتی ہیں کہ جب یہ ڈسٹینس جو ہے یہ دو کلو میٹر سے بڑھتا ہے تو اسکول دین از ناٹ مینٹ فار دیٹ چائلڈ تو وہ اس بچے کے لیے اسکول میننگ لیس ہو جاتا ہے تو ہم نے اسکول تو بنایا اسپیشل اسکول لیکن وہ کتنے میننگ فل ہیں بچوں کے لیے اس سے آپ اندازہ کر سکتے ہیں پھر یہ جو ایسٹیمیٹ کاسٹ ہے ہمارے اسکول کی ہمارے جو اسکول اسپیشل اسکولز ہیں وہاں اس وقت کاسٹ جو ہے وہ تقریباً جو لیٹسٹ فگر ہمارے پاس آئی ہیں وہ یہ ہے کہ ففٹی تھاؤزینڈ پر اسکول پر چائلڈ پر پر اینم ہے جب کہ جو نارمل اسکول ہے اس میں یہ کاسٹ جو ہے یہ فائیو تھاؤزینڈ سے آگے نہیں جاتی ہے یہ میں پبلک اسکولس کی بات کر رہا ہوں میں پرائیویٹ اسکولس کی بات نہیں کر رہا نیکسٹ سلائڈ پر پھر یہ رول اور ڈیوائڈ جو ہے اس نے بھی پرابلم پیدا کی ہیں اس میں جو مسئلہ ہے ہمارے لیے وہ یہ ہے کہ جو ہمارے پرائمری اسکولس ہیں وہ ہے تو بہت زیادہ اس اتنے زیادہ ہے کہ ہر گاؤں میں ایک پرائمری اسکول موجود ہے لیکن ہمیں یہ بھولنا نہیں چاہیے کہ یہ جو بچے اسکول ہیں یہ جو اربن ایریا ہمارا ہے اسی میں ہے اور رورل ایریا میں جو اسکول ہیں وہ بالکل ان ٹچڈ ہیں یعنی جو اربن ایریا کے اسکول ہیں پرائمری اسکولز ہیں وہ دیکھ لیں اور جو رورل ایریا کا پرائمری اسکولز ہیں وہ دیکھ لیں اور جو چلڈرن میں ڈسبلٹیز کی موجودگی ہے تھوڑی بہت وہ صرف شہروں میں ہے کیونکہ جو اسپیشل اسکول ہم نے بنائے ہیں وہ شہروں میں بنائے ہیں دیہاتوں میں نہیں بنائے ہیں تو اس طرح سے میرا خیال ہے کہ جو رورل چلڈرن ہیں وہ زیادہ ڈپرائیو ہے ایجوکیشن سے کمپیرٹیولی ایز کمپیئر ٹو دی چلڈرن لیونگ ان دی سٹیز اور سکس ہنڈریڈ تھاؤزینڈ چلڈرن وتھ ڈسبلٹی آر لیونگ اراؤنڈ دیز رول پرائمری اسکول یہ ایک ایسٹیمیٹ ہے ہمارا کہ چھ لاکھ کے بچے جو ہیں یہ جو پرائمری اسکولز ہمارے ہیں جو کہ پینتالیس ہزار کے قریب ہیں جو رورل ایریاز میں ہیں ان کے ارد گرد یہ چھ لاکھ بچے ہیں جو رہتے ہیں اور ان اسکولوں میں نہیں ہیں یہ پنجاب اسکول ایجوکیشن فاؤنڈیشن فنانس ٹوینٹی فور ہنڈریڈ پرائیویٹ اسکولس موسٹلی ان دی رورل ایریاز اباؤٹ دس اربن چلڈرن نیڈس اربن انکلوسو اسکولس ایز ویل ایز دے کین ایکسیس ٹو یہ جو ہمارا رورل اسکولس ہیں وہ آپ دیکھیں کہ جو میرا ایک اسسمنٹ میں ایک دفعہ کی تھی وہ یہ تھی کہ جو ہمارا پرائمری اسکول ہے اگر آپ پاپولیشن کو کی بیس پر اگر آپ یہ ایوریج چلڈرن وتھ ڈسپلٹ نکالیں ہر اسکول میں تو یہ کوئی چار سے لے کر چھ بچے ہیں جو پر اسکولز ہیں تو ان چار سے چھ بچے جو ڈسبلٹیز ہیں ان کو ہینڈل کرنا ایک اسکول میں نسطن آسان ہے بجائے اس کے آپ پہلے بچوں کو اکٹھا کریں اسکول پوری تحصیل میں سے بسیں چلا کر پھر آپ ایک اسکول میں لے کر آئیں اور پھر وہاں بھی آپ کی جو کوالٹی ایجوکیشن وہ اس کو ان کو نہ ملے تو یہ میرا خیال ہے کہ یہ الٹے ہاتھ سے کام پکڑنے والی بات ہے تو یہ ایک بہت بڑا چیلنج ہے اس وقت ہمارے سامنے کیونکہ یہ جو فاصلہ جو ہے اسکول بچے کا اور اسکول کا اگر یہ فاصلہ ہم یہ کر دیں کہ ہم جو پرائمری اسکول ہے جو نیبر میں پرائمری اسکول ہے اس کو ہم انکلوسو بنا دیں اور اسکول بنا جہاں وہ پڑھ سکیں تو یہ ڈسٹینس تو کم کیا جا سکتا ہے ڈسٹینس تو کوئی ایشو نہیں ہے البتہ یہ جو ایک ہمارے ہاں دماغ میں ہوا ہے میں آپ کو ایک مثال دیتا ہوں ایک ٹیچر میں ملا گجرات میں پڑھاتے تھے ایک اسکول پڑھو نے انکلوسو اسکول میں وہاں گیا دیکھنے کے لیے میں نے پوچھا کہ آپ نے ٹریننگ کہاں سے لی تھی انکلوسو اسکولس کی تو وہ کہنے لگے کہ میں پی ٹی سی ریٹائرڈ ٹیچر ہوں مجھے دو سے تین ماہ لگے ان بچوں کو سمجھنے کے لیے کہ یہ بچے ہیں کیا 
और पढ़ाना तो मुझे आता है उसने अगला जो फिक्र बोल रहा मैं हैरान रह गया इसके लिए हम इतनी कोशिश करते हैं कि ये करें वो करें उसने कहा नहीं आई कैन टीच तो वो पढ़ा रही थी कामयाबी के साथ मेरा ख्याल है कि बहुत चीजें जो है वो हमने खुद उस खबा बना कर रखी हुई है मैंने देखा है कि जो बच्चे जो टीचर हमारे ट्यूशन पढ़ाते हैं वो हर तरह के बच्चे हैंडल करते हैं इवन स्कूल क्लास टीचर जो है वो भी काफी डिफरेंस है बच्चों के उनको अकोमोडेट करता है वो तरह तरह के उसके अंदर सिबीलें करता है मेरा ख्याल ये है कि हमारा जो टीचर जो है हमारा बड़ा एनरिच है बाद का टीचर्स को भी नहीं पता था वो कितने एनरिच है कितने कॉम्पिनेंट है मेरा ख्याल है कि इसको थोड़ा सेटिसफाई आउट करने की जरूरत है नेक्स्ट प्लीज ये थोड़ा सा कंपेरिजन मैंने किया है कि जो हमारे चिल्ड्रन में डिसेबिलिटीज हैं और चिल्ड्रन विदाउट डिसेबिलिटी हैं उनकी सूरत हाल क्या है तो आप देख सकते हैं कि हयूज गैप है और हयूज गैप से भी आप देख नदार कर लें कि हमारे यहाँ जो मैं रात पढ़ रहा था एनरोलमेंट जो ग्रास एनरोलमेंट रेट है वो हमारा सिक्सटी सिक्स परसेंट पर जा पहुँचा है इस वक्त जो पाकिस्तान का है लेकिन यहाँ पर जो ग्रास एनरोलमेंट रेट है वो उसका फाइव सिक्स परसेंट से आगे नहीं जाता ये जो मैं फाइव परसेंट कह रहा हूँ ये देखें बड़ी सिंपल स्टेटिस्टिक्स है हमारे मुहिम में मालूम है कि बच्चे कितने स्पेशल जो पंजाब में है पंजाब में स्कूल कितने हैं स्पेशल वहाँ बच्चे कितने तालीम हासिल कर रहे हैं वो पैंतीस हजार करीब है तो आप अंदाजा कर सकते हैं कि कितने कम बच्चे हैं हर स्कूल में या कितने कम परसेंटेज बच्चों की है जो स्कूलों में जाती है ये जब तक हमने इसको कुछ किया नहीं उस वक्त तक ये प्रॉब्लम चलता रहेगा और हम जो है ना ये पूल ऑफ इग्रेनस पैदा करते रहेंगे वो अल्टीमेटली आकर फिर सोसाइटी पर माशरे पर गोज बन जाते हैं नेक्स्ट साइड प्लीज ये मैंने थोड़ा बताने की कोशिश की है कि कितना डिस्पैरिटी है कितनी बड़ी डिस्पैरिटी है डिस्टेंस के अंदर ये प्राइमरी स्कूल है सफेद रंग का जो ब्लॉक है इसके साथ ही बच्चा है जो डिसबिलिटी है साथ ही चाइल्ड विद डिसबिलिटी भी है दोनों तरफ देखें आप लेकिन स्कूल हमने कहाँ बनाया कहीं दूर जा करके ये ये जिब गरीब हमारी मंतक है पता नहीं हम किसको क्या दिखाना चाहते थे तो ये यानी ये बच्चे तो वो हैं जिनकी मूवमेंट मोबिलिटी की प्रॉब्लम है इनको तो उनके दरवाजे पर स्कूल चाहिए या इसके कि आपने बारह मिनट किलोमीटर की दूर पर दूरी पे जाकर बना दिया है तो ये जो स्पेशल स्कूल हमारे हैं देखने में तो ये अढ़ाई अढ़ाई सौ के करीब है तीन सौ बल्कि कुछ है तीन सौ से ऊपर है आप तो ये तीन सौ से ऊपर स्कूल है हर डिस्ट्रिक्ट में विजिबिलिटी है स्पेशल स्कूल की लेकिन मसला ये है कि ये मस्जिद किस हद तक एनरोल करते हैं बच्चों को और अगर ये परसेंटेज है ये फाइव से भी लेस है तो हमें सिर्फ सोचना होगा कि ये डिपार्टमेंट की सर्विस क्या है ये क्या सर्विस से अंजाम दे रहा है 95 परसेंट तो बाहर बैठे हुए बच्चे और ये 5 परसेंट को लेकर बैठे हुए हैं तो ये कौन सी सर्विस हम अंजाम दे रहे हैं और ये सारा पब्लिक एक्स चेकर से हो रहा है ये पब्बल मनी का मनी है जैसे हो रहा है और मेरा ख्याल ये है कि ये बहुत बड़ी हमने गलती की कि हमने स्पेशल एजुकेशन डिपार्टमेंट को अलग कर दिया जनरल एजुकेशन डिपार्टमेंट से भाई आप देखें कि जनरल एजुकेशन डिपार्टमेंट से अलग करने का नुकसान इमीडिएट ये हुआ है कि जो कोड आया है तो जो भी एस ओ पीज हमने और जो भी ऑनलाइन लर्निंग के सिस्टम हमने बनाए स्कूलों के लिए वो आप स्कूलों में तो लागू हो गए यानी उसमें कमजोरियां होंगी उसमें कुछ खला होंगे गैप्स होंगे लेकिन ये है कि कम से कम शुरू तो हो गए वहाँ पर या कम से कम टीचर को स्टूडेंट को एहसास था कि हमें अंगेज होना है इसमें यहाँ तो कुछ हुआ ही नहीं है स्पेशल स्कूल में क्योंकि ये डिफरेंट थे आइसोलेटेड थे तो यहाँ किसी को परवाही नहीं है तो ये सोचना पड़ेगा हमें कि ये जो हमारा स्पेशल स्कूल है ये वाकई स्कूल है या ये डे केयर सेंटर बना दिया हमने कि बच्चों को भेज देते हैं उसके बाद हम भूल जाते हैं ऐसे तो नहीं चलेगा काम आपने अगर एस की मुताबला पूरे करने और वो करवा रहे हैं इस वक्त आपको पता है वर्ड मॉनिटरिंग होती है ग्लोबल और उसके बाद जैम रिपोर्ट आती है फिर उसके बाद मजाक आ जाता है पाकिस्तान का भी तो ये जब तक हम करेंगे नहीं बच्चों को उस वक्त हमारे पास 100 परसेंट एनरोलमेंट का जो टारगेट है वो हम अचीव ही नहीं कर सकते ये शामिल करके ही 100 परसेंट बनते हैं ये मेरा ख्याल है कि ऐसी सिंपल लॉजिक है जिस पर बहुत ज्यादा आर्गुमेंट करने की जरूरत नहीं है नेक्स्ट प्लीज ये आप देखें हमारे पास जो हमारी लेजिस्लेशन है या लेजिस कवर्स हमें जो हमने दिए हैं वो कम नहीं है अब आप देखें कि ये जो ट्वेंटी फाइव ए आपने पढ़ते पढ़ाते हैं मैं इसको दोबारा रिपीट नहीं करना चाहता बड़ा क्लियर ही कह रहा है कि ये जो बच्चे हैं इनके लिए फ्री और कम्पल्सरी एजुकेशन जो है होनी चाहिए फिर पंजाब फ्री एंड कम्पल्सरी एजुकेशन एक्ट आया दो हजार चौदह में वो भी है और वो तो बल्कि यहाँ तक है वो कहता है कि अगर बच्चे जो है स्कूल में नहीं होंगे तो स्कूल टेरिटरी के अंदर जो बच्चा पाया जाएगा 
उसका जिम्मेदार या हेड होगा या पेरेंट्स होंगे और दोनों के लिए उन्हें पनिशमेंट जो है ना वो एक पेनल्टी जो है ना प्रपोज की हुई है लेकिन ये है कि हमारा अलविदा ये है हम लेजिस्लेशन बना देते हैं हम इसमें तेज हैं एक्ट पास कर देते हैं लेकिन जो आगे मामला है कि उनके लिए लॉज बनाए जाए और लॉज अमल दरामद कराया जाए एजुकेशन के मामले में तो मैंने देखा है कि हम वैसे आमतौर पर भी हमारा रवैया है कि हम एक्ट बना कर भूल जाते हैं उसके बाद हम इम्प्लीमेंटेशन के बारी काम भी आती है इम्प्लीमेंटेशन उस वक्त होती है जब उनके लाज बनते हैं और लाज बनने के बाद वो इम्प्लीमेंटेशन की एजेंसी के पास जाता है फिर जाकर वो इम्प्लीमेंटेशन होती है नेक्स्ट प्लीज ये सारी वो हैं दस्तावेजा या इंटरनेशनल माहे हैं जो हमने किए हुए हैं और ये सारे वो हैं जो कहते हैं कि आपकी तालीम जो है वो उसमें वो तीन चीजें कहते हैं एक तो वो इंक्लूसिव होनी चाहिए और एक वो क्वालिटी एजुकेशन होनी चाहिए और एक एक्विटेबल होनी चाहिए मेरा ख्याल है कि एक्विटी इन एजुकेशन में बड़ा इस वक्त बड़ी स्टडीज की जा रही हैं और हमें भी यहाँ शुरू करना चाहिए कि हम देखें सही कि इंसान के अंदर जो डाइवर्सिटी है वो क्या है उस डाइवर्सिटी के जो तकाजे हैं वो क्या है और उसके तकाजों के बाद हमें किस तरह की डिफ्रेंशिएटेड इंस्ट्रक्शन करने की जरूरत है हमें कहाँ कहाँ अडेप्टेशन की जरूरत है कहाँ कहाँ हमें और मैंने देखा है कि अडेप्टेशन में हम अवेलुएशन की अडेप्टेशन का सोचते नहीं है नतीजा क्या है नतीजा ये है कि फिर वो बच्चे जो हैं उन्हीं मैारात पर पास फेल होते रहते हैं जो कि आम बच्चों के लिए है हालांकि मैं आपको बता रहा हूँ कि मैं अवेलुएशन पढ़ाता हूँ इनके लिए हम मल्टी मोडल जो नॉर्म है वो इस्तेमाल करते हैं यानी इनके नॉर्म ही अलग होते हैं उन बच्चों से जो बाकी बच्चे हैं तो ये मेरा ख्याल है कि टीचर एजुकेशन दानों की जिम्मेदारी है कि वो ये मल्टी मोडल एवेलुएशन के जो तरीके हैं वो टीचर्स को सिखाएं ताकि वो थोड़ा सा बच्चों के लिए सहूलतें पैदा करें और आपको पता है इस्लाम का बड़ा असूल एक ये है कि आप किसी की इस्ताद से ज़्यादा उसमें बोझ ना डालें तो ना डालें ना आप डिसबिलिटी है तो उस पर आप उससे उसकी उसकी हिम्मत और सख्त से ज़्यादा बोझ ना डालें नेक्स्ट प्लीज ये जो आया है कन्वेंशन ऑन द राइट ऑफ पर्सन विद डिसबिलिटी में आप सबसे रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा टीचर से जो टीचर नहीं पढ़ाते हैं यहाँ पर टीचर एजुकेटर उनसे मैं दरखास्त करूंगा कि इसको हम ताला करें ये बहुत ही कलीदी डॉक्यूमेंट है और बड़ा कंसेप्चुअली क्लियर डॉक्यूमेंट है ये इसमें अब जो सारी आगे एजुकेशन आने वाली है इसको पढ़े बगैर समय में नहीं आई बात आएगी ये सारी की सारी जो आप अब आ रहे हैं ये एस हैं या बाकी चीजें आ रही हैं वो सारी की सारी अगर आप देखेंगे तो इसी से वो निकाली गई हैं तो इसमें मैं कुछ चीजें कोट कर रहा हूँ पर्सन विद डिसबिलिटीज आर नॉट एक्सक्लूडेड फ्रॉम द जनरल एजुकेशन सिस्टम ऑन द बेस ऑफ डिसबिलिटी एंड द चिल्ड्रन विद डिसबिलिटी आर नॉट एक्सक्लूडेड फ्रॉम फ्री एंड कम्पल्सरी प्राइमरी एजुकेशन और फ्रॉम सेकेंडरी एजुकेशन ऑन द बेस ऑफ डिसबिलिटी ये क्लियरली कह रहा है कि हम नहीं बोला कर सकते हैं पर्सन विद डिसबिलिटी कैन एक्सेस एन इंक्लूसिव क्वालिटी एंड फ्री प्राइमरी एजुकेशन सेकेंडरी एजुकेशन ये भी वही बात उसी को रिफाइज कर रहा है और ये स्टेट पा, पाकिस्तान ने इसको राइटिफाई किया हुआ है पाकिस्तान ने साइन किए हुए इस पर ये एक, 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 एक तो होता है साइनिंग और एक होता है रेटिफिकेशन तो ये रेटिफिकेशन के मरल से भी गुजर चुका है तो मेरा ख्याल ये है कि हमने कमिटमेंट सारी की हुई है लेकिन पूरा करना अभी बाकी है नेक्स्ट प्लीज ये एक मैं इस पर बात करना चाहता हूँ कि हमारा जो परस्पेक्टिव है डिसबिलिटी के बारे में वो बिल्कुल चेंज हो गए हैं तो इसको मेरा ख्याल ठीक करने की जरूरत है और खास तौर पर जो हम इस हैं उनको मैं ये कहता हूँ कि इस इन चीज़ों को अच्छी तरह से हम समझें एक अरसे तो हम समझते रहे हैं कि डिसबिलिटी जो है वो किसी पर्सन में होती है तो एक बंदा जो है वो ब्लाइंड है या वो हेयरिंग पेड है या वो फिजिकल डिसेबल्ड है तो ये वो बंदा है जिसमें है ये डिसबिलिटी तो डिसबिलिटी को हम लोग करते थे इंसानों के अंदर अभी ये जो कन्वेंशन आया उसने उसको बदलाया उसने कहा कि में डिसबिलिटी को समझने की जरूरत डिसबिलिटी जो है असल में इंटरेक्शन है दो चीजों का एक है जिसको हम कहते हैं हैंडीकैपिंग कंडीशन और एक दूसरी है जो वो कहते हैं एनवायरमेंट जो सराउंडिंग एनवायरमेंट है जहाँ वो हैंडी कैप बंदा काम कर रहा है इन दोनों का इंटरेक्शन होता है बस आगे तो बोला कहीं पर व्हील बंदा जा रहा है और वहाँ पर एलिवेटर नहीं है तो व्हील चेयर बेकार है कि ऊपर के मंजर पर जाने के लिए लेकिन अगर आप वहां पर व्हील चेयर लगा देंगे अब व्हील चेयर के साथ आप एलिवेटर लगा देंगे तो देर इज नो डिसबिलिटी फिजिकल डिसबिलिटी ये मेरा ख्याल है कि हमें अब इस पर ज्यादातर अब दुनिया जो है इसको तो, तो जो दे रही है 
بجائے سے کہ ہم انسانوں کے ڈسبلٹیز کو ٹھیک کرنے کی کوشش کریں جو کہ ایر ریورسبل ہے جو ہونے والی نہیں ہے تو یہ سوچا گیا ہے کہ جو انوائرمنٹ ہے اس کو ہم چینج کر لیں وہ آسان ہے اور اس کو چینج کریں کہ ڈسبلٹی جو ہے نا اس کی شدت میں کافی کمی آئے گی ہو سکتا ہے وہ بالکل ہی محسوس نہ کریں کہ وہ ڈسبل ہیں تو یہ میرا خیال ہے پرسپیکٹو ہے چینج جو ہوا ہے ٹیچرس کو یہ پتہ ہونا چاہیے کہ یہ ایک چیز کا نام نہیں ہے یہ کسی فرد میں پائی جانے کی ہینڈی کیپنگ کنڈیشن کنڈیشنز کا نام نہیں ہے بلکہ یہ انوائرمنٹ کو بھی دیکھنا پڑے گا کہ وہ کتنا ہینڈی کیپنگ انوائرمنٹ کریٹ کر رہے ہیں نیکسٹ پلیز نیکسٹ یہ جو ایک سلمان کا اسٹیٹمنٹ ہے اس کو بھی آپ ذہن میں رکھیں اور اس کو بڑی چھوٹی سی ہے یہ بہت بڑی ڈاکومنٹ نہیں ہے یہ بھی یو این او کے پاس کر رہا ہے یہ بہت انکلوسو ایجوکیشن کے بارے میں جو کنسیپچل کلیرٹی ہے نا وہ دیتی ہے یہ یہ ذرا کنوینشن سے پہلے آئی ہے یہ کنوینشن بعد میں آئی ہے یہ اس سے پہلے آئی تھی اسکول شو ریکامڈیٹ آل چلڈرن ریگارڈ لیس آف دیر فزیکل انٹلیکچوئل سوشل اموشنل لنگوسٹکس اور ادر کنڈیشن دس شوڈ انکلوڈ ڈسبلڈ اینڈ گفٹیڈ چلڈرن اسٹریٹ ورکنگ چلڈرن اب دیکھیں اس لسٹ میں سارے بچے شامل ہیں جو سوچا جا سکتے ہیں تو وہ یہ سارے بچے جو ہیں ان کا اسکول ہے اور کسی ایک خاص ٹائپ کا اسکول نہیں ہے نیکسٹ پلیز انکلوسو اسکول از اے فیوچر ریگولر اسکول ود انکلوسو اورینٹیشن آر دی موسٹ افیکٹو مینس آف کمبیٹنگ ڈسکریمنیشن کریٹنگ ویلکم کمیونٹیز بلڈنگ این انکلوسو سوسائٹی این اچیونگ ایجوکیشن فار آل ایک ڈسیزن میں سمجھتا ہوں کہ اگر ہم کر لیں کہ ہم یہ کہیں کہ جو بچے ہیں سارے بچے جتنے بھی ہیں یہ اسکول میں جائیں گے اسکول ان کو داخل کرے گا اور اس کے بعد اسکول ایک جائزہ لے گا کہ کن کن بچوں کو وہ پراپرلی وہاں ایجوکیٹ کر سکتا ہے اور جن کو وہ ایجوکیٹ نہیں کر سکتا ان کو بھی وہ ریفر کرے اسپیشل اسکولس کے اندر تو میرا خیال یہ ہے کہ یہ پالیسی انیشیٹو جب تک نہیں آئے گا اس وقت تک یہ ہمارے بچے جو ہیں اسکول سے باہر رہیں گے اور ہم بھی ہنڈریڈ پرسینٹ انرولمنٹ سے کافی دور کھڑے رہیں گے نیکسٹ پلیز یہ بھی ہمیں سمجھنا چاہیے کہ یہ جو انکلوسو کانسیپٹ ہے یہ اوور آرچنگ ہے یہ اس کے بارے میں کہا جا رہا ہے کہ یہ اسکول امپروومنٹ پلان ہے یہ صرف یہ نہیں ہے کہ ڈسبل بچوں کی ایجوکیشن کا کوئی سسٹم ہے بلکہ اب تو ہم کہتے ہیں کہ یہ اسپیشل نیڈس کے لیے بھی صرف نہیں ہے بلکہ یہ اسکول کی خود اسکول کی بہتری کے لیے ہے کیونکہ اسکول کا مقصد تو یہ ہے کہ وہ سب بچوں کو تعلیم دے اگر وہ اسکول سب بچوں کو کوالٹی ایجوکیشن نہیں دیتا تو وہ اسکول نہیں ہے میں کہاں کرتا ہوں کہ تین قسم کے اسکول ہو سکتے ہیں ایک تو اسکول ہے جن کو ہم کہتے ہیں بیڈ اسکولس بیڈ اسکولس تو وہ ہیں جو کہ سلیکٹو ایڈمیشن کرتے ہیں ٹکا کے حصے لیتے ہیں اور وہ پروانی کرتے ہیں کہ باقی بچے کہاں کے سال میں ہیں دوسرے وہ اسکول ہیں جو فیسیں جو ہے نا وہ کم لیتے ہیں لیکن لیتے ہیں فیسیں اور وہ تھوڑا کم سلیکٹو ہیں لیکن وہ بھی سلیکٹو ہیں جیسے یہ جو گڑی گلی محلوں میں کھلے ہیں انگلش میڈیم اسکول جو گڈ اسکول ہے وہ ہمارا پبلک اسکول ہے گڈ اسکول یہ ہے جو سب کو ویلکم کرتے ہیں سبھی کو اچھا ماحول دیتے ہیں سبھی کو ٹرین ٹیچر فراہم کرتے ہیں اور سبھی کی فلاح کے لیے کوشش کرتے ہیں تو اصل میں جو ہمارا پبلک اسکول ہے آج بھی وہ سب سے اچھا اسکول ہے میں اس کو سمجھتا اس لیے اس کے پاس جو فزیکل انوائرمنٹ ہے وہ بھی بیٹر ہیں ان کے پاس جو ٹیچر ہیں وہ بھی ولی ویل ٹرینڈ ہے ان کی ٹیچر کی طرح کی بھی اگر دیکھا جائے تو بہت اچھی ہیں تو یہ یہ نہ سمجھا جائے کہ انکلوسو ایجوکیشن جو ہے وہ صرف ڈسبلڈ بچوں ڈسبل بچوں کے لیے ہے یہ سبھی بچوں کے لیے ہے اور یہ میرا خیال ہے آسان حال ہے کہ ہم ڈسبلڈ بچے جو ہیں ان کو ہم ایجوکیٹ کریں نیکسٹ سلائڈ پلیز اب ہم آتے ہیں اس کی طرف کہ کووڈ نائنٹین نے کیا کیا تو کووڈ نائنٹین جو ہے اس میں جو میری فیلنگ ہے آپ سب کو پتا ہونا چاہیے کہ میرے بھی اپنے تین اسپیشل کڈز ہیں جو ماشاء اللہ جوان ہیں جاب شاپ کر رہے ہیں وہ بال بچوں والے ہیں لیکن میں اس سارے پروسیس سے گزرا ہوں تو میں نے دیکھا ہے کہ جو ہے نا کریٹڈ فیئر آف فیلنگ آف فیئر انسرٹنٹی اباؤٹ لائف اینڈ سائیکولوجیکل اسٹریس ہم چلڈرن وتھ ڈسبلٹی اینڈ فیملی فیملیز پر بھی اسٹریس ہے اور بچوں پر بھی آیا ہے آپ کو یاد ہوگا کہ ایک موقع پر تو اس حد تک خوف تھا کہ ہم ایک دوسرے کے ساتھ بھی ملنے سے احتراج کرتے تھے تو آپ سوچیں اس زمانے میں بچوں کو دیکھنے والا کون ہوگا 
social distances has increased the gap between child with disability and service provider ye ek ye bhi masla hua hai the feeling of loneliness has increased manifold iske ye isse ye hua hai ki wo loneliness jo pehle thi kam thi wo zyada badhi hai to bhi ab mera to dekhne wala koi bhi nahi yahan par mujhe kisi bhi nahi pucha mujhe to koi bhi nahi bata raha hai ki mujhe kya karna hai delay and absence of switching to online learning has increased the education divide for those 5% who are at school even jo 5% enrolled the special school mein wahan bhi aap dekhe ki wo unka jo online system shab challenge shuru nahi hua aur ye distance hai beech mein children with disability and without disability on basis of education wo aur bada hai aur bhi aur zyada hua hai gap aur zyada ho gaya hai the modes of teaching and learning are drastically changed teachers are learning how to teach online student students are striving to access and learn how to ab ye dekhe hai ki ye jo is par badi baat hui hai main aap isko repeat nahi karna chahta hai ki bhai connectivity ke issues hain devices ke issues hain aur main kal bhi ye baat kahi thi ki ye bahut bada problem nahi hai jo bachche hamara children with disabilities hain unke liye hamare paas behtareen organizations hain jaise ek main naam bhi diya tha maitra mahal hai baaki hamare log ट्रस्ट बनाए हुए हैं हमने प्राइवेट जमाने में ऑर्गेनाइजेशन पर अच्छा काम कर रही है तो उनको एक जैसे कहते हैं कि एक आई पॉड ये पॉड जो है ये जनली जो पैड उसको फ्राम करना कोई मुश्किल नहीं है ये इतना कॉस्टली नहीं है हमने तो यहाँ तक किया है कि हमने लैपटॉप तो तकसीम किए जो लैपटॉप तो कई गुना महंगा है ऐसे तो मेरा ख्याल ये है कि ये चीज़ें इन चीज़ों पर देखने की जरूरत है और बेशुमार चीज़ें और भी हैं हमारे लिए मुश्किल पैदा हुई हैं लेकिन एक जो हम इंडिविजुअल इंडिविजुअलाइज एजुकेशन प्लान जो है हमारा प्रोग्राम जो वो बहुत ज्यादा मुतासर हो गया इसलिए कि वो वन टू वन था और वन टू वन जो प्रोग्राम है वो सारे के सारे मुतासर हो गए नेक्स्ट स्लाइड प्लीज अब जो होप हमारे सामने आई है वो है सिंगल नेशनल करिकुलम सिंगल नेशनल करिकुलम के चूंकि एक कमेटी है मैंने कल भी बता दें इसका मैं कन्वीनर हूँ और वो कमेटी बनाई गई है कि सिंगल नेशनल करिकुल को अलाइन करें हम इन बच्चों की जरूरियात के मुताबिक तो ये बहुत ही चैलेंजिंग जॉब था जो मैंने खुद एक्सेप्ट किया और इसमें हम कमेटी बनाई गई है जो कि सारे सूखों पर मुश्तमिल ऑलमोस्ट और उसमें जो टॉप के जो हमारे एजुकेशनिस्ट हैं स्पेशल एजुकेशनिस्ट हैं वो उसमें शामिल हैं लेकिन जो एक गल्फ है बहुत बड़ी वो ये है कि जो हमारे एटीट्यूड्स हैं टूवर्ड्स चिल्ड्रन विद डिसेबिलिटी वो इतने नेगेटिव हैं और इतने डीप रूटेड हैं आप देखें हम इस कॉन्फ्रेंस में बैठे हुए मैं कल भी यहाँ बोल के गया हूँ और मैंने काफ़ी बात इंक्लूसिव एजुकेशन पर भी की है और और लोग भी करते रहे हैं इंक्लूसिव लर्निंग पर पूरा सेशन था एक उसके ऊपर इंक्लूसिव एजुकेशन पर भी एक सेशन था लेकिन जो मुझे समरी भेजी गई है उसमें कोई ऐसी चीज़ नज़र नहीं आती है जिसमें को दो रेकमेंडेशन वहाँ की भी डाली हूँ कि हमें ये करना चाहिए ये एक ऐसी जिससे क्या ना एक बिल्कुल साइलेंट है जिसका हमें खुद में अंदाजा नहीं होता कि हम क्या कर रहे हैं तो ये मेरा ख्याल है कि रवैये ऐसे हैं जिससे हमारे चिल्ड्रन में डिसेबिलिटी को बेतहाशा नुकसान हो चुका है और बेतहाशा नुकसान होगा अगर हम इसको चेंज नहीं करेंगे अच्छा ये जी कोरलेशन है देखा गया है कि जो जो आप इंक्लूसिव एजुकेशन को पढ़ते हैं और अपने इलम में इजाफा करते हैं तो आपके रवैये भी चेंज होते हैं तो ये असल में रवैये हैं तो जहारत पर मैं सीधी बात करूंगा अगर किसी पर उससे नाराज होता है तो मैं उसके लिए माजर खाऊँ लेकिन रिसर्च हमें यही कम से बताती है कि जहाँ जहाँ भी इंक्लूसिव एजुकेशन की तालीम बेहतर हुई है जिन टीचर को इंक्लूसिव एजुकेशन के बारे में सही तरह से बताया गया है और ये बताया गया है कि कैसे इम्प्लीमेंट होती है अभी डिटेल तक हम गए हैं तो उस टीचर के रवैये बहुत ही ज़्यादा पॉजिटिव हो गए इंक्लूसिव एजुकेशन के बारे में तो ये हमने हम कोशिश तो कर रहे हैं हमने के टू फाइव जो है हमारा करिकुलम उसमें आप देखें कहीं कहीं पर आपको नजर आएगा कि अगर आपको क्लास में ये बच्चे हों इस तरह के बच्चे हों तो आपने ये करना है ये ये भी एक इशू था कि अगर हम बहुत ज्यादा उसको चेंज करते हैं तो वो फिर जो नेशनल कमेट बाकी जो काउंसिल थी वो कमेटी जी बनी हुई थी नेशनल बड़ी कमेटी जो एस एन सी बना रही है अप्रूव करती है फिर वहाँ जाकर वो मामला रुक जाता तो हमने ग्रेजुअल चेंज के लिए जो ऑप्शन है वो चेंज वो ऑप्ट किया है 
اور میرا خیال ہے کہ چونکہ آپ ہم ٹیچر ایجوکیشن میں سے بیٹھے ہوئے ہیں اب بہت اچھا ٹیچر ایجوکیشن ہے بہت اچھی کانفرنس کی جا رہی ہے بڑے اچھے موضوعات ہیں میں نے کل کے پروگرام کی سمری بھی دیکھی ہے بڑا دل خوش ہوا لیکن مسئلہ یہ ہے کہ ہمیں نے کہیں نہ کہیں سے اس کو انیشیٹ کرنا ہے یہ جو ہمارا ہے نا معاملہ ہے کہ ہم بہت اچھی کانفرنس کرتے ہیں بہت اچھی تقریریں کرتے ہیں اور اس کے بعد سمجھتے ہیں کام ہو گیا یہ ایسی آسانی ہونا چاہیے میں سمجھتا ہوں کہ اگر ہم اس کانفرنس کے بعد ایف سی ای میں انکلوسو ایجوکیشن کے بارے میں سیریس کوئی ایفرٹ نہیں کرتے ہیں تو پھر ہم نے کچھ بھی لرن نہیں کیا اس کانفرنس کے سے تو میں آپ پوری فیکلٹی سے یہ بات کر رہا ہوں یہ کسی صرف ڈائریکٹر صاحب کی ذمہ داری نہیں ہے یہ ہم سب کی ذمہ داری ہے دیکھیں بچوں پر علم حاصل کرنا فرض ہے اس میں کوئی استثنا نہیں ہے اور اگر وہ فرض ادا نہیں کر پاتے ہیں تو پھر مجرم کون ہے ٹیچر ہے اسکول ہے گورنمنٹ ہے تو یہ ڈرنا چاہیے یعنی یہ ہماری جو آج کل بھی یہاں نہیں تو کہیں کہیں نہ کہیں تو ہوگی نا کبھی یہ کیا کیا تھا آپ نے تو اب ایٹی جو نیگیٹو ایٹیچیوڈ ہیں ان کو میرا خیال ہے کہ میں نے سوچا اس پر کہ کیا ہم معاشرے یقیناً ہم معاشرے میں استعفی لا سکتے ہیں اور ہمارا جو میڈیا ہے انٹرنیٹ میڈیا یا باقی ہمارا جب الیکٹرانک میڈیا ہے یا سوشل میڈیا ہے اس کو ہم یوز کر سکتے ہیں عام جنرل ایٹیچیوڈ چینج کرنے کے لیے وہ کرنے چاہیے لیکن کم کو ٹیچر کے ایٹیچیوڈ تو ٹھیک ہونے چاہیے اگر ٹیچر ایکسیپٹ کر لیتا ہے بچے کو اپنے کلاس میں تو پھر کوئی دنیا کا طاقت نہیں روک سکتے بچوں کو تعلیم مسئلہ کرنے سے تو کم کم ہمارے ہمارے ٹیچر ایسے ہونے چاہیے کہ وہ سب کو ویلکم کریں وہ سبھی کے ٹیچر بنے وہ صرف چاند بچوں کے ٹیچر نہ بنے یہ چاند گزارشات تھیں جو میں کرنا چاہتا تھا جو میری ریکمینڈیشن ہے وہ یہ ہے کہ ٹیچر ایجوکیشن کو ری کاسٹ کرنے کی ضرورت ہے ٹیچر ایجوکیشن پر جب یہ ایک ری اسٹیپ کا پروگرام چل رہا تھا تو میں نے وہاں بھی کافی یعنی نوائز پیدا کی کافی کہا تھا ان کو اس کے بعد سے ایک انہوں نے کورس مان لیا انکلوسو ایجوکیشن انٹروڈکشن ٹو انکلوسو ایجوکیشن لیکن میرا خیال ہے کہ یہ پورے کا پورا ریویم کرنے کی ضرورت ہے اور ان کو جب تک ہم انکلوسو نہیں بنائیں گے دیکھیں میں اب بہت لمبی بات شاید نہ کر پاؤں اس میں ٹائم میرے لیے خاص کام ہے لیکن میں چند باتیں کہنا چاہتا ہوں مثال کے طور پر آپ دیکھیں کہ ہماری سائیکالوجی آف ایجوکیشن جو ہے وہ چینج ہو گئی ہے اب جو ڈائیورسٹی ہیومن ڈائیورسٹی کو ہم ڈیل کر رہے ہیں اس کے لیے اور طرح کی سائیکالوجی آف ایجوکیشن چاہیے ہماری سوشیالوجی آف ایجوکیشن بھی چینج ہو گئی ہے ہمارا سوشیالوجی ایجوکیشن میں زمین آسمان کا فرق آ گیا اور اس میں کرٹیکل سوشیالوجی جو ہے وہ وہ جو ہے وہ میڈم جو اب آئی ہیں ان کا بھی شکریہ ادا کرتا ہوں کہ انہوں نے اگر ہماری باتوں کو سنا ہے تو وہ کنسرن کوارٹر تک ان کو بچائے تاکہ یہ بچے جو اس وقت آؤٹ آف اسکول ہیں جن کی کوئی امید نہیں ہے کہ اسکول میں آئیں گے ان کے لیے ہم امید کی کرن بنے اور آگے بڑھیں تھینک یو ویری مچ here for uh, giving opening remarks for the second day of international conference however i thank you especially dr abdul hamid my teacher he has enlightened us with the issues related to the inclusive education i hope the recommendations he has made today will be uh, the part of our conference recommendations also we would like to publish it and also like to uh, implement some of the issues which we can do in our capacity and we will also recommend fed, uh, federal ministry to get it implemented in pakistan for good purposes i welcome all the distinguished guests and uh, a very good morning who has joined us through live streaming federal college of education has provided a platform to the researchers for all over the world to exchange views about the best practices and experiences gained during covid-19 
era during this hard times uh, the need to rapidly adopt to online mode of teaching and learning has revealed how teachers education institution and teacher educators experienced and encountered the challenges and opportunities to carry on their job in an unexpected circumstances federal college of education will summarize lessons learned in different countries with special focus on teachers and how they had to quickly shift teaching modes to facilitate the learning for the student for their students we are also optimistic that all of us will learn acquire new knowledge and skills from this two days international conference and i take an active and i hope everybody will take an active part in the in this interesting and informative discussion going uh, on for the last uh, last day i hope this will be an opportunity for all of us to learn and i hand over the this is the first uh, session we are going to uh, start on hybrid education integrated learning inquiry and critical thinking i hand over the mic to the moderator uh, nida yasin and sadia sarwar please good luck okay, all of you okay thank you sir bismillahir rahmanir rahim in the name of allah the most gracious and the most merciful prayers and peace be upon our prophet hazrat muhammad his family and all his companions it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the first international conference 2021 global academia during and post covid 19 we Ms. Sadia Sarwargil and Ms. Nida Yasin are the moderators of this session, named "Hybrid Education and Integrated Learning and Critical Thinking." We are very honored by the presence of veterans and expert educationists as a session chair and speakers. The coronavirus pandemic has clearly highlighted the importance of investigating in online education. or combinations of online and on campus uh, uh, and hybrid education during the pandemic teachers are making huge efforts to convert their course and assessment into an online format although an important pedagogical challenge for them is the attainment of learning outcomes set for a course especially practical skills scoring the active participation of students taking the course during the pandemic student motivation declined in online courses due to the limited contact with fellow students and teachers to develop effective online and blended hybrid teaching beyond mere use of video chat or discussion fora in replacement of face to face teaching we need a wider insight into the mechanisms of online and blended hybrid education today's session objectives are as follows to discuss the hybrid education practices in the different regions of world to suggest the solutions to overcome the challenges faced during online teaching to explore the ways to inculcate critical thinking in hybrid education and integrated learning Hybrid session is a blend of paper presentation, scholar speeches. Let me introduce paper presenters, session chairs, and speakers of this session. Dr. Nasiruddin is chairing the session. Mr. Peter and Ms. Tini Goshami are the paper presenters. Dr. Suhail Sarhandi and Dr. Rehmat Shah are the respondents in this session. Our first speaker is Dr. Fahad Fit Togar. succeeding to dr afsha huma next is dr itbar thanks to all of you for accepting our invitation have a session is divided 
into two parts. In the first was the paper presenter, Mr. Peter and Ms. Tini Goshami will present their papers, after which respondents will give their response or feedback. In the second part of the hybrid session, respected speakers will share their worth sharing views. Let's start first part of this session. In order to avoid any inconvenience, we have requested paper presenters to share their recorded videos. So first I'm going to share the video of Mr. Peter Kinyan Jui, who is from Department of Educational Communication and Technology, Faculty of Education, Kenyatta University, Kenya, on his paper titled, New Dawn for Under 12 Countries in Africa. Mr. Peter is also live here with us in this session. Welcome, Mr. Peter. Welcome to our presentation. Our topic is hybrid education. New Dawn for underdeveloped countries in Africa. Your presenter is Peter Kinyanjuni, Master of Education, working in Kenyatta University. You are welcome. So we need to ask ourselves, what is hybrid education and why Africa? Many writers have talked about hybrid education. There is varied understanding of the term, but in our presentation, we are going to look at hybrid education as a learning environment that either combines teaching methods, delivery methods, or media formats that are varied. We can even talk of a mixture of all this. Hybrid education is a mixed approach. It is an integrated learning experience, which involves a mixture of online and face-to-face -face learning. In other words, it is a mixture of e-learning and traditional and traditional methods of learning. But we are asking why Africa? A significant number of countries in Africa require hybrid education because majority of the people live in remote villages where the transport and communication system are still underdeveloped. In such environment, there are almost no choices for children who want to further their studies. That is why during the COVID-19 interruption, most of the African children remained at home, almost doing nothing. That is according to the World Bank report in 2020. We are thinking of Africa. Why Africa? Because hybrid education has become more preferable learning approach in the remote places because through it, students can acquire the knowledge from distant teachers. It could be dedicated to providing distant learning services to learners who are living in these remote areas. There are several possibilities that could be done to enhance this new teaching strategy. That's according to Miller in 2012, that the learners can study at their own paces by accessing the online course materials and where necessary, both the teacher and the learners can meet in class for further, uh, for further collaboration and deliberations. Let us try now to conceptualize this. We are talking of hybrid education as a way between face-to-face -face and e-learning. Face-to-face is what? Class session takes place 100% in the traditional brick and mortar learning And technology may or may not be used to enhance learning. So the learning online is very little or sometimes it's totally absent. But when we talk of e-learning, we are talking of nearly all instruction, interaction and activity take place online 100% and may include synchronous and asynchronous learning activities. More learning is done online. But when we come to the hybrid, we are thinking of online and face-to-face -face instruction are branded with a substantial seat time in the traditional learning space, 
substituted with internet-based activities. In other words, we are saying, as a brain and learning experience, the hybrid education might be thought of as a broader online learning spectrum that is presented in the figure above. Communication and transportation of learning materials to remote Africa. We have suggested four methods of transportation of material. One is postal services. Here, the material are mailed to the student and the student's assignment is mailed back to the teachers. We talk of internet services where the material are transmitted electri electronically to the learners and back to their teachers using the same method. We can use telephone services, and this is centralized telephone network, which is used in individualized assistance where the teacher wants to assist individual learners. We have educational broadcast, and this one is going to involve the general mass media. Here we have the radio, television, and mass media itself. How do we handle the material? What is the possible solution to the learning material? One is proper documentation. This involves printed materials such as lecture notes, journal papers. We have assignment and examination from respective institutions. It is necessary to standardize the curriculum so that a software application can handle them appropriately. The other method is, or another solution is synchronization. This involves replication of course material in the student personal computer, at least to the regional office so that students can synchronize their computers with the central server located at the regional office. We have some factors to consider when designing a hybrid education. Factor number one, we're talking of communication services. We have to enhance transmission of course material to and from the learners. Factor number two, cost of communication. We have to enhance the cost of postal and internet services. Factor number three, openness of the document. Here, we want to encourage hybrid document, which should be adapted by all the teachers for easier communication. Factor number four, we have synchronization approach. And in this one, we are going to help in tracking the changes in the assignment done by the students. In short, we are saying, however limited capacity, learning in Africa should be switched between fully remote and fully in-person model as presented in the diagram alongside that when we go fully in person or face-to-face, -face, learning takes place 100%. But when the schools are closed and there is no remote learning, no activity goes on in the learner's mind in their activities. But when everybody was told to go to remote learning, again, learning was resuscitated and it worked at 100%. Today, we are thinking of oscillating between face-to-face -face and e-learning. So we have to strike a balance by coming up with hybrid model of learning. In other words, we are saying that this situation is likely to continue, especially in the underdeveloped regions and pandemic prevalent areas in Africa. And that's why the only solution we have is hybrid education. In conclusion, we can see the following. One, hybrid education is an ideal learning strategy for remote Africa. Two, it can resolve the issue of transport and communication, which is a major problem in the continent. Three, it is the best method of reaching the learners, especially in this time of COVID-19 pandemic. Four, this mode of learning allows a flexible approach to learning process performed collaboratively by the student and the teachers. This brings us to the end of our presentation. For all those who have followed my presentation. Thanks, Mr. Peter, for your very informative presentation in the context of Africa. 
Now, uh, Dr. Ahmad Shah, Assistant Professor of Education in Virtual University of Pakistan, is a progressive academician and completed his PhD in education in 2018. He served as thesis coordinator of MPhil in education program, coordinator of advanced studies of research board and team leader of evaluating VULMS, VLMS and Canvas. He was rewarded with Tamgai Baka and Tamgai Istiklal in 1998 and 2002, respectively. Now, I would like to request Dr. Rahmat Shah to share his uh, uh, valuable response with us. Assalamu alaikum. All of uh, you, uh, I am very thankful uh, of Federal College of Education. Uh, to provide me opportunity. And I am also uh, would like to congratulation to Dr. Samia Dogar and other uh, faculty member of Federal College of Education. Uh, according to uh, Peter uh, Keniani, it was a good presentation about uh, uh, hybrid education. My point uh, is that because this is a, a You hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear okay. you. Okay, okay. Uh, the topic was uh, uh, very important, and uh, this topic uh, demand of the society nowadays. The topic was very clear and acceptable. Objective were very clear and uh, rationalized. Basically, the paper discuss the future approaches in challenges of uh, communication and uh, other possibility in Africa in the village area. Literature review uh, in uh, this uh, paper, are some uh, I have some concern regarding, uh, there are some missing uh, regarding important issue of hybrid education in developing countries. Uh, there are uh, some uh, main points which uh, he discussed in their paper and presentation regarding uh, factor to consideration for hybrid education were clearly addressed in their paper and presentation. I have a question for a uh, paper presenter that he said uh, there uh, will be a feedback for strategy. So I want to ask a uh, paper presenter what will be the strategy for feedback from student, parents, in teacher this must be addressed in their paper wide range topic related uh, things are discussed there are uh, some lack of vocabulary in their papers ideas good thing is that in their paper is that hybrid education um, strategies are all discussed in their paper and I am also uh, very impressed by their future, future perspective to address the suggestions for village area about uh, education. And uh, these are the points, and I hope these uh, comments will help uh, the research researcher to improve their paper for futures, hybrid education plan in education. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Dr. Rahmat, for your valuable response. Uh, Mr. Peter is also uh, here with us. Uh, I want to avail this opportunity. Mr. Peter, will you uh, uh, respond on the question of Dr. Rahmat? Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Well, uh, I had a doctor question, and we're talking of maybe the strategies that we can be able to use. There are various strategies that you can be able to use because when we are thinking of hybrid in Africa, we have to think of the parents supporting the infrastructural development. Maybe the parent will come on with civic uh, members, that is the government, to uh, make sure that we have the proper infrastructure. I have not addressed the issue on, of infrastructure we have said in brief that we have poor 
infrastructure. So the details of this can only be addressed in another forum when we are talking of the participation of the parent and the government. But the students, we need only to have them accepting to move online because what we are experiencing in Africa is that most of our learners are not ready to go online because the data bundles are very expensive. We don't have gadgets for communication. We don't have the right materials. That is the computers, tablets, even the mobile phones. If we have them, they are very expensive. Even to maintain them when they break down, it is not very easy. So the children are having that challenge. Likewise, the lecturers as well as the teachers in schools they have not fully accepted this reality. This is what I can talk of the challenges Professor is talking about. Many of the teachers in Africa have not been receptive. They have not accepted the idea of moving online, mainly because of the cost. I have addressed the question of the cost, and it can be elaborated more because the cost of Connecting to the learners, it is very high. The purchase of equipment is very high. And we can talk of the moral support. Everybody is looking at you as a stranger when you are going online. So with that, the attitude to uh, remote teaching, Africa is somewhere. I don't say that they are not moving. There is a lot of steps that have been made. Most of the schools have moved online, but we are saying that there are still very many challenges we have very many setbacks for hybrid education. That is my response. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Now I am going to share the video of Dr. Tini Goshami, who is from Department of History, St. Xavier College, West Bengal, India, on her paper titled Online Education for the Rural Students, the Role of the Teacher. Ms. Tini is also live here with us. India. I am with St. Xavier's College Autonomous Kolkata. I am an assistant professor in the Department of History and I also uh, yeah, I am uh, an assistant professor in the Department of History and also head of the department. I am going to uh, present my observations on uh, the topic online education for the rural college students, the responsibilities of the teachers and the role of the state. So the essential theme of this paper or presentation is to highlight the role of the teachers in this COVID situation in regard of guiding the students through online mode. Here the emphasis has been given to the college teachers of West Bengal, India, who are dealing with the rural students. As we all know that the impact of the corona pandemic on the education system, especially on higher education, is very much adverse and destructive. The pertinent problems for the students. Firstly, the colleges are closed for more than one and a half years and nobody knows when the things will get back to normalcy. The students are battling with the online mode of education and the evaluation system. Most of the rural students are not that much efficient in IT though they have the basic knowledge of operating the social networking sites. Secondly, the students are due to their poor economic background, not always in a position to afford smartphones. Sometimes the entire family only possesses a single device, therefore making the online teaching learning process almost impossible. Thirdly, the students are not getting adequate study materials. The online study materials in the vernacular are not always up to the mark and scanty in nature. As the rural students are not that much tech savvy, therefore they find it difficult to download the English PDF books because here I am discussing uh, about the uh, rural students. That's why uh, they are more familiar with the vernacular sources. And unfortunately uh, in the net, we are not not finding students. The students in this pandemic situation can't afford to visit the libraries, which is another constraint in this regard. The limitations as experienced by the teachers, the communication gap between the teachers and the students, which is creating obstacles to a great extent in regard of teaching learning process. It is not possible to meet the students physically 
in this pandemic situation and one-to-one -one interaction in classrooms has now become a dream. The rural students are mostly not fit to reciprocate in the online mode as opined by many teaching professionals. The college teachers also have felt the need to have a more flexible evaluation system as uploading the answer scripts by the students is mostly dependent on the network connectivity, which perhaps fails to perform well during the monsoons or in any other natural calamity. The fourth point is to design class hours in a more relaxed format so that both the teachers and the students should not feel overburdened with their tasks. It is also good for the mental well-being of the teachers as in online mode, they are more bothered with the deadlines, which has made the entire education system extremely demanding. Finally, the teachers experience lack of technical expertise, especially in IT, which can be sorted out by providing them enough ICT training. The professional responsibilities of the teachers, I think that are very much important uh, because if the teachers are that much responsible, then they can help the students and then we can at least try to have some solutions to the problems which we are facing in this online mode of education. The rural students need TLC as for them, education most of the time seems to be a luxury. Due to their poor economic background, we have seen a large number of students have to quit studies in this pandemic situation. Here we need the teachers who can see the matters with more compassion and empathy. It is not only to adjust with the technicalities of the new normalcy, it is also important for the teachers to be more kind to the students, even if they are required to maintain professional ethics. More time should be provided provided to the students even after the online class hours just to listen to their problems. In fact, in this grave pandemic situation, emotional stress has shattered almost everyone leading to severe depression. Here, the teachers are required to be sensitive and counsel the students as per the requirement. A responsible teacher should understand that homebound young adults might get more comfort or space in social networking sites, which does not require that much computer skill. The college teachers need to understand that the addiction for devices has been increased in this pandemic situation, which has an adverse impact on studies, but we should not lose hopes and be patient to all. Therefore, scolding students for their inattentiveness is not the solution, rather proper intervention is expected without disturbing the mutual peace. Uh, I think that uh, noises are coming out. In the online classes, the professors are supposed to give more efforts than the offline method as they are not in a position to have live interactions. Therefore, they need to repeat their lectures to make the students understand the topic. Here, patience is the key factor to achieve success along with perseverance. It is all it's also important to adapt attractive, innovative, innovative teaching learning process, which makes the students interested or inquisitive. Here, the online mode can be implemented as a tool to impart audio visual education where the students will watch relevant documentaries or movies or listen to the audio lectures. The teachers can also opt for PowerPoint presentations instead of lectures for some topics to make the class hours interactive. Online presentations should be encouraged where the students can participate and will be marked for their performance. It is better that instead of writing papers and uploading the same, students could be encouraged to give online Viva Voce or PPT for their examinations. Here we need to see the feasibility of this procedure too, as the rural students more often face internet issues. The flexible evaluation system, as mentioned earlier, is also needed where the students can perform well and avoid errors due to nervousness. Here, the teachers should be human and considerate to them. It is not possible to invigilate the rural students online as technically they are not equipped 
and the professors are not always compatible with online invigilation. Therefore, it is expected the questions which the students are supposed to write should be analytical so that students won't be able to get opportunities for mere copying. Lastly, the college authorities should cooperate with the professors so that they can give their level best to keep the online education effective. Yes, it's, it's not about only the responsibilities of the professors. The professors, they should get that much space or comfort from their authorities so that they could perform well. The teachers are also supposed to cooperate with each other to promote a healthy working environment. The role of the state, which is also important, the higher education policies, especially in this COVID situation, need to be reassessed to help the millions of students whose future is uncertain. It's a matter of doubt that why don't we have adequate infrastructure to reopen the academic institutions in India, especially the colleges or the universities. We have to vaccinate the students and the staff so that the institutions can be opened and students shall continue studying in an offline mode with necessary precautions as per the COVID protocol. If the government offices, banks, private companies, restaurants, gym, shopping malls are open with some restrictions, then it is also required to return to the offline mode of teaching so that we will be able to do justice to our profession. The government intervention is highly expected in this matter. Otherwise, the education sector will witness more damages. This paper is an attempt to highlight how the college teachers can help the rural students in this pandemic situation. The present researcher herself experienced the difficulties and also shared the thoughts of the fellow colleagues. This present COVID-19 situation is a threat to the education system and the future of millions are at stake. The increasing number of college dropouts, the salary reduction of teaching and supporting staff, lack of proper IT measures, the confusions in the education policies by the central and the state governments are some serious limitations which we are facing right now. The present situation demands more comprehensive and inclusive education plans so that poverty can prevent students to pursue higher education. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope that I have been able to point out the Okay, thanks, Ms. Dini. Dr. P. Suhail Ahmed, an associate professor, chairperson, Department of Linguistic and Human Sciences in the Begum Nusrat Bhutto Women University, Sikha. He has a profound expertise in software skills and interpersonal skills. He is also a certified international professional trainer and has a great contribution in teaching. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Suhail Ahmed to share his ideas with us. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you very much, Sadia, uh, for my introduction. I am thankful to the Federal College of Education, Islamabad, for inviting me on this, basically, I would say, the meeting of academia around the world. Uh, as I'm given five minutes, so I'm just going to be very precise in my talk. Uh, Dr. Goz, uh, Goswami, yeah, uh, I appreciate the way you have presented your paper and the basically the issues that you have highlighted are everywhere around the world. Uh, the paper that you have talked about is mostly about the role of college teachers in facilitating students of rural areas of West Bengal. Uh, when it comes to the context, I think Pakistani context and Indian context is quite similar in different dynamics. We have similarities in our teaching styles. We have similarities in the background of our students. We have the similarities, especially with the pedagogy that we follow and the content that we have. So it is quite similar and thank you for bringing these issues because these are needed to be answered. It's not only about the answering these issues or highlighting the issues, we need to do something about it because we have been sitting together almost for 48 hours now on this uh, conference. So it is our job to rectify the issues that our students 
and we as teachers are facing because I believe uh, we are always like students, we are lifelong learners. So for this issue, we need to keep on updating not only ourselves, but our surroundings, our environment and our uh, the workplaces where we work. So the issues that you have mentioned, number one, I want to go with one-on-one. -on -one. So the first issue that is about evaluation system in online mode of learning. Yes, this is a big issue and you have pointed out rightly and it has been uh, a problem all over the world. It's not only just because of COVID-19, even before COVID-19, whenever we went online, we had the issues of evaluation how to evaluate the students, how to be like justified evaluators, how to assign them proper marks and what should be the criteria and all these things. Yes, uh, this uh, issue needs to be highlighted and needs to be solved. The other thing is about the affordance of digital devices. Yes, uh, I can say we have a little bit difference here when it comes to affordance of devices. Uh, because I, I don't have much experience in Pakistan. I'm uh, like, okay, I, I came back to Pakistan recently, so I don't have much experience, but in one year's time, I have been given trainings all around Pakistan. So I don't know much about India, but in Pakistan, we don't see this issue anymore. Affordance is not a problem anymore in Pakistan, especially when it comes to the devices or the internet services. Because before COVID, when I used to talk, or I used to give workshops, conduct workshops here and there, especially in the ru uh, rural areas of Sindh, uh, I experienced this cry that we don't have the devices, we don't have internet services. And all of a sudden, after a month or so, COVID hit us and everyone was on the devices. Everyone was conducting the classes every teacher had the device, every teacher had the resource, even the students also. Yes, I, I agree they struggle, but at the end, they sorted it out. So uh, affordance of digital devices is not that big issue. It might be in India. Yes, you have highlighted well. Uh, when it comes to inadequate learning material, as you have mentioned in your paper, in your talk, yes, we have a problem here inadequate learning materials. And what to do, uh, I'm going to give you maybe a few solutions that, that might help all of us to sort this issue out. But yes, it is a big issue. And especially when students do not have access to the libraries during COVID situation due to our social distancing and all. Uh, another limitation that you talked about is about the communication gap due to online mode of learning because we don't have the face-to-face -face interaction and all. Uh, I, I want to highlight here, I want to point out here, we have a big difference in our generation. As I think yesterday, Dr. Munnawar Sultana talked about it also, that we have a big generation gap uh, our students, our learners are not the same as we used to be. So they have different learning styles, they have different learning patterns, even interaction patterns as well. So if you see nowadays, if you see the teens, they mostly communicate using their mobile phones. Even they are sitting together in a group, they prefer using their mobile phones to talk to each other. It's the gap between teacher and a student, not a student a student gap. So it's our duty, it's our job as tutors, as, as teachers to go to their world, learn the way they interact, learn the way they communicate. So to me, I don't find any problem with interaction online between a student and a student. Yes, teacher has a problem, not a student. If you, even if you go and conduct a survey, I believe you will find out that Students do not have any communication issues online. It's the teacher who feels this way. So obviously, uh, we need to think about it, revisit our learning style, our teaching styles. Uh, I, I'm concluding, I'm coming to the main points that Dr. Goswami has suggested we need to adopt innovative teaching learning process. Yes, I do agree. We need to 
adopt innovative teaching learning process. But the problem is, it doesn't mean we just adopt PowerPoint presentations. We give lectures using uh, overhead projectors or computer devices or anything else that is digital. It has to go with the pedagogy as well. We need to know how to integrate technology with pedagogy. So I, I would here go for the TPEC model. Basically, where you need to have three different uh, dimensions of teaching and learning if you want to be a successful teacher in this digital generation. Number one, you need to know how to integrate technology with your pedagogy. You need to know how to integrate your technology with pedagogy using your own content. So basically, here you need to look at teaching in this new generation as a whole thing. You cannot just go with some devices and then go with the same method. So I would go and I would quote the same thing Dr. Munnawara yesterday quoted about this one, Culture Future Shock by Toffler, the book. He also talks about when you go in this digital generation, go with the new mindset. Do not go with old mindset. I always say, do not go into your classes with new practices carrying your old mindset. So for new practices, you need new mindset as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goswami, uh, Goswami for this great opportunity to highlight some of the issues. Uh, over to you, Sadia, thank you very much. Okay, thanks Dr. Suhail for your esteemed feedback. It was really a good comparison between Pakistan and India online education system. Once again, thanks, sir. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Nida Yasin to proceed further. Thanks, Mrs. Sadia Sarwar. All praises to Almighty Allah and Durud Salam on our last prophet, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I feel honored to invite Dr. Fahad Rafiq Tover. He is an associate professor in computer science department for presenting his magnanimous ideas. Dr. Fahad has won the Vice Chancellor's Alumni Achievement Award 2020. He is among the few Pakistanis to work as a researcher at Microsoft Research Lab. He is Senior Fellow for Civic Technology, Tisch College, Tufts University. His research interests span is networking and distributed system. Dr. Fahad Dogar, please come forward and share your idea. Thank you, Nida. Uh, can you hear me and can you see my slides too? Yes, sir. We are hearing you. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thanks to Dr. Samia Dogar and her team for organizing this uh, great conference. I think it's great for, for the students as well as for academics to, uh, to share ideas on, uh, on different aspects of education. And this session is uh, something which is very close to my heart on, on hybrid education. So I'm going to share uh, my experiences, uh, my recent experiences with online education and some thoughts on uh, how we can learn from those experiences and uh, perhaps move towards uh, a hybrid education model going forward. So, uh, just for some context, just uh, so that people understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I was born in Islamabad. So I, I know many of you are in Islamabad right now. So I was born and raised there. Uh, very fond memories uh, of, of that city. Uh, I did my undergraduate uh, education from Lums in Lahore. Uh, then I went to uh, US for my PhD. Uh, I have some industry experience, as Ms. Nida pointed out, so I worked at Microsoft Research for a few years. Uh, I have been a visiting faculty uh, at LAM, so I have taught uh, students in Pakistan as well. Uh, but since 2014, uh, I have been a professor at Tufts University. Uh, and just to uh, provide people some more context about Tufts, uh, Tufts is, is, a, is a fairly small private university, very close to Boston. Uh, it's known for its uh, liberal arts education. 
So broad education where you don't just study one subject in your undergrad, but a broad-based education covering a wide range of, of subjects. Uh, it has uh, graduate programs in, uh, in all the areas, and it's more known for its graduate programs and research in medicine, uh, diplomacy, the Fletcher School, where uh, many uh, Pakistanis have come and they have studied, and engineering, which, which I am part of. Uh, so at Tufts, uh, uh, what has been the situation pre-COVID and how things have changed since COVID? Uh, Pre-COVID, we, uh, we were exclusively in person and we used to have very small classes. This is what Tufts is famous for, that professors provide personal attention to students. So we would have very small classes. Uh, and even though we would have discussions around online programs, uh, but faculty would not think of online programs very highly. They would really want in-person teaching. Uh, but obviously with COVID, uh, we were forced to go online. So, so professors who were really against online education too, they were even forced to, to teach online. So we, we have been fully online for the last one and a half years. Uh, but this semester, uh, there are many courses which, which are in person, including my own course. Uh, everyone is wearing masks and, and that's like a new experience on its own. Uh, so, so what are some of the lessons learned? And other people have really talked uh, at length about uh, COVID and uh, some of the lessons learned. So, so this list is just a very small subset of points and, and this is more focused on I would say some, some US specific points too. Uh, many of these will apply to Pakistani context too. Uh, in terms of positives, uh, it turns out that as we know, students work at their own pace or basically the fact that if video lectures are available, uh, students can work at their own pace and students learn differently. Some students learn fast, others learn take time. So with videos, they can really go at their own pace. And that turned out to be a big, big, big positive. Uh, and many of the, the teachers here, they used uh, various types of technologies in their, in their classes. Uh, they made use of online polls uh, to get real time feedback from students. Uh, this was something which is, which is difficult in in-person classes. Like how do you know, uh, how students feel about something, uh, whether they are learning things. So these online polls uh, turned out to be fairly useful. Uh, uh, similarly, breakout rooms uh, also were very useful because in a physical classroom, you are constrained by where students are sitting. Uh, but in an online setting, you have much more flexibility. Uh, you can make teams based on their interests, based on uh, the strengths of different students, so it, it provides more, more, more flexibility. And similarly, uh, faculty have also tried combining different kinds of video sources uh, in their lectures, which really enriches the experience uh, for students. So, so, so many positives, uh, but as we all know, there are many challenges too. Uh, and other people have rightly pointed out challenges around internet access, devices, availability, cheating, and so on. But I just want to mention a few uh, uh, challenges, which I think uh, maybe are more specific to US, but I think students in Pakistan would, would have faced uh, those challenges too. Uh, so the first one is obviously, I think staying motivated when you are not seeing other students, when you are fully online, I think that turns out to be a big challenge, uh, especially if you just have pre-recorded videos that people, the students have to go through, it, it can be very difficult for students to do that. So, so live lectures where students are engaged, they, they turn out to be much more better. Uh, the second point is interesting because uh, it turns out that social issues are magnifi magnified when students had to go back home and do these online classes. Uh, and this may be a surprise to like Pakistani students, but students here in US, when they turn 18 and they go to college, 
they really become independent and many of them don't feel actually comfortable staying with their parents for extended periods of time so for them going back to their homes living with their parents for for an extended time was a was a huge challenge and there were many students who reached out to me saying that uh, they are under huge stress because they don't want to live with their parents uh, similarly uh, there are many students here and i think probably like the same case in pakistan too who really rely on other students uh, for help uh for their for for feedback for emotional support and if that is missing uh then their whole uh way of learning really breaks down uh and this is also has to do with the fact that uh, most of the students here are living in dorms in hostels or uh in private housing with other students not with 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 their parents uh so when they are not with their peers uh their whole way of learning whether they rely on other students or not that that actually really breaks down uh so those were some of the challenges but many positives too so i think i strongly feel going forward uh even after covid we should seriously think about how we can combine the positives of both approaches online as well as in person so one model that i want to just share with you just for as a food of thought that you can think about is a model where there are online lectures but also some in person experience for the students okay uh and this can be very useful especially for developing regions where uh, access to quality teachers is limited it's very hard to find good 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 teachers uh so in this model Uh, the online lectures could be from the best available teachers the best in the world and these are the professors who design content courses and they deliver lectures in local languages okay we have pakistani pakistanis all over the world there are great professors in pakistan as well including many uh, that are part of this this uh, conference so why not get the best teachers uh, deliver courses all over pakistan uh, and they can make use of various online tools that that i described and these online lectures could really be rich uh, and extremely useful for the students and then we also have in person experiences uh, where these experiences supplement the online lectures uh, so students still go to classes to have tutorials that supplement these lectures or to do some small group exercises with other students so that they can form bond a bond with other students they can learn from each other and during these in person experiences they can be facilitated by local teachers so we just don't have one teacher delivering lectures but there are other teachers too who facilitate these in person experiences so this is just one example of how potentially we can combine the strengths of both approaches i'm sure there are many other ways to do this too but this is just uh, one specific example and just as a food for thought so in closing i i feel uh, we have great opportunity uh, in considering hybrid education especially for countries like pakistan uh, and i think conferences like these where like minded people can come and brainstorm are a great way to 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 get started on this uh, i thank again the the organizers for inviting me Uh, unfortunately i won't be around for the entire session it's it's really late here uh, in in boston uh, but i really encourage anyone who may have questions for me to reach out to me by thank you okay thank you so much dr farhad for your high priced views on insight and energy uh, it's really really thankful uh, for us and great opportunity for us you are having with us it is uh, 1 am right now in usa so thanks a lot sir for your giving your valuable time this is your sleep time so thank you so much thank you very much sure thank you now i would like to invite dr afsha huma who is currently working as assistant professor in charge department of educational planning policy studies and leadership at alama iqbal open university 
She completed her PhD from Michigan State University, USA, and research diploma from University College of London. She is also having a degree of documentary filmmaking from Seneca at York. Dr. Afsha Huma, please come forward and share your precious thoughts with us. Okay, first of all, I thank all of you um, for having me here and I especially thank all the organizers and my dear friend, Dr. Samia. Uh, this is an amazing conference, uh, definitely, and I was listening uh, to all the speakers. Um, to tell you the truth, um, all of us are actually talking about more or less the same things. So I'll quickly go through um, the initial talk and then I would love to um, talk more about how uh, I call it a rich or richer experience when we go um, in a hybrid mode or online mode. Um, is my screen visible to you? I hope so. Okay. Yes, you are visible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, let's let's quickly go through the transitions that we have had and um, how we have been how we have been perceiving education we have been perceiving education in three modes definitely one is informal then formal and then non formal and the formal institution uh, formal uh, education was more institutionalized than ever before w once we look at the formal in, uh, education um, i would not go in in um, in history very far but let's think of uh, things happening in 19th and 20th century only and then we shall land in our 21st century paradigm so in the in the previous centuries uh, the the basic idea of education was that somebody more learned than the people in front of them uh, will be delivering the knowledge or will be um, modeling the skills or will be, um, I don't want to use the word impose, but imposing the values. So I repeat, we'll be delivering the knowledge, modeling the skills and imposing the values. So this, this was more of a behaviorist school of thought because somebody has something more than others and they are on the delivery mode and the, and the learners are on the receiving end and they have a passive learning uh, attitude. Um, cognitivism, thanks to cognitivism, uh, which um, elaborated what happens in the brain of the child when we deliver knowledge, when we model something in front of them or when we impose something on them. So cognitivists helped us out in, in understanding uh, why education should not be teacher centered. But what cognitivist gave us was uh, content centered education. What should you give to a child in a specific age time space? What should you give to a child in specific age, time and space? So this, this was uh, an outcome of cognitivism. So we came out of teacher centered approach to um, content centered approach. Um, this is a gradual evolution. I would not say anything bad about it because I think this has been a learning process for the education system itself. And then came the third stage of constructivists. Um, the social constructivists told us that um, it's not only the teacher, it's not only the content, but it's the whole social scenario that is teaching the child and the child himself, herself, them, themselves are going to learn as they learn. So they construct their own knowledge and we should be able to include all those diversities in our classrooms, which the children bring with them. Now, this is the story up to the 20th century. And then we landed in 21st century and the 1990s, the last 10 years of 20th century um, gave us uh, a shift uh, in the form of um, not only computers, but World Wide Web. So what happened um, there then is that in, in the initial years of uh, 21st century, we, came, we uh, came to see a new theory or a new paradigm of education, which was connectivism. Now, the, the generation of 21st century is going to learn in this paradigm. So we came, 
with the with the teacher centered approach to the content centered approach to the child centered approach and now we have a global approach and we are we are educating our next generations in the paradigm of connectivism and i'm glad that even in pakistan we now have to do this what happened between past 21 years from 2000 onward to 2021 um many countries had already shifted their formal education system into hybrid education system uh, i have been to i've been studying in these 2021 years in uk then in us and then in canada so what was happening in the world was that as the technology was evolving so was the education evolving and they were shifting their physical um environment education physical um physically designed education i would say into a hybrid mode so if you are bound in a classroom or if you are bound in an institution or if you are bound in any um solid walled thing i would say you cannot be inclusive because those walls exclude somebody somewhere so what was happening is that they they moved on to hybrid mode and include more and more diversity into their systems so then uh, by 2020 or i would say by 2019 um there were three modes of education going on one was the traditional education which was still going on in many parts of the world like in pakistan and that was institutionalized formal education in the classrooms then there was a hybrid mode and that was also in every part of the world including pakistan uh, and some of the institutions had um softened their walls and they were bringing in um the social uh, connectivism through having um half of the learning inside the classroom and half of the learning through world wide web or through any other electronic mode then the third mode as i work in alama iqbal open university the third mode was distance education where the students don't really have to be in the classroom and they can they can interact with the, with their teachers and with their content um in a synchronous or asynchronous mode i i would say that covid 2020 has been a transition period and once uh, for all educationists around the world like bankers around the world like health practitioners around the world everybody realized how important it is to use technology more effectively educational fabric definitely changed as all other systems changed on the one hand computers have evolved so much that now we have this small gadget in our hand and we can use it wherever we are worldwide web had developed um 3G and 4G technologies have helped us to bring multiple media content to our education so what hybrid and blended uh, mode of education brought it brought in the possibilities of multidisciplinary education it brought in the possibilities of education and industry linkages more than ever before and the richer experience that i am talking about the richer experience that i am talking about is actually based upon these things as I, as if you can see my slide in front of you the very first thing is collaborative environment how the cooperative teaching or cooperative learning is different from collaborative learning collaborative learning is when the teacher and the students take actually um equal level of teaching and learning so that's a collaboration going on your students become your partners and you partner with the students in the learning process so you do not think of yourself as a teacher but you think of yourself as one of the learners so that's a collaborative environment and sometimes you lead and sometimes the students lead and you let them lead the classroom you let them lead the whole discussion so that's a collaborative environment what this hybrid mode brought in is more is more of multiple media content so you, we we are very familiar with the multimedia but multiple media content in something when you can bring in so many different modes of content into your virtual classrooms now comes the critical thinking part if the 
of three things are happening. This is giving you an opportunity to make your students and yourself think critically. And I define critical thinking uh, mostly as the time between reception of information and belief. I repeat, I, I, I define critical thinking as a period between reception of information and belief. So if the above three things are happening, just imagine how much information is coming into the hybrid classroom, how much multiple media content is being analyzed. So multiple resources, analysis, evaluation, judgment, and then belief. And that is the process of critical thinking. So once you let students and yourself be open to multiple content, multiple resources, you are actually bringing in the critical thinking process into the classroom. And then slowly the society starts believing the empirical evidence, research-based content, not just the jargons and not just the rumors. And then happens the creativity of new knowledge. That's all from my side. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Shahuma. It was really a thought-provoking and well-structured presentation. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Now I would like to invite our next prestigious guest, Dr. Iqbal Khan. He is an assistant professor of education in University of Malacca. He did MPhil education from Boston University School of Education, United States of America, and PhD from International Islamic University, Stanford. He has a diversified experience of teaching, training, and administration. Now I place a request in respect of Dr. Iqbal Khan to share your views. Dr. Iqbal Khan. Assalamualaikum. Jibarik Masalam. Ji, this is Iqbal Khan from the Department of Education, University of Malacan. I am really thankful to the Federal College of Education for giving me an opportunity to uh, speak to this gathering. Uh, I am the last uh, speaker, so almost all the good things have been uh, said, but I would also add my experiences, which are related to my university and to this area. And uh, as uh, right, Madam Huma said, that I have to skip many things because uh, many things have been right, already said. Uh, so, uh, as discussed, that when there are problems, so at the same time, right there, we have opportunities. Now, it is up to us, right, right to hold, uh, uh, to take hold of opportunities from the forelock and exploit, uh, right, uh, right opportunities for the betterment of our education system. Now, this, uh, right, when we had this COVID-19, so it also brought a lot of, uh, a lot of problems. But at the same time. It introduced us to many opportunities, and the opportunity was that uh, we had the opportunity to learn technology and to use technology for education. Before this, we didn't use Zoom, right? And even people in my university, most of the people, they did not know that, right, that there we can narrate on PPT, and we can communicate on WhatsApp, right? And then, uh, right, almost all the universities, they developed their own learning management system. So these were uh, the opportunities which were provided by the crisis situation. Do you hear me, madam? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir, we are so, hearing you. Please continue. Yeah, uh, so uh, we had the opportunity right, to learn many things. Right? <laughs> Uh, during this uh, uh, during this crisis, and uh, these two uh, modes they are mostly used for uh, for online education. One is the blended education, uh, blended approach, and the other is the hybrid. So I don't need to explain them because they are already uh, been explained by other speakers. But I will talk about my own context. These are the benefits that first our teachers and our students. They were afraid of technology. They were, uh, but when this right crisis came, so it motivated the students and the faculty towards the use of technology for the sake of education. Another important thing is that uh, we almost uh, wait for the teacher to teach us everything. 
So this crisis and the use of technology which encourage our students towards self-learning. And you know that this crisis situation is not limited only right to uh, right to COVID-19, but uh, we have floods, we have earthquakes, and this uh, right, hybrid education will be useful and use, it, it is useful for any crisis for any crisis situation. And as discussed that uh, when our schools were off, so especially our primary school students right, in my part of uh, the country and especially government students, they remain uh, right. They remain at home and they did nothing right for almost uh, like two years because there was no system for uh, the students. So they remain as uh, right, some people who okay, can talk that uh, there is no issue of uh, uh, of devices. But uh, what I have noticed in my area in my university that yes, there is an issue of devices, right? and especially for those children right, who are going to government school. So this was, and next the system of hybrid education, it is quite flexible. The students can uh, use it right, anytime. They can watch records, right? They can do students who can afford, so they can come to the school and college and do students who cannot afford, so they can remain at home. And uh, this uh, right, hybrid education is, uh, is learned because uh, these days, as Madam Huma talked about, that learn the certain approaches they have been introduced. And uh, right, this is the area, this is the era of connectivity. So this hybrid education has right, the capacity uh, right, to connect uh, right, to the students and it is more uh, student-centered approach. Uh, the benefits uh, is uh, we can accommodate maximum number of students in one class, right? How? Uh, right. Suppose we take uh, 60 students in one class, so this hybrid education is the only system because we will be able to ask 30 students to come to uh, the school or college or university and the remaining 30, they can remain at home. Now the government, now KP government is going to introduce evening shift in school. So instead of introducing the evening shift, uh, they can also, our government can also use hybrid education uh, in the uh, in the morning and if there is right, any issue uh, like classrooms or buildings so this uh, right, hybrid education is the only solution uh, which can help us out uh, our government in uh, in universities and colleges and schools they said that they that uh, right that, that, that the institution should follow a staggered approach but there was nothing right there. What the, those students right, who who remain at home would do? Uh, so uh, they said that uh, if you have like 50 students, so only 25 students should attend uh, the class and many should remain at home. So uh, right, we did it. But we noticed that in our university and in the surrounding students that in those two or three days, the rest of the students they were doing no activity because they were not connected. And another uh, like issue which is related to, right, to, Mary, uh, to my area and maybe to other uh, backward areas as well, that there are gender issues. If you do not want to sit in one class, uh, like if you do not want that uh, male and female should remain in one class, so, uh, and uh, you have so this uh, like hybrid uh, like system of education is a good solution because you can ask uh, like okay, one day or two day uh, uh, like half of the time female students and you can ask uh, the uh, male students right for half of the time. So this issue can also be resolved. I think it was not discussed and most of uh, right the uh, right points were already discussed and uh, it is, uh, can save money and energy, and it uh, in, in it, uh, we spent uh, less than uh, okay less amount on education. So uh, if we are if we focus upon uh, like hybrid education, so we can solve many problems. Uh, now the question is that how can we benefit from hybrid education? Uh, some of the points are already discussed. 
so whenever we have a new issue, we have to change our approach, as discussed by another person, that we cannot solve our new issues, our problems with our old approaches. Right? As uh, Peter has rightly said, that the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, but the, but we the yesterday logic. So definitely, uh, the situation has changed. We have to change our behavior. We have to change our belief system about teaching and learning. So what we need to do, we cannot do it in a day or two. We have to uh, plan in the beginning of the semester for hybrid learning. We have to work on the beliefs of the teachers. In my university, we use WhatsApp. We write, okay, we narrated our lectures uh, and then we send to our students on WhatsApp. So it went very well. The students were satisfied and uh, we did something. So, uh, like teachers who said, uh, no, it is impossible. Online learning is not possible. So that was the first thing that stopped them from doing anything online. So the first thing is that we have to work on the belief system. We need a new belief system. We have to change our teachers. We have to change our students. And another is that some of the like teachers, uh, they, uh, right, they didn't know that which tool should be used and how it should be used. So that, also, that was also one excuse, I will say, because if our teachers, they want to learn, so they can learn, they can learn from each other. It is not necessary that there should be a formal teacher, but as a teacher, it's, uh, it, it's our responsibility to change ourselves with the changing environment. If we do not change, so there will be, uh, you see that we will not be able to survive just like Nokia company. Nokia company, uh, okay, uh, that uh, CEO right, was talking to a press conference and, right, and he said that we did nothing wrong, but even then we cannot exist because, because we could not change with the passage of time, with the changing times. So it is we teachers who have to change. Another thing is that we have to work with, as said by other like speakers, with students and parents. I noticed that uh, some of the students, uh, they were ready to learn, but their family system are when they were there in their homes. So they were, they were not given that uh, proper space and time. And online learning was not considered as a uh, learning by parents. I heard many times that, uh, okay, come and work in the kitchen, go out, there are guests, and so on. And uh, once I uh, like taught a class and uh, uh, their student was, uh, that was on uh, okay, Google Classroom. So, uh, so I noticed that he was absent. I asked many questions, but he didn't say anything. Next day I uh, said, uh, right to the students, where were you? So he said that, sir, I was attending, I was attending a funeral ceremony. <coughs> Sorry, I was attending a funeral ceremony. So you see that uh, there are such events uh, which are related to uh, right to families and to the mindset <coughs> which we need to work on. So we have to improve our this situation as well. And uh, uh, Dr. Suheli talked that everybody has right, access uh, uh, right to the devices. I myself, I don't agree. He, will, he has his own experiences. But in our part, there is digital divide, and especially with the government school children. Uh, right, our right, post design, our lesson plans, we have to change. We have to adapt our, uh, we have to adapt our lesson course designs and lesson plans to the like changing circumstances. And again, parents and guardians, they have to become a part of it. Uh, and uh, teachers, they have to work as mentors not uh, only as they have to uh, like interact with uh, right for teaching, uh, right for achieving certain objectives, but, uh, but teachers, they have, to, they have to encourage right the students right, for uh, using technology for learning. And as there are an African saying goes that it takes a village to raise a child, but now we can say that it takes a whole state to raise a child in hybrid education because everybody has to play his or her role. The state, 
uh, right teachers, right the family and the students. Uh, so right, in conclusion, I'll say that uh, it's an effective system and uh, it's possible, it's possible, but we have to, we have to change our beliefs as uh, we have to change our beliefs and uh, it's uh, uh, the remedy for many issues in our education uh, system. So change our beliefs is the most important thing. It was my study in PhD and uh, we have to be proactive uh, when the crisis starts so we cannot do anything. We have to prepare ourselves uh, in advance. And another thing that we have to become serious in our education uh, system and in our education. Yesterday I want to ask a question and to request our honorable minister that in KP they have done away with the uh, with the teacher education. So I would request and uh, we have to change ourselves with this. I would like to thank of, uh, okay power power is not available in my university uh, for four or five hours. Uh, so I was uh, a little bit in a hurry. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Right Federal College. It will move the future. Right, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Iqbal Khan, for your marvelous presentation. Thank you very much. Our next respectable speaker is Ms. Sidra Fasim. She is currently working with Beacon House School System in the capacity of headmistress. She graduated from Kinnaid College, Lahore and did master's in biochemistry from Punjab University. She has been associated with Beacon House for the last 20 years, working in different capacities in different branches. She attended professional courses in Plymouth State University and Cambridge. She has been extensively applying project-based learning in her profession. Now I would like to table, a, uh, now I would table a request in the honor of Ms. Sidra Kassi to present your up-to-date remarks. Ms. Sidra Kassi. Uh, dear Assalamu alaikum everyone. Once again, thank you so much Dr. Samia for inviting me in. Um, I'm not a PhD doctor and I'm not a researcher. So I, I'm simply a practitioner. So, you know, sometimes your theories do not actually align with what actually goes on in reality. So, uh, since, you know, I've been sitting here since morning and listening, and now it, it really, uh, I would refer to one of a very recent uh, conference which I attended, which, which was simply about how do you react when you go online. So, you know, when you are face to face talking to someone, you share your energy with the other person. And when you are on the screen attending something online, so that's a double burden on yourself. So this is exactly what I've experienced here. So this is now, it's very relatable. This is why children also usually, uh, you know, uh, get a little off uh, by being too long sitting on the screen. So now we can understand. So, you know, when we go online, it has to be a different format. It cannot be a flip situation. It can be not be an alternative. So is it the teaching you have cannot simply, you cannot replace teaching simply by going online. There has to be a different way of doing it. So since I've been working in Beacon House, as mentioned in my, uh, you know, introduction. So I've been working with the elite side of Pakistan. So, you know, we have students, we have our institution where we, I think, a little bit go ahead of what's going on in education in Pakistan. So, we have already before, you know, even the COVID scenario, we had been working on how to integrate technology in our teaching and learning. Because uh, as we already uh, know, and we all would agree with this, you know, the 21st century learner is basically um, an IT pro person. So the child or the learner needs to be taught in a way which is more comfortable for him. So this is something which is agreed. So I made a presentation, but I'm not showing it because most of the, of the things have been covered in, in all the speakers and I'm the last speaker. So I would like to change the direction of my uh, you know talk time here. This was a great opportunity and I think everybody now understands what hybrid is and everybody's spoken about the challenges and everybody has spoken about the benefits that we can take out of it. So I'm just going to go through the series what happened because you know our title today was not only hybrid uh, teaching and learning, but it was hybrid education integration learning and critical thinking. So critical thinking comes at the highest point of your learning. So this is where, you know, you have to reach to the max. You have to essence of teaching and learning here where you 
promote thinking, where you promote, uh, you know, critical thinking. So uh, prior to a uh, COVID situation, our institution was already working on the, you know, the needs of the 21st century learner. So yes, integration ke for bahut kaam hua, ke how can technology be brought in? How would it benefit the students and how? So there were a lot of things that we came across. You know, you ca cannot just simply replace a real face to face situation with an online thing so uh, you know aapko kis tarah usko integration lani hai where the learning is enhanced otherwise it's purposeless you if you want to give purpose to your teaching and learning so do not just use for the sake of you know then it's only a substitution i mean instead of the teacher delivering an exposition you show a video where somebody else is doing it agreed the maybe the the um, the delivery would be better than the live person but however it's different for different scenarios that that's just the substitution level so we came up with a lot of techniques so where technology can be brought to a higher level uh, especially i would like to refer to the samus model and i'm sure everybody sitting here they are highly qualified and everybody knows what samus model is samus model mein aap usko ek dusre level ke upar leke jaate hain by using technology okay fine this was all done then came in hybrid then came in the covid situation and there was a time when we completely had to go online up uh, now again coming from the background with which i have shared work in 20 years for an elite organization so hame problem nahi hui yes we started delivering our lessons online now again theory does not come exactly aligned with with the practicality so actually when we saw this happening so wohi wohi hua jo maine abhi aapse explain kiya tha ki when you flip from just delivering a lesson to online delivering a lesson so uska impact jo hai wo kam ho jata hai exactly what happened here like 9:30 se agar aap 11:30 tak sunenge kisi ki baat to then you will lose your concentration so yes are we started that one complete year which was bsu uh, going you know online we started working on the things that how can this be benefited so you know instead of the concept of a flip classroom we just came up with like let's uh, upload asynchronous task let's involve students let's go on breakout sessions so there were many techniques which were tried and tested and eventually somehow the teachers did come up with something which is which can be used for effective teaching and learning and now we come to the third stage which is hybrid hybrid definitely is a blend no need to explain it again i think all the speakers started by explaining what hybrid is so hybrid is an opportunity where you can use a face to face teaching time and where you can you know use the technology to the fullest way it can enhance the teaching and learning way it can promote the critical thinking so this is an ideal situation अब फिर जब इसको हम प्रैक्टिकल करने लगे तो फिर इस पर फिर प्रॉब्लम आ गई इट इज नॉट दैट इजी नो मैटर यू हैव द इक्विपमेंट नो मैटर योर द लर्नर एट द अदर हैंड इज आल्सो इक्विप्ड नो मैटर यू हैव ट्रेन्ड इवन नो मैटर यू नो हाउ टू यूज ऑल सॉर्ट ऑफ टूल्स बट स्टिल देयर इज समथिंग व्हिच इज नॉट बीन मेंशनड इन आइदर ऑफ द प्रेजेंटेशंस हियर सिंस मॉर्निंग इज दैट प्लानिंग अ हाइब्रिड मॉडल प्लानिंग फॉर हाइब्रिड टीचिंग एंड लर्निंग इटसेल्फ आई थिंक इज अ फील्ड जिसके ऊपर अभी काम होगा जाहिर है कि हम जब ट्राई करते हैं कोई तो चीज तो फिर इसी तरह सीखते हैं ट्राइड एंड टेस्टेड होती है एंड अगेन इट्स नॉट लाइक यू नो सिंस वी डील विद ह्यूमन रिसोर्स वी हैव चिल्ड्रन वी हैव uh live people on the other hand we as educationists have a responsibility to make sure ki you know aapka learner jo hai wo satisfied ho so iski jo planning hai that's very complex it's not easy so you know you this is something where this is the area where i think the world has to come together and where all educationists have to play a part and come up with researchers and come up with experimentations and come up with something which can benefit our learners so you know abhi aapko pata hi hoga ki uh, before the covid situation there was one very commonly uh, thing that you know maybe teaching is going to go as an obsolete profession because everything is going to go online up khan academy ke tutorials bhi dal denge then you have tools also which can enhance teaching and learning so you know now it in this one and a half year at least people have now realized ki face to face and a teacher how important it is so uh, the entire faculty i think it's it's um, it's something which we can say came as positive for the teaching faculty so uh, with this note i think i'm not going to take too long because iske upar bahut discussion ho chuki hui hai let's i think work together and come up with something which can help and enhance teaching and learning by using the hybrid model where we can blend in face to face ki benefit le and then we can upload asynchronous tasks we may give small activities to the students so that you know because a learner jo hai wo hai kya hai 
we need to have be inclusive you know because every child is an individual every child learns with its own pace so i think this hybrid is going to give is going to be i believe a paradigm shift in education so maybe this would become a model in the future maybe hybrid is going to be the future of education so we do not know let's experiment let's try and let's benefit and let's uh, try to give the best to our institutions once again thank you dr samia thank you for having me in and it was a wonderful session i think these sessions must go on and educationists from all around the world should be in together or bade problems they you know started with somebody from africa aur unhone apne bataye ki wahan pe communication issue hai so pakistan mein bhi aise hi hai we still have remote areas where students cannot access cannot directly commuting and transportation takes a toll of their energy coming to the place where they where they can gain some sort of education so i think hybrid jo hoga wo future hoga so let's all work together and let's come uh, to a future where you know we uh, we can give the best to our students so thank you thank you so much Thanks, Ms. Idra Kasi, for your well in five years. In last over session, Professor Dr. Nasiruddin, IER, Kohat University of Science and Technology, will conclude the session. He has an extensive experience at higher education levels in Pakistan, pedagogy and research. He has guided major research theses. He has supervised over thirty research students at MPhil as well as PhD level. He has received HEC Post Doctoral Scholarship Fellowship Awards. He has published more than seventy extensively researched papers in international journals and written a monograph, Educational Assessment. I would request to Dr. Nasiruddin to please share your concluding remarks on this session, Dr. Nasiruddin. So first of all, uh, thanks to Professor Dr. Samia Rahman Dogar. Is up to you. Awazari, yes. Uh, then my friend Dr. Hamid and uh, uh, Consul Secretary and Coordinator Dr. Nadia and all the entire team of the Federal College of Education. Uh, this is one of the wonderful opportunity for me as a student, as a learner. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting, informative uh, session. Uh, such a wonderful session. session. Okay. Oh, this is the part of hybrid online education system because uh, the answer that sometimes disconnect. Oh, but uh, uh, the credit goes to the team, entire team, because they have uh, arranged their facility very well. Or oh, sometimes disconnect will be occur, but we we will be face these things. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, in future, all of these things will be uh, adopted with time to time. So let's come to the uh, sessions. The session is half an hour, or oh, one and a half an hour, and this session is divided into two parts, in two sections. The first one is uh, present two paper. Uh, uh, these two paper presented by international uh, uh, speaker, and the responded to these two paper, uh, the very known uh, academicians. After the second sessions, or. Uh, just to brief about uh, the four speaker they have uh, discussed about the uh, uh, significance and importance of uh, hybrid education let me explain if we uh, discuss one by one these uh, research paper and speakers uh, the first research paper that is hybrid education uh, because the session topic is Hybrid education, integrated learning, inquiry, and critical thinking. As a uh, researcher, as a educationist, uh, we look forward, and we uh, look these things for the future perspectives and visions, because for uh, as a teacher community, especially, this is our responsibility, uh, because we have. Know about the curricula. We have know about the pedagogy, and we have have know about the system. So 
the key question is that for my side how we can link this terminology and this concept to hybrid education integrative learning inquiry and critical thinking in this session because the concept is for hybrid education integrated learning inquiry and critical thinking but during the whole entire session we just focus on the hybrid education why because this is needs our society after the covid 19 pandemic situation this is not only in one part of pakistan across the world everywhere so i appreciate again the um, entire the coordinate the team of conference because they have selected two research papers one of africa another for india sides so this is just like we say totally uh, uh, we can uh, relate with our culture in our nation because india is the part of subcontinent and we are the part of subcontinent same like the issues and problem of pakistan like africa so this is the two papers is very important and very significant and the recommendation of these two papers is very uh, fruitful because if we have uh, compare our uh, uh, country scenario and our country perspectives to these nations say like in the COVID situation because we are we have to face these things and we are still facing these things because COVID is still uh, continues and we are looking these things in future in our education system so the first research paper presented by Peter hybrid education so this is very significant not a part of only for African countries across the world especially in Pakistani countries because they highlight the problem these problem related one of our, our speaker uh, Edward Khan said oh, I just still oh, facing the problem of net issues, some other issues, some uh, other gender issues, or uh, Dr. Hamid Saab is there. So why I'm, uh, I, I'm coming here or oh, physically? I prefer physically because maybe in Kohat there are some problems for this uh, connectivity of the internet. So we are still facing these issues and problems in our provincial capital. So uh, this is at the Hans Saab say, right? So some of the problem of gender issues, some of the problem of disconnectivity, some of the problem of facility and resources. So same like the first paper, they highlight very well. And the second paper, this is the online education. That is the online education uh, in respect of rural. So this paper is also interesting. And this paper, uh, they highlight about the uh, facility, uh, just like resources, facility, and how we can teach uh, online education in respect of these, these domains. So this is the second one. If we co compare the first one and second one, we have need some things because this is one of the debatable issue. In the paper, these things are highlighted. Why, how we can improve these things? What is the way forward? So this is the end of session. We, why not we should give some suggestion the way forward of these? I have talked about the curricular pedagogy assessments. As a, as a researcher, as an educationist, how we can link these things? So this is the question. This is not we can, we can say how we can operate the online education, just we go on the uh, internet and the computer and Facebook and et cetera, et cetera. We then these things and we have to conduct online session, online lecture. This is reality, but how can we improve these things? The first one, as a, as a clinician, we think about how we can improve curricula as per online activity. How can we improve our curricula as per hybrid education? This is the needs of our society. The same thing, how we can teach, how we can teach yes, means yes. pedagogy. Pedagogy is very important because sometimes we are facing this, I'm a lecturer, for example, I deliver my lecture but maybe the students are present on other sides. This is the question. So as a clinician, we look these things. The third one is very, very important. That is assessment. Assessment because one of the manual type of assessment. So how we can generate assessment to electronic, that, that is called e-assessment, e-learning, e-pedagogy. 
So these three things is very important in my, in my point of view, or uh, as a student of research. So we will be work on these things because we know about there are different types of online system like face-to-face -face or hybrid online web-based designs. Some are less online, some are more online, just like talk about them, Peter. But we will be analyzing these situations. Oh, I just share one of uh, thing. This is uh, for the last uh, I, since 2014. Uh, I have worked uh, with the uh, HEC and federal board in, in the federal board about the assistant and HEC. Uh, I was that time worked with the Kedao Sin Vidya for curricula academic. So we have at that time worked about the hybrid education and blended in learning. Uh, uh, we have a lot of things, especially these things in the science education, because without saying uh, uh, previous background, background about the science education, I'm also one of the science education. So we, we, we have to work on these things. But these are on the pipeline. But the, after the current situation of COVID-19 pandemic, so this is our need. Uh, I just share one more thing because in Pohat University, uh, not uh, we can say uh, like a Zoom, like uh, other thing online lectures. First of all, we have to uh, record these lectures and these lectures then go through the academic council. After the academic council, they, will, they have to approve these uh, lectures and then they will be online to a website. So there are different techniques. So this is the time we come to the one focus point. We will be. Uh, Give the solutions. So this, these are the few uh, way forward. Like another one of the speaker, Dr. Uh, Dogger from the USA, he 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 gives some way forward. This is one of the nice presentation. I think more important because uh, as a teacher, we know that this is the online lecture. This is the pre-recorded lecture. This is the uh, in-session uh, session lecture class lecture. So these are the different term terminologies. So for this purpose, I think I think very important as a student of researcher, we will give researcher more time to research these things. Especially, uh, I would like to request the uh, university in higher education, uh, including professor, because uh, Dr. Tilly, she is uh, uh, discussed about, and she is also recommended that professor will be give this thing and they will be take a, a, a front role. So if, we, if if the professor will be oh, to concern these things and they will be look up, look these things in the sense of higher education because in higher education, the students are more mature. But the problem, there are three uh, system of education, primary education, elementary, one of secondary in higher education is the uh, third. So we not just only focus in higher education, secondary in uh, elementary is more important, both are important, but we will be start from the one side. So it is very easy for us. We start from higher education and we will give our students different types of research like face-to-face, e-learning. Uh, in my university, uh, my different student research scholars work on these things, especially some are work on e-learning, some are work on the face-to-face -face interaction. Because if we highlight this problem and we, 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 we will conduct different survey and we will conduct some experimental study and then we will find out some of these things, hopefully these, these things will be modified and these things will be improved. So this is the time for um, you know, hybrid education. And if the time is hybrid education or in the time of uh, e-learning and integrative education, why we should not improve these things? So um, uh, as a role of education, especially in, in the Federal College of Education, one of the uh, uh, major role of education, uh, especially in the field of, in the discipline of education. So I would also request to you and your team, you will be work on these things, you will be facilitate and you will be promote these things. So the hybrid education as well as critical education, uh, uh, and the, one of the uh, speaker, Dr. Afsha, they, they uh, clearly mentioned about the, uh, that uh, we just focus on the hybrid education, but critical thinking is also thinking is also important because uh, first of all, learners think about these things. 
to how we can take a critical situation, analyze, and evaluate, and uh, uh, assess these things. So these, this is also important. But the time to uh, uh, conclude uh, these things in one sentence, because we link this hyper education and uh, critical thinking and face to face as blended learning with integrated learning activities. So for this way, first of all, we, we sit together and we just like, this is one of the best forum today. We will discuss these things. To, uh, we have to discuss last day and we will discuss today in the rest of two sessions. So we, we, we will uh, focus on this uh, area. Where is the weakness? Where is the strength? It's just like salt analysis. Where is threats? Uh, because Dr. Ibar Khan said, we have some problem in our uh, uh, society and culture, something like resources, deficiencies of resources, deficiencies of technology. Uh, if I give just example of my uh, university, cohort university, so it is impossible for the whole and entire university, we will provide less, like the laptop or computer, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes we will uh, require uh, these things, but the, the, the problem of internet and facility, so all of these uh, uh, strength and weakness related with the uh, hyper and integrated learning education. So at the end, I just close these things. Uh, hope for the best, uh, inshallah, in future, uh, we will be work as a researcher in different research activities. The curricula developer think about in the curricula, the uh, assessment, because assessment is also important. We, we focus in these, these three, four areas, curricula, pedagogy, assessment, with the help of uh, different techniques of like uh, hybrid education, face-to-face -face learning, blended learning, innovating teaching methods, e-learning, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks so much. I think uh, the time is more. So thank you so much for my side. Thanks, Dr. Nasiruddin, for your marvelous concluding remarks. Let me take the opportunity to say that the session was very insightful for us in terms of suggesting ways and means to overcome the problems and challenges faced by us, not only as a teacher, as well as students. At the end, I offer warm thanks to paper presenters, speakers of being very kind to share their esteemed thought with us. I am also grateful to the audience for being with us. Once again, thank you all and assalamu alaikum. Bismillah rahman uh, On behalf of uh, your host organizations, uh, the Federal College of Education, Pakistan Alliance for Early Childhood, and other collaborators of this conference, I warmly welcome all distinguished speakers, academicians, students, and researchers from Pakistan and from around the globe to this virtual conference on academia during and post COVID-19. As you all know it well that COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted our social, economic, and political life. While the pandemic has affected everyone, the most critically affected are young children, their parents, and caregivers. According to scientists, this virus is not going to go away anytime sooner. Therefore, the intelligent thing is to change our lifestyle and adapt our individual and collective behavior and culture to the new COVID-19 world. Like all great events, COVID-19 has resulted in a paradigm shift. It has created unprecedented challenges, but also unprecedented opportunities. Thankfully, we are learning and adapting every day and finding new ways about ourselves and the world around us. We are gradually moving away from traditional learning processes and adopting technology-based and more innovative solutions. This conference is one such example of how, individual, how individuals and institutions are finding ways to manage the fallout from this pandemic, especially the teaching and learning processes. The speakers of yesterday's sessions shed light on how they found ways to address the new challenges faced by the frontline workers, teachers, gatekeepers, and caregivers. 
this concurrent session which is on early childhood care and education will focus on ways and approaches to support young children to survive and thrive by building the capacities of parents teachers and caregivers to play their to enable them to play their due role in the upbringing of their children our worthy presenters of this concurrent session will also share the perception and skills of primary teachers about using play as a pedagogy at home and at schools during and post covid and the problems faced by the educational managers and teachers in the implementation of the curriculum for early childhood care and education the format of today's session is that there are three paper presenters two guest speakers and a session chair each presenter will be given 15 minutes to make his her presentation and the participants will be given an opportunity to ask their questions if any uh, during the question and answer session before moving forward i would like to introduce dr neem zafar who will be chairing this concurrent session Dr Naeem Zafar is a pediatrician uh, by profession he is the founding president of protection and help of children against abuse and neglect he is also the founding head of child rights department university of lahore and dr naeem zafar is sitting on uh, many of the boards which are working uh, for child protection and child um, uh, child development he is the executive council member of international society for prevention of child abuse and neglect and he is the co-chair of national action coordination group for south asia initiative to end violence against children he is also the convener of south asia group on on prevention of child abuse and neglect and we are lucky to have him as a, a board of director on pakistan alliance for early childhood board as well he has received um, international society for prevention of child abuse and neglect multidisciplinary global award for his innovative work in 2006 he has been awarded um, smk uh, vasti gold medal for his meritorious services for the children of pakistan by pakistan pediatrician association um i uh, before uh, moving forward uh, dr neem zafar thank you very much for giving us your consent and to chair this session and also thank you for joining us uh, with your permission i would like to invite the first presenter of today's session sir thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, thank you <clears throat> and um, i think we are already getting late so we should start right away and we can discuss later okay Okay thank you very much Our first presenter of the today's session is um Miss Anila Altaf Mukhi uh, who is an educationist she is she is a early childhood development specialist researcher counselor writer trainer and a life coach with an experience of more than two decades and we are lucky to have her as uh, our uh, early childhood development expert uh, uh, for pakistan alliance for early childhood so her um, the title of her presentation is um sensitization demonstration individual support and referrals for parenting intervention model and parenting discipline practices in rawalpindi pakistan um anila uh, the floor is yours thank you very much and over to you this is the title of my presentation this morning svir parenting intervention model and parenting discipline practices in rawalpindi pakistan and i am going to explain during my presentation what does this svir mean and before that i would like everybody to participate in the on this very slide that I, that is in front of you which school of thought do you belong to 
and there are things on the right side of the column and there are things on the left side of the column. The first one is this one, spare the rod, spoil the child, or if you love your children, you will discipline them and use, lo look at the object that is used for disciplining. And then the third picture where the child is brutally beaten by the parents. So if you think that you belong to this school of thought, fine, then towards the end of the presentation, you may wish to reconsider your understanding of disciplining. And the alternative perspective of disciplining is this one, more nurturing one, positive disciplining, where there is more focus on child development, self-discipline, responsibility, cooperation, problem solving, and more of communication and nurturing. So I'm going to be talking about disciplining in an alternative ways. And then I'm also going to be discussing and sharing some of the impacts that are happening in child's brain while uh, the child is in the earliest stage of brain development in the earliest stage of life. So here you can see uh, some research extracts and you can clearly, it clearly demonstrates that when parents are uh, enforcing or when parents are implementing harsh or inconsistent disciplining practices, it results into behavioral issues in children. And that actually results into even harsher disciplining. So it's a vicious cycle. And somewhere down the line, one has to think that, do we really want this outcome? Is this what we want from our children as parents? Our outcome is that we would like to have well-disciplined and nurtured child who is you know, having a holistic exposure towards development. But the approach that we are taking, is that the right approach? That's my question. So look at the research that, it, that is conducted in a, somewhere in 96 and 98. And it says that lack of warm positive relationship with parents, insecure attachments, harsh, inflexible and rigid disciplining, inconsistent practices and inadequate supervision and involvement with children. So these are the bases. And that's what we have to understand that how best we can implement alternative ways of disciplining in order to have better outcomes and better results. Here, there is another piece of research. And here it is very clearly mentioned that parenting practices lead to disruptive behavior in children. And now what type of parenting practices are we talking about? These five practices are common and it is widespread in so many developing countries around the world. Punitive disciplining, which includes yelling, nagging, threatening, inconsistency means sometimes you are calm, sometimes you are loving, and sometimes you are really using harsh ways. Lack of warmth and positive involvement, physical aggression by parents, and spanking means brutally beating children. So these are some of the practices and clearly it is mentioned on this very piece of research that it results into disruptive behavior in children. On this very slide, you can see another piece of research conducted in 2013. And here you can see the inverse proportion. The more the responsive and consistent parenting goes above, you know, uh, on a higher side, aggression and violence in children goes on a lower side. So all these pieces of research clearly demonstrate that we as parents in Pakistan and other developing countries need to think or rethink or need to understand alternative measures of disciplining children because our outcome is to have disciplined, well-nurtured children, well-behaved children, but probably our approach is wrong. Then another piece of research here which says what actually is going to have a better outcome? The better outcome is going to come through parenting intervention. Parenting interventions hold some promise for improving parenting practices and reducing risk factors for child maltreatment in low and middle income countries and, and Pakistan fall in this category, middle income country. So, you know, in, in any of the countries, whether they are Asia or Africa or any other part of the world, where we can see that certain practices can be improved and these are actually going to these are actually having risk factors for child for child so parents need to really look into their mechanism and the way of they parent their children 
the problem was the statement of the problem the ideal situation is good parenting should result into good well disciplined children and another thing that we have to understand is increased cases of ch children misbehaving may result from how they are disciplined and it is very common as we all know in pakistan that most parents use harsh ways of disciplining children and behavioral issues become worse as they grow up and join the school system and then one more thing we need to understand is many studies related to harsh punishments have been conducted however the one on parenting intervention is scarce in general and that is the reason my study is going to focus on parenting intervention and i am using an action research research approach using sdir model first before i discuss the sdir model let me share the objectives of the study the first objective was to examine current parenting discipline practices in pakistan so uh, in fact i conducted this study in rawalpindi since it is a covid pandemic time going on so the the research was conducted using zoom technology the second objective was establishing behavior problems in children in connection with parenting discipline practices that what are the problems children are exhibiting due to which parents have to use harsh disciplining so first we need to understand how parents are disciplining them second we have to understand what children are doing that makes children use those that make parents use those disciplining measures and then the third objective of the study was to implement sdir parenting intervention model so purpose of the study was to demonstrate how sdir parenting intervention model can be used to improve parenting discipline practices and here is the model that i have been talking about since the beginning of my presentation it has four levels and if this study and if this study if this uh, model can be replicated in at a uh, larger scale in pakistan we can witness actually miracles because we will have really well disciplined children in any in every village in every city in every town of pakistan so the first level is sensitization second level is demonstration third level is individual support and the fourth level is reference my research questions were what are the current pra parenting practices number 2 what are the behavior problems in children in the sample families in rawalpindi in connection with parenting discipline practices and then number 3 how did the implementation of sdir parenting intervention model take place in connection with parenting discipline practices so i implemented all these four levels of uh, this model with the sample families that i was i was talking to you about through zoom technology let me explain the model in detail s stands for sensitization during this phase or during this level a series of five workshops on various aspects of positive parenting impact of harsh disciplining on early brain development nurturing care and positive disciplining techniques were discussed in detail with those very families who were actually using harsh ways of disciplining their children i must tell you that this sensitization helped me a lot because it actually changed the perception of these very parents and they are now very much eager to use alternative measures of disciplining and towards the end you will see the results also the outcome what parents have shared with me that how much damage they have made to their children since the time they were very young because they have been using the same very methods of disciplining their children what they have experienced on from their parents when they were very young my second level of uh, this model was demonstration and i used activities such as counseling cards scenarios case analysis reflections and artwork with these very parents and if anybody is interested to have more information about all these different levels Uh, my email id i have shared with you and you can even contact us on uh, perfect pakistan alliance for early childhood for more details about this very model the next level of uh, this model was individual support and that entails one on one counseling sharing tip sheets as well as electronic resources on the subject matter the last level of this very model was reference means directing critical cases for further investigation and professional physical mental health support system in pakistan or through online means abroad 
So this is the very model that I implemented with these by five families in Pakistan. Here is the conceptual framework. As you can see on the very left side, SVIR parenting intervention model, these are the four elements, sensitization, demonstration, individual support, and referrals. Through these four things, through these four levels, I was able to share the knowledge and the skills and the confidence with these very parents that I'm talking about. And as a result, you can see on the very right side, parenting discipline practices was generated through nurturing parenting, engaging parenting, nonviolent parenting, and low conflict parenting. I must also tell you the intervening variables were, were, were considered, considering the culture of the you know, families that I was dealing with, the context where they live, as well as the level of interaction back and forth that we were having. So these were the variables which were also part and parcel of this entire uh, conceptual framework. Now let me move on to the theoretical framework. My theoretical framework for this study was social learning theory of Bandura 1977. And based on that, this conceptual diagram has been developed and implemented. And then it was executed with the support of uh, all these different levels that I talked about. And I'm now very eager to share with you the results. But before I share with you the results, let me share the scope. Geographical scope and content scope. Geographical scope, as I earlier mentioned, it is in the city of Rawalpindi, Pakistan, with five families identified through purposive sampling from community-based child care centers. The content scope, because it was a limited study, I'm going to be focusing only on the dependent and in independent variables presented in the conceptual framework, which I just discussed on the previous slide. Significance of the study, let me inform that five families indeed benefited from this study. It has actually having a, a, a lifetime impact on those very children who belong to these five families, those very children who were brutally being beaten by their parents. Now these very parents have completely changed and transformed their ways of parenting, which is something to be really, um, you know, uh, something to be very, really appreciative about. The current parenting practices identified in this study may be used to inform lo local government for education and other agencies on what practices to work with. The study, through this study, it will also fill the literature gap in the research in existing parenting discipline practices in Pakistan. And the results will be published in journals for benefits by wider audiences for replication and further research. So these are some of the uh, significant, significant aspects of this study. The methodology that I used was qualitative research methods. And then the design was action research. Sampling was done through purposive sampling. Sampling size was five families because we would like, we want, I wanted to have an in depth interaction. And since there were four levels of uh, this model, so the smaller the group, it was easier for me to have an in depth. A connection with the family and to have the, uh, the, the know how, how they are implementing it. Time period five days parenting intervention program, one hour each day on Zoom. So that is what I earlier mentioned as well. The study was conducted in two distinct phases. The first phase was to examine current parenting practices to parents' perception in connection with parenting discipline practices. What do they consider parenting is all about? What is their understanding of parenting all about? How do they perceive it? And what are some of the things we need to change in their mentality and thinking when it comes to parenting and when it comes to disciplining? So that was my first phase. And then the second phase was to implement SDIR parenting intervention model in connection with parenting discipline practices. After that, I would also like to share with you the sampling. My criteria was very clear. I wanted the parents of children ranging from birth to eight years, because that is the time when brain development is at the peak. That is the time considered for early childhood development. Although first two years and the time of pregnancy is the most critical time, but I considered all those years until the age of eight for this very study. Parents with children facing behavior problems, and then Urdu language competencies was also considered because I, this whole program was conducted in Urdu with the parents so that their level of understanding can get richer and enhanced. 
Now, the most anticipated thing that I was, I've been talking about, and I'm so eager to share with you the result. Before the implementation of SDIR model, let me share with you what these parents were doing. Research participants expressed their inability to manage their own anger and resorting to harsh ways of parenting discipline practice. So this came out very evidently from the study. Now, I must also tell you that what actually parents, children are doing, that, that becomes the cause of parents giving them brutal punishment. When children become aggressive, when children become oppositional, when children become hyperactive, so these are the behaviors of children, and that becomes the cause that parents are using harsh disciplining practices. Now, this is all before the implementation of SDIR model. Now, what do parents do actually to discipline them? They yell and shout, they slap, they use objects to beat children such as wire, rod, branch of tree, rolling pin, ya balan. And it was a widespread practice in all the families and neighborhood. This is something that was really emotional for me because it was giving me as a, as a researcher, it was sort of a torture for me that children are experiencing all these things from their parents in the very early ages of life when the brain development is at the peak and parents should resist doing all these things because they're actually damaging the brain of the child. And when the child goes into the school system, those are the very parents that complain about academic performance of children, that my child is not performing well and my child is having academic difficulties and my child is having behavioral issues, and they don't realize that they are the very people who have been giving them such, uh, such harsh punishments in the early childhood uh, years. And that is the result that children are having academic difficulties. And then I must tell you that behavior issues kept continuing, even, even after using physical punishment, behavior issues did not sort they were not able to solve those problems. And children continued to behave in a more aggressive manner with their siblings and lack, and they lacked ability to sort minor squabbles amicably. So that shows that if you are beating the children, we are not getting the desired outcome. For the desired outcome, we need to change our approach. Our approach is not right. We cannot... Uh, get the outcome that we are desiring through this harsh punishment that we are giving to our children. Now, let's understand that after the implementation of SDIR model, just within five days, what are the perception of parents? Parents expressed, we have made terrible mistake using harsh disciplining measures when children were young and now we are seeing the repercussions. The same parents who have been using harsh disciplining earlier, after this model, they are now expressing a totally different story. Parents pledged to use positive disciplining henceforth. Parents gained the skills of self-regulation for themselves and how to inculcate those skills in their children. The problem is they, as parents, are not able to control their own anger. When child does something, we we have to understand the milestone of the child, what milestone child is going through, what age group child is in, because the child competencies of children are not going to be as, you know, you know, as uh, equal to the competencies of an adult. So child is still in the process of development. We are expecting child to behave in a uh, fantastic manner, in a hundred percent perfect manner. That is unrealistic. First, parents have to uh, control their own anger to self-regulation skills. And those were implemented through SVIR model with these very parents. That what to do when you feel angry, how to leave that room for a while so that you can get composed and a more, uh, you know, a more easy outcome when it comes to sitting down with child, discussing and having a nurturing communication. Parents gain knowledge and understanding brain development in early years and how to use alternative measures of disciplining for better and more sustained positive results. And after concluding this study towards the end of my presentation, I would like to present some recommendations to this esteemed body of conference uh, members who are attending. 
my first recommendation is longitudinal study of this group of participants can be conducted to see the long term impact of sdir model those very five families conduct uh, you know if time permits we should we need to take these very families and take them along the period of 10 15 years and see how those children are doing in those 10 15 years time so that we can actually see the real impact lifetime impact on that family my next recommendation to the board is upscaling take this sdir model into larger context of pakistan and derive greater societal impact the third recommendation to to the panel is harsh discipline practices by parents should be legally banned because we do a lot of measures to ban the punishment physical punishment or corporal punishments in the schools but we do not do anything for parents at home because parents are the ones who are actually subjecting the children towards this side all these type of brutal punishments and this should be legally banned and policies and procedures should be in place now you can see the diagram here earlier also on my first slide i shared with you this diagram if you love your children you will discipline them but not harshly and what do we need to do for that we need to switch towards more nurturing ways of disciplining towards towards the end i once again thank you all for providing me this opportunity to make this presentation thank you very much once again and allah hafiz um thank you very much uh, anila um you have highlighted uh, an important issue uh, which is very common unfortunately in our society and um, as you said uh, through positive parenting or through positive behavior positive practices you can really help the child develop in a proper manner and then you can really make him or her Uh, a productive citizen a successful person in later life because this the negative uh, uh, practices and the mal practices especially punishing children have a lifelong impact on the overall development of the child so thank you very much uh, if the participants have any questions i would request you to uh, jot them down so that we can uh, ask anila those questions later on uh, during the question and answer session um without uh, you know taking much time because our next speaker is, has connected us from uk um she um she is waiting for us so um i am going to uh, madiha uh, sajid i would like to introduce madiha sajid uh, she is a fellow of the higher education academy uk and works at uh the university college london uk she is the founder and chair of ucl parents and cares together network which has more than 700 members she has won the prestigious ucl excellence award for showing exceptional leadership skills in supporting parents at ucl madiha's profile includes international projects on education career development and supporting families she is a regular guest speaker across higher education sector and invited talks about inclusive education gender diversity work life balance and equal opportunities she also delivers training across the education sector on career development interview techniques presentation skills academic writing and conscious bias women in uh, stem handling students complain team working effective communication skills so on and so forth and we are very lucky and very thankful to uh, madiha uh, who has been an excellent uh, support to our alliance she has conducted three well attended um, webinars for us and uh, um, i have been sharing the appreciation and the recognition Uh, we have received about those webinars from our participants with madiha so thank you very much madiha for supporting the alliance and for educating the society in pakistan about all these important you know areas which are um, contributing towards the development of children um, 
Uh, Madiha is going to talk about uh, who cares for the caregivers, impact of COVID-19 on caregivers. Um, I will not uh, take your time, so um, I will hand over the session to you, Madiha. Uh, thank you so much. Bohot shukriya, Khadija. Assalamu alaikum, everyone who can hear my voice. Um, I hope I am able, so I, that that means everyone can hear me. Yeah, you are all uh, Bohot bohot shukriya for coming online today and for making time. Thank you to uh, Anila, my, my co-presenter, who has already presented before me, kiya hai, and thank you to Naim Saab for the opening remarks as well. Um, today's conversation is going to be about who cares for the caregiver, the impact of COVID-19 on caregivers. My name is Madiha, Madiha Sajid, and this is my Twitter account, Madiha Sajid UCL. A bit about me. Uh, firstly, just say, Abhi Khatija ne mera introduction diya hai. I have all these different hats that I wear. I have been working in London at UCL for Imperial College London. I am the chair of the National Network of Parents and Carers. I am a well-being practitioner. I work in gender equality. But I feel that is all the, the boring bit about me. What is the really interesting bit about me, what makes me more human and more real are all these bits on the right-hand side. I'm a mother, I am a daughter, I'm a wife, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, um, I'm, I'm a chef for my daughter, I'm her driver, I'm everything for her. So the reason I have told you this is because the, my lived experience, this is what makes me real. This is what makes me relatable to you. And uh, this is what my presentation is going to be based on today. And one very important thing to mention is that I am also an accredited I act manager for positive mental health and well-being from the Rollage College of Psychiatry here in the UK. This is really important because the issues we are going to talk about, they are very sensitive, they're very heavy, they're very vulnerable. And that's why it's uh, important for me to let you know that I am professionally qualified to, to deal with those and to cope with those. So today I'm presenting to you on behalf of the Women's Higher Education Network here in the UK. This is a network for all women who work in higher education across academia. Uh, and this is a network where we do a lot of research about the different roles that um, parents have, that carers have in our lives. I'll just try to uh, write. So uh, when the pandemic hit us, we did a uh, research. We tried to find out the experiences of parents, mothers, fathers, and carers, and the research report is called Sharing the Caring. This research report made there were more than 1,000 parents and carers who responded to our survey questions, who took part in the research. Uh, with few of them, we had open-ended interviews as well. We used a mixed methods approach, which means there was a bit of a qualitative element to the research, and there was a bit of a quantitative element to the research. There were six key questions asked, and I'll talk you through those one by one. And afterwards, we applied the thematic analysis to analyze those conversations and to figure out what were the key learnings. So, um, our schedule presentation here, today I will talk about three things. The first one is the main findings from the research study, sharing is caring. Secondly, I will talk about what were our key learnings. And lastly, I will finish off with some recommendations. I will try to finish within um, 12 to 15 minutes. So please bear with me and watch me. First of all, let's talk about the sample. Jo Hamari research thi usne, what was the sample looking like? Of the, look at the gender. We had about 961 women responding to the survey and about 106 men who responded. Uh, different career stages, pay, mostly almost 80% of the respondents were at mid-level career stage and about 11% were at senior level. What were the ages of their children? Um, more than 12 years old, about 32% uh, 
and about 25.4% Betia, and you can see the rest of the breakdown on the screen. And the number of children in the household, it was mostly 60.9, uh, almost 61% had two, two children, uh, two sons, and then 61.2 about two daughters. And this, this is really important because it helps us to understand where the data is coming from. Who are the people we are asking these questions? So the, the six key things that we asked them was, the first thing was um, the hidden figures data is very, very hard to get about parents and carers and caregivers in, in uh, academia. And we, we almost tend to call them the hidden figures. And what this, this the first question told us was that, that during the lockdown, the working mothers reported that 78% of them, they had challenges in managing childcare and their paid work. 57% of them said their career prospects were affected negatively. And 32% of them said that the ability to do paid job was impacted negatively. And we will break all of this down in a minute. When we talk about sharing the caring, who carried most of the burden? If you look at the breakdown, 75% of women, they were coordinating and organizing children's activities. They were doing the, the schoolwork with them. 64% of them, they were doing the cooking. They were providing emotional support. And 42% of them were doing the play with the, the play activities, giving them time to their children. And please keep these figures in mind because they will all begin to make sense very shortly. When we talk about dividing the domestics, jo domestic ghar ke kaam hai, un mein kya role tha, men and women ka, both parents ka, both caregivers ka. The traditional gender roles were very, very evident. So if you look at this, 67% um, women were doing meal planning, they were doing the, the cooking, etc. 29% of fathers were doing that. But if you look down the slide, 63% of fathers were managing the payment of bills. They were doing household maintenance, 64% of them. Whatever there is, the fathers were taking a more prominent role in that. If you look in the middle, 33% of them were helping with the shopping and the planning of purchases and 57% of mothers were taking that on. Question number four that we asked our respondents was caring outside of home, not for your children, but maybe for your elderly parents, maybe for your spouse's family. And 68% of the respondents said that looking after elderly parents was a big priority. And then 9% of them said that was the truth for neighbors as well. And the care that we were provide, the respondents were providing was a lot about doing shopping for them because we could not expect our elderly parents to go outside uh, of their homes. We were all in lockdown. I remember that my own parents-in-law were in that situation. We asked them not to step out of the house just for their own safety. We used different family members, took turns to drop them groceries, to bring them medicines, to give them emotional support. So all of that was very, very very evident in the survey. And then I quickly want to draw your attention to this term, the sandwich generation. What is a sandwich generation? Basically, it is a, a person, a caregiver who is caught between the two generations. They have their own young children to look after, such as this picture. And then they also have their own parents to look after. I'm sure that many of you, they, we are all in the same situation. We are all in a sandwich generation that we are caring for our own children, as well as we are caring for our parents as well. And this, this comes with a lot of um, privileges. This is an honor in some ways, and this in many ways is a big responsibility as well. And the thing is that to add to the complication now, there are cultural expectations from women and daughters that they will be expected to look after parents instead of both mothers and fathers. Um, this is something which is very contextual to Pakistan. I have, I'm born and bred in Pakistan. I fully understand how this, how this translates into action and what does it mean for families where the cultural expectation is that the mothers or the daughters will look after more and more of the parents and the young children as well. Now, 
Apart from this, the question number five that we asked them was about the personal and family lives of caregivers. And many of the responses, they expressed worry about their, their family well-being, their personal well-being, there were feelings of stress, their feelings of guilt. I have not been spending much time on myself. I have not taken breaks. I'm more tense. I'm more emotional. I'm less productive at work. It's a hard thing. There was a loss of personal time and space because all of the time of the caregivers was spent in cooking, cleaning, getting children ready for school, doing household work, picking up prescriptions for old or older people, et cetera, et cetera. And then this, this question is so important that it, it, the results continued. The respondents also said that because of their caring responsibilities, there was a lack of social connection because there was no time to actually do social connections. Zoom was just not enough for people to develop meaningful connections. And then finally, uh, respondents also said that there was a lot of inability to do any exercises because there is literally no time in the evenings. I'm sure this is very, very relatable to all of you. Family we have to do the cooking. Somebody has got to do the, the washing of the dishes. By the time everything is done, by the time the kitchen is closed, it's already nine o'clock in the evening. There is literally no time to put in for exercise to look at our own health and well-being. And this was an uh, open text question that we asked that which personal activity or which area has suffered the most since the start of the pandemic? And the most uh, obvious answer that we can see here is that the time, the work, the exercise, the health issues, they have been really, really badly affected. The final question that we asked was the impact on careers. What was the impact of the pandemic on the careers of the working parents and the caregivers? You will see on the slide that more than 90% more than 90% felt that the pandemic would affect their career in the next six months. 80% uh, felt that the pandemic would affect their career in the next two years. And 58% were really, really negative about the impact of the pandemic on their careers. And I think a lot of the negative comments or the pessimism was about we won't get a pay rise, we won't get a promotion, it will take longer. And the fathers who were who were working fathers, they were actually more pessimistic, they were more worried, more negative about their careers than mothers because they either they were experiencing or risking loss of jobs, zero contracts, or they were risking that they would not get ahead, they would not be in a position of decision making. So the, the career of fathers in some ways the results show that it suffered more than the career of mothers. And um, I will not read out these uh, speech bubbles. I will just allow you 10 seconds to please read these um, free text responses, which I have picked up from the survey. The reason to show you this slide was to allow you to understand that what were the overall feelings of parents and carers during the pandemic, how it impacted their so many different areas of their life, whether it is their domestic chores, whether it is their health and well-being, whether it is their social connections, or whether it is their career the impact on their career. So after the six key questions, what are the key learnings? What have we found? The first key learning is that the traditional gender roles pretty much exist everywhere, pretty much all across the world, not only in Pakistan, here in the UK as well. Women were found to be doing most of the work with, with children, their schoolwork, and as well as the household shows. They were physically and emotionally more available for their children and their families as expected as compared to fathers. Fathers had an increase, they had a massive increase in their child care and their caring outside the home efforts because they had to go out, they had to get money to keep the, the family running. The, the domestic tasks, they remain predominantly within the remit of women. The second key learning was the impact on well-being. 
all mothers and fathers, all caregivers, they reported massive effect, a disastrous effect on their well-being, their confidence. They were reporting loss of sleep. They were reporting weight gain. Um, like um, my colleague was saying, a lot of um, irritated behavior, anger bursts, and a lot of social isolation and loneliness as well. And both mothers and fathers, both they had the same concerns, you know, that they were they were stressed, they had feelings of guilt that they are not doing enough for their families. They had it had negative impact on their mental health and well-being. There was no uh, uh, no social support system for them to go out, have a coffee with their friends. They did not feel connected to their peers. There was loss of time to be on their own, to have their own space, to rest, to exercise, and to enjoy any any opportunities. And finally, all the caregivers, they reported big concerns about their children's educational progress, no matter how many online classes the children took, no matter how many times they sat down and did the homework with them, the educational progress remained a very, very big concern of all uh, parents and um, caregivers. And finally, the key impact, the, the key learning was the impact on their careers. And the caregivers were worried about, first of all, what about if I have no job at all? What if I have loss of learning? And okay, if I have managed to stay on to my job, what about my career progression? How long will it take me to progress in my career? What is really going to be my reputation like when I go back to work? I have missed out on so many developmental opportunities, so many workshop trainings, so many seminars, so many webinars, so many other areas where I could have progressed and made use of those opportunities. I could not do so. And finally, they were really worried that they are not involved in decision making at work. They are losing out that element as well. So the pandemic is having a long term impact on the careers of uh, parents, carers, both of these uh, populations. So part number three, finally, what are the recommendations from this research study? So I have broken down the recommendations in two sections. The first set of recommendations is, is for institutions. Uh, I'm sure that many people who are here on the call today, they are in management, they are, they are part of some sort of institution. If they can take back any of these ideas to their institution, this would be really helpful. The first one is to collect data. Collect data in your organizations about parents and carers so that you know your workforce and then you can support them better. You can develop interventions for them. If you don't have data, where will you even begin? How will you even know that somebody in your organization needs that support? Secondly, educate your managers and your leadership on about how COVID, COVID has impacted different groups of staff. So maybe a staff member who has no children is affected differently as compared to a staff member who has children. Number three, encourage all staff to work flexibly wherever that is possible and give them guidance how to do that. Number four, have open dialogues, honest conversations with, with managers and leaders about what are the work expectations? What can be done electronically? If the pandemic has taught us one thing, it is that we can do a lot of stuff online without printing paper as well. Number five, be creative. Be creative about the opportunities that you can provide to your staff members for their growth. It doesn't always need to be a conference in a room in a five-star hotel. It can be an online conference like this. And number six, very important, look after and promote the well-being at your organizations. Normalize the parenting journey so that the staff members feel easy to come up to the leadership and speak about their, their issues. And then I also have some recommendations for individuals. These recommendations are what they can do at work. If you are an individual who is a working carer, a working father, a working mother, hai. So talk with your line manager about your circumstances. Have an honest conversation about your, for example, if you have to drop your children in the morning to school, be open and honest about it. There is no, there is no point in making excuses every day. Aaj meri gaadi kharaab ho gayi, aaj petrol khatam ho gaya, etc., etc. Be honest and fix that, or at least address that for once. Number two, seek support about your availability. Be honest about your capacity and talk to your to your team around you. 
And I will not pretend that it is always easy. Of course, there are going to be issues. This is never going to be a one size fits all approach, uh, but at least the beginning of a conversation is one way to go forward. Number three, take time to recognize and celebrate your successes. Even if these, these are small steps, make sure that the, the people who need to know, know about your successes, they know about the good stuff that you are doing. And number four, seek out and put time aside to engage with whatever support intervention your work is providing, whether that is a network, whether that is a developmental opportunity, whether that is free healthcare, whatever that is, if your organization is providing some sort of intervention to help you make use of that. And these are the recommendations for individuals, what you can do at home for all caregivers. Number one, talk with your partner, talk with your spouse about the division of household caring and, respond and child care responsibilities. Every family is different. I will not sit here and pretend that this is going to be an easy conversation, but at least if you have honest conversations about this, you can at least reach to a place which is a bit better than what it was like in the pandemic where we had more than 80% women reporting. They were spending all the time chasing their children around the house, trying to discipline them, trying to get them to study. Number two, take steps in the areas where you feel it would be most beneficial. And by this, I mean that know your trigger points, know what really, really makes you angry, know what really annoys you and try to address that before it annoys you. And I'll give you an example. For me personally, I get really annoyed if there are unwashed dishes in the sink. Agar sink mein bartan gande pade hu, that boils my blood. So I know that this is a trigger. I try to take steps to not to reach that point jahan mujhe hosana shuru jai. So if you know your trigger, try to avoid it. Number three, you know, take turns with your children and your other duties, uh, school pick up and drop. Uh, um, uh, again, this is very easy to say, very difficult to implement, but again, have a conversation about this. Or you can alternate mornings and afternoons, who is doing the cooking, who is getting the grocery, who is picking up children, etc., etc. Number four, every day, at least give yourself some time a quiet time, protected time with un uninterrupted time, the way you can sit and quietly focus on your work, even if it is for half an hour, 45 minutes, try to make that happen for you. And finally, prioritize your mental health and well-being and allow yourself to take care of yourself without feeling guilty about it. Give yourself the time and the value that you need. Remember, you cannot pour from an empty jug. Agar jug ke andar pani hoga, only then you can give water to others. Agar jug mein hi pani nahi hoga, aap dusro ko pani nahi de sakte. This brings me to one of my last slides. All the people who are on this call today, who are parents, who are carers, who are sisters, who are brothers, who are caring for others in any capacity, have you thought about your own health, your own well-being? What are you actively doing to protect your health and your well-being, particularly your mental health? Are you getting a break at any point in the day? Number two, do you have any support in your caring role? Do you get any break from your caring role? Do you get half an hour to yourself every day? And number three, have you ever thought about burnout? Burnout means when you keep doing stuff for so long that eventually you reach your limit and you explode like a rocket. And what happens after that? You just refuse to work anymore. Have you thought about that stage? What will happen when you reach that stage where you, you will cross your limit? So I'm inviting all of you, everyone on this call today to think about these three things very, very carefully. One of my final slides is support is critical no matter what shape or form it takes. I'll give you five seconds to look at this image. This is the Formula One racing car. It comes to have a role to play, only one role to play, but without that role, without that support, the car cannot perform. So support around you is critical doesn't matter what shape it comes in, what forms it comes in, whether it comes at home, whether it comes at work, support is critical. My name is Mediha, and this was my presentation about who cares for the carers. 
the impact of COVID-19 on caregivers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madeha. Uh, this was indeed uh, a very detailed and enlightening presentation. And I must, you know, thank COVID because in Pakistan, we have started talking about uh, the, uh, providing support to caregivers, providing support to parents, building their capacity. Otherwise, we never, you know, uh, we were not bothered whether parents have capacities or not, whether they are treating their children properly or not. We did not really uh, care about it. But this pandemic has taught us many lessons, and this is one of the you know key lessons. Personally, I feel we have learned. And thank you so much for the uh, you know very useful recommendations. I would say we will definitely take those. Um, document those um, in the conference proceedings and will share widely. Um, your, your recommendations are not only for institutions, but the recommendations for individual, you know, caregivers and parents, these are very, very uh, critical. We really need to educate uh, parents and caregivers that their health, not only physical health, but mental, mental health exactly. is important and it really, you know, it's not only important for themselves, but it affects their their children, their, you know, overall um, uh, dynamics at home and, of course, beyond home. So uh, this is an important area and this is really uh, an untapped area, which uh, we all, um, luckily, we have very important people sitting, listening to you. And uh, we will, uh, inshallah, try to join hands to support um, the parents in Pakistan, the caregivers in Pakistan uh, to build a healthy society. If we really, you know, take care of you, uh, take care of our children now, then we will be able to build a proper society. So thank you very much. I know you need to go, but uh, I think there is a question for you, Madiha, if you can just briefly uh, yes, so I just wanted then, to apologize yeah. to everyone that uh, I have, we are four hours behind you, so I still have to go to work. It's still eight, eight o'clock in the morning here. My apologies. The question is what sampling technique you used in your study, Medea? This was a survey. It was not, um, uh, not a qualitative study, as in like there were no, <clears throat> there was no specific group of people that we targeted. It was, an, it was a survey which was sent out to a large number of uh, different ethnographic uh, uh, populations. It was sent out through various channels, through various uh, networking streams we had, and the responses were collated. Jeeza Prasad, please. Uh, I think Dr. Naeem wants to say something. Uh, Dr. Sab, please go ahead. Dr. Sab, mute me. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, I wanted to thank uh, Madiha uh, uh, from the panel uh, and wanted to um, express my gratitude for the study that she has done and the recommendations that she has presented. I just wanted to uh, let her know that we have actually conducted a very similar study in Pakistan. Uh, this was done in the first and second wave of COVID. And this was also, the sample size was also around 1000. And we did that in uh, Peshawar, Karachi and Lahore. And you would be surprised that, that this almost similar uh, findings were Absolutely. obtained. Absolutely. So what we thought the major factors were that uh, the lower socioeconomic conditions were a very high uh, you know risk factor for the parental uh, stress and also they were very frustrated they did not know what to do they one of the parents said that i don't have any hope that our lives will ever become normal and i feel trapped in the current circumstances so the the poor mental health and unfortunately in pakistan we do not have so much of mental health uh, counseling and support. So that those were some of the areas that we were lacking. But this study actually in uh, also highlights that we need to develop these services in Pakistan as well. 
and we would love to uh, collaborate with your institution and with the uh, Pakistan Alliance for Early Childhood Development to develop these kind of counselings and we want to work so that uh, the uh, care of the caregiver, because uh, as you mentioned in that uh, very small clip that the uh, Formula One will not work without its proper maintenance. So without the maintenance of the parents and um, very uh, thankful for highlighting the role of fathers as well. Uh, we have been all interesting it on the parents, uh, on the mothers. In our study also, it was uh, more than 70% of the tasks were assigned to the mothers rather than the fathers. So I think um, uh, that is also a very important area. And um, thank you for pointing out the, uh, especially the trigger points and also the recommendations of uh, acting before it's too late. Exactly. So grateful. Exactly. Doctor, so just wanted to, I know that this is an order and I don't want to take up too much time. I just quickly wanted to say one thing before I go. Okay. Um, I am born and bred in Pakistan. I know Pakistan, like it's like the back of my hand. I'm in the UK only for last 15, 16 years. And one thing which I have seen is that when we Pakistan mein issues in Pakistan or when we talk about karte hain, gender inequality, ki, mothers are doing more work, fathers are doing less work, etc., etc. It is very much the same here in the UK as well. And I'm talking about white population. It is not, uh, not only in UK, across, across the world, pretty much globally, the, the um, imbalance or the disproportionate uh, gender roles, they remain. And also the one more thing to add is that mental health, it is still a very much a taboo topic here in the UK, which is apparently a first world country. So it is very, very hard to talk about these, these topics. I cannot even begin to imagine that Pakistan may as a support hassle can not get difficult to the hair. Hamari Pachon Kili, Hamari mothers Kili, Hamari fathers Kili, Hamari Hamari caregivers Kili. So I want to uh, finish on this, this, uh, this hopeful note to say that the, the hope is that we recognize that Hamari pass ye, ye, ye shortages hai. and then we, we, uh, you know, develop interventions to address these things to support our parents and carers better this is not only um, you know um, only strictly pakistan this is uk as well inside the thing so i will beg leave docs if i received your message i'll send you a separate chat message but thank you so much khadija thank you so thank much you. to patrick for you, having Malika. me here i wish you all have a lovely day and i will see you another time thank, thank you very you much so much Malika. and thank you for showing us the optimism that we are not doing very well so thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Uh, Nim Zafar. Uh, our next presenter is um, Dr. Nasima Zainal Abdeen. Uh, Dr. Nasima Zainal Abdeen has graduated. Um, um, she is a PhD uh, from the Khan University uh, Institute for Education Development, specializing in the area of gender equity and early childhood development. She has an extensive experience of working with young children, parents, teachers, and school leadership related to early childhood care and education across various regions of Pakistan. Currently, she is working as an assistant professor at IBS Sakhar University, teaching various courses at undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate programs of the university. And Dr. Nasima will be talking about uh, primary school teachers' perspectives about using play as a pedagogy during COVID-19 school closures in Chitral uh, Khyber Pakhtunka. So over to you, Dr. Nasima, and thank you for giving us time. Rahmani Rahim, uh, Assalamu alaikum, and good, evening, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you, uh, the organizers, organizers of this uh, important conference, uh, specifically the Federal College for Education and uh, our uh, organization, uh, Pakistan Alliance for Early Childhood Education. Uh, so it's a great honor to listen to the learned presenters, particularly uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Ms. Madiha and Ms. Anila. So it was a great privilege to listen to their uh, wonderful work they have done in the area of early childhood education uh, during and post COVID particularly. So uh, here I welcome you all to my presentation. Uh, my topic of my presentation is play and its implication for child development. 
caregiver's perspective from a village in Upper Chittar. So this is how I have organized uh, I have organized my presentation. So uh, going into the background of the study, uh, I have uh, used uh, sustainable development goals and a single national curriculum for early childhood uh, education as the framework for my this study. So uh, sustainable development goal uh, four basically talks about education as a whole. And then uh, goal two of sustainable development goals, uh, particularly deliberate on uh, that all girls and boys have access to high quality early childhood development, care, and pre-primary education so that they are ready for uh, primary education. So this is the exact wording. So uh, this uh, reiterates that in ensuring access to high quality equitable pre-primary education is a key strategy for improving learning education outcomes as well as the efficiency of education system so if we uh, can provide high quality early childhood education to our children it is likely that uh, our education system uh, will improve so uh, and uh, this is reiterated by the unicef uh, one of the study in, uh, done in 2018 which says that pre-primary education uh, is uh, one of the a significant uh, uh, tools for achieving all the other sustainable development goals. We have 17 sustainable development goals to be achieved by 2030. So early childhood education, if we could provide quality early childhood experiences to our uh, children, so we are likely uh, to achieve these uh, sustainable development goals. So, uh, and uh, particularly when I refer to a uh, single national curriculum for early childhood education. So it has specifically mentioned that, uh, uh, so it has defined the quality equitable early childhood education or pre-primary education. So what do we mean by that? So early childhood national curriculum uh, refer it to as a kind of learning environment, which is stimulating, joyful, secure, just free and inclusive of the needs of every individual child without any discrimination of race, gender, ethnicity, and socioeconomic background. And then later on, the curriculum defines it as the curriculum uh, should be based on play. And uh, later it says that which allows children's curiosity, creativity, individual learning styles to flourish. And then uh, for the parents and teachers, it says that they should act as facilitators and guides, guides who can provide scaffolding support in the learning, teaching and learning process. So uh, this is a national curriculum is expecting from us. And then specifically, it talks that all young children need periods of uninterrupted time in which they can engage in active learning to explore their environment make their own uh, discoveries and set their own challenges. They need opportunities to work with other children and they need adults who are able to understand and extend their natural interests. So above all, children need opportunities for learning through play. So uh, this extract from uh, the national single national curriculum is actually highlighting play as the main pedagogy in early childhood education. So when I uh, uh, looked at the, the literature there to understand what is play. So play is basically uh, uh, explained differently by different uh, people. So I have uh, selected the most uh, easy uh, understanding of the play. So a, a, a play is a free choose and joyful activity which engages a child and enhances his or her, or her physical, emotional, social, cognitive and uh, language development. So in a sense that play is an activity where a child is, uh, engages himself or herself, and then uh, as a result, he or she develops holistically. So all the domains of a child can be developed through uh, engaging a child in, in, in a play. And then uh, when we talk about uh, the play, play is when a child manipulates, what, when we uh, ask what is a play, so play is when a child manipulates any object, such, a, such as a, a young child 
plays with a rattle so it's a uh, uh, he or she is playing if if he or she is manipulating a car a, 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 a toy car a doll or a puzzle or a block so these are uh, these are the, uh, the 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 materials which helping this young child to manipulate and play and uh, another uh, uh, understanding is play is when a child pretends she is uh, pretend to be something for example a child pretends to be a butterfly so uh, this is called uh, imaginary play children uh, imagine in other in something others and then play is when a child initiate Im imitates a person or a character so they play role of another person or a character in a drama or in a uh, story they listen or they uh, read or any poem they read so they take that role they imitate that role so that is called dramatic play so they can play a house they can play a, mar a role of market they can play a, a role of a doctor in the hospital or a pilot so they are engaged in a play and then the action of a game children when they are a little older uh, in uh, physically they are in, uh, able to walk or run so they play sports they they go into swing hide and seek etc so they are engaged physically as well so according to a uh, high scope approach which uh, our national curriculum is also based on a high scope approach so uh, this approach takes play as when uh, we have or when children have materials to manipulate they have toys to play with so then along with toys they they have a choice to to make they are free to make their own decisions on what uh, play material they they will play with or, or who will they play with the playmates they they are able to uh, select or the space they are able to select their where the, they want to play so there should be a freedom of choice for children and then they, they, there should be language to enhance learning because when children play alone so they don't talk much they they talk to themselves or uh, they 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 have some conversation with their own selves but when they play with other children and with adults then they have a language to enhance their uh, learning so uh, this uh, this is very important to have a language and then support from adults to scaffolding the learning so because when when children are playing alone they yes they they also need an uninterrupted time to play, to play but but adult support is always important because uh, when adult is there so that adults ask questions uh, challenges the child's understanding the existing level and then they enhance that understanding so the adult support is highly encouraged and important in the uh, children's play so so this is uh, the understanding about play so now if we ask that why we should play or why we should engage uh, children in play so literature has a lot of explanation to it so i have uh, selected this extract again from national curriculum because i am using it as a framework national curriculum for early childhood says that play act acts as an integrating mechanism which enables children to draw on past experiences present them in different ways and make connections explore possibilities and create a sense of uh, integrated cognitive processes and skills which assist in learning some of these steps uh, develop spontaneously others have to be developed consciously in order to make learning more efficient so uh, this is very important message that we uh, need to understand that if we want our children uh, to be a more efficient learners if we want to, to to if we want our children to develop holistically if we want to develop our children in all the domains of uh, development so we need to engage them in meaningful play activities and then specifically what children learn through play so mari montessori says that play is children work so when children when parents say that children are not doing anything it does not mean they they are not doing anything if they are playing it means they are doing everything and because through play children learn about themselves and the world around them what they all hear see taste smell feel and do make impression on them hence their bodies and minds are ready to learn grow and develop 
so it means that when chil children play so they use their all their senses all their five senses that's why so when they use all their uh, senses so it helps uh, develop uh, help them develop to make connections in their brain and when these brain connections are made so their learning is permanent so and uh, play is foundation for all learning for young children and giving time and basic toy provides them with a variety of valuable experiences when children are playing it means that they are building their own foundation so what we need we need to give them uh, basic toys or materials to play with and then time uh, to to uh, to to help them develop those uh, important life skills and then children play unlock their uh, children's play unlock their creativity and imagination and develops thinking and problem solving skills so when children play they develop their own creativities because they uh, learn from each other as well as they they uh, it helps them to bring out their imagination their creativity and then they they learn critical thinking and problem uh, problem solving skills uh, as a result and then uh, very importantly particularly it 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 it's it has an implication for the covid period play helps children to release stress make them happy and enhances their resilience so when children are engaged in play so they forget about the uh, worldly stresses the 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 pressures they are having because of uh, you know daily life particularly when they are stressed with the covid situation so when they are engaged in the play so they uh, forget about it for some time at least and then they become happy when they are happy and then uh, when they have no stress so they are more resilient the resilience means they are able to cope with the challenging situation so this is very important that children are engaged in play so uh, synthesis of my this literature review is that play is a significant activity for holistic development of children and then play requires basic resources to manipulate they need time from the uh, adults uh for, from the caregivers freedom of choice is important so that they are happy and play and then support and encouragement from parents and teachers the the caregivers basic caregivers so these children cannot play on their own all the time so they need encouragement and support from their uh, adults from their caregivers so these two are the uh, the, the conclusion from my uh, literature review so there is a need to explore the views and perceptions about uh, our uh, primary or pre primary teachers and uh, parents of children about play how how much they understand about the play and its important and its implication for the uh, for the children's development and what are their uh, you know uh, views about it and then what are the challenges they are facing uh, to understand or to to integrate play in their daily activities so this uh, was the gap which i found uh, in the literature that in pakistan particularly in my context where uh, i come from uh, it was very rare uh, to uh, have such a, to find such a literature so based on this uh, literature gap i wanted to explore that what are the existing views of caregivers about play and its important uh, importance for young children's development the second questions was what type of play is suggested for girls and boys by the caregivers and then the third question what are the caregivers views uh, uh, about their ability or inability supporting young children's play in their care so this was uh, i conducted a qualitative uh, exploratory study and data collection strategies included uh, two focus group discussions and five in depth uh, interviews and data was analyzed through thematic analysis so the the, the research context is in upper chitral this, this is a village in upper chitral where there were three primary schools uh, one uh, uh, government primary school for boys another primary school for girls and there was a private school which catered the needs of both girls and boys in the uh, local community so uh, the participant who uh, took part in the study are eight ece teachers or 10 parents so uh, focus group discussion eight uh, teachers participated in the focus group discussion 
and 10 parents. There were two separate uh, focus group discussions, one for parents and one for uh, teachers. And then in depth, for in-depth in depth interview, two teachers, uh, both were female, uh, who participated in the in-depth interviews, and two mothers and one grandmother participated in the in-depth interview from the caregivers uh, side. So uh, the, these are the uh, major findings which emerged from my analysis. So the first uh, theme emerged was caregivers' notion of play, what they understood by the play. Then caregivers' views on importance of play in early years. Then caregivers' gender play preferences for children. And uh, caregivers' views on the available opportunities or challenges uh, to include play in their caregiving. So these were the uh, uh, four uh, themes which emerged from the study. So the first notion of a play, uh, what they understood by the play. So analysis of, of my data revealed that majority of the participants viewed play as a natural urge of a child. So this was very uh, uh, important as well as uh, it was uh, uh, an appreciative uh, uh, finding that at least they understood that children like playing naturally. So they, they took it as a natural urge of a child. So these are uh, the, the quotes from the, uh, from the data. The second uh, finding was that majority of the parents and, and, and teachers both were in consensus that <clears throat> play is a spontaneous activity of children. Hence, it does not need any preparation. So this was a little alarming because they believe that children uh, are able to play on their own. Even if they are very young, so if you give a rattle, so that is enough for a child to play with. Or if a child is four year old, he or she can uh, play alone or uh, with peers. So no need to uh, have uh, an eye from a parent or a support from parents. So this was a parent or a teacher, both they believe that teacher, children are uh, able to play alone. So this was a little uh, misunderstanding or uh, mis, uh, misunderstanding from both parents and teachers. Another finding was that uh, they, they believe that children play uh, in physical space. Hence, they, uh, they, they refer to uh, outdoor area as the natural environment for children. It's very important that uh, they understand uh, this. However, it, uh, it made, uh, you know, uh, it gave me an impression that they don't expect children play when they are inside the classroom or inside the uh, home. So they believe that uh, play should happen in outside the classroom or outside the uh, home. So uh, children should be sitting uh, quietly or sitting obediently inside when they are inside the room or inside the house. So this was a little uh, challenging and it was uh, to understand for me. And it was uh, a traditionally uh, quite a difficult uh, parenting style. As uh, when I was listening to uh, uh, Anila's presentation, uh, I, I was uh, making connections between uh, the, the finding from Ravel Pindi to the context of Chitral, because parents expect children uh, to behave like an adult and sit quietly and listen to them and uh, respond in a very uh, respectful manner and uh, obey them. So the, the same impression was coming from these parents that when children are inside or uh, in front of parents, they should not play, they should not make noise. So when they are out, they should do uh, whatever they want to do. So this was uh, one of the uh, findings from the uh, study. And uh, the, the, the second uh, theme which emerged was that he, uh, caregivers away uh, Uh, Dr. Nasima, you are on mute. Okay. Uh, yes, no, it, it happened from the host side, so I'm sorry for that. Okay. So the second theme was that uh, what they understood by the importance of play. So majority of the participants believe that play is important for children development. However, their understanding of development varies. For example, one of the teachers said play is, imp is important for physical as well as social development. She further explained that during games, children learn to follow rules. 
So this was quite uh, an, an, an elaborating understanding of the play she made. Despite uh, the fact that she was not uh, ready to allow children play inside the classroom, one of the fathers said that during play, children make friends and deal with uh, their uh, challenges or the conflict. Uh, sorry, Doctor Nasima, you have got two more minutes, please. Okay. So, okay. so this, this was the finding. Uh, the, the the major finding is that. Uh, parents understood the importance of play, however, uh, their understanding of development varied. And then uh, for the gender preferences, uh, I found that both the parents, uh, they, they believe that girls and boys uh, like uh, to play with different materials and different things. And then they said that this is natural. So this is again a misunderstanding about the uh, preferences of children, about uh, gender-based preferences. And then the very important uh, part of this uh, research was that their uh, understanding of their own roles in the children's play. So almost all of the parents and teachers believe that uh, they, they may not be able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to engage well uh, with the uh, children's play. They believe that they have uh, little time. Mother said that they are engaged uh, with home chores, so they have little time to play with children. And, and father said that they, are, they work outside the home, so they are unable to uh, spare time for, uh, to, to play with children. And in this way, uh, teachers also said that we have uh, less time and we have to complete the curriculum. And we cannot include play in our uh, teaching and learning processes. So in a way that they both were uh, taking hands, their hands uh, from the play and they were uh, saying that they, we will not be able to make uh, much contribution in children's play. And this was very unfortunate. And my uh, conclusions are that both the parents and uh, uh, caregivers, uh, teachers, both understood that uh, play is a natural ur urge of the children. And then both parents and teachers have limited understanding to play. Uh, and its implication for child development. This is alarming situation, so though they have very limited understanding and they undermine the role adults can play in uh, children's play. And then uh, they, uh, okay. And they, they, they are unable to see the significant implications play can have uh, for the overall development of children. And both the parents uh, have sexist ex expectations for children's play. So implication of this study is that if we, un, if we don't interrupt uh, in this situation, so both parents and teachers from this uh, small village in Upper Chitral may uh, give these children a very limited exp learning experiences during and post COVID uh, both. So they, these children may miss very important development opportunities. So that is one of the implication. Secondly, teachers with limited knowledge and skills of integrating play in their uh, daily teaching and learning processes may result in lack of active learning in their classrooms. And then with narrow and limited understanding of gender and development, both parents and ch children may perpetuate uh, the sexist gender roles uh, uh, to, to their children. So, uh, and uh, the national single national curriculum, which aims to develop both girls and boys uh, holistically may not be achieved in the given time. So this is uh, the implication uh, of this study. So these are the recommendations. Uh, you can uh, read them. So I will Thank you. Read them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nasima. And I'm sorry I had to stop you because we are running uh, short of time. Um, thank you very much for this very important um, study. Um, and since you are sitting in a very you know, strategic place, you can play an important role in giving the, even teachers do not really understand the importance of play in child development. Yes. Play has a direct connection with the cognitive development of children, as you know, yes. it helps them build connections and it helps them analyze and all that. So um, and we will inshallah take this forward and um, we will do whatever we can um, collaboration with your university and also of course uh, people like yourself can play an important role in training future 
ECD practitioners and ECD teachers. So thank you so much uh, for your time. Um, and without taking um, uh, much of uh, your time, I would say uh, thanks and then move to the next uh, uh, presenter. Uh, our next presenter is Ms. Hina Gulzar. I hope Ms. Hina is with us. Um, she is a researcher. She has done her uh, BS four years in education and currently she is studying, um, doing her MPhil from Jena University, Karachi. Uh, Ms. Hina Gulzar will talk about the uh, role of occupational therapy um, uh, as a strategic um, instrument in building, in fostering learning of children with um, uh, learning disabilities or with mental health problems. Um, she has conducted her research in Karachi and I would uh, uh, not take much of her time and will hand over the session to Hina Gulzar. Over to you, dear. Thank you. And you have got 15 minutes to do your presentation. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Wa alaikum salam. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Dr. Nasima, if you can stop sharing the screen so that Hina can, you know, share her screen. Okay, over to you, Hina. Okay, ma'am. Uh, my name is Hina Gulzar, and uh, recently I have done my BS uh, from Jinnah University uh, for women, and uh, now I am uh, enrolled uh, in MS, uh, MPhil in education uh, from the same university. And uh, my topic is uh, occupational therapy as a strategic use of uh, span for postural learning of children due to uh, mental health uh, problem in early years at Karaj Pakistan. Uh, we have three researchers are here uh, uh, in this uh, research. Dr. Abdul, uh, Dr. Abhi Abdul Karim, uh, Associate Professor, Department of Education, Jinnah mm -hmm. University for Women. Uh, Dr. Anila Fatma Shakil, Associate Professor, Department of Education, Jinnah University for Women. Hello? Yes, Hina, just continue. We can hear you. Okay. And myself is uh, as a researcher, Department of Education, Jinnah University for Women. Uh, yeah, I will uh, start with the introduction uh, uh, that uh, therapy, uh, why it is necessary. Uh, 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 you uh, need to share the screen. Sorry, please share your screen. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in as we know, education is a um, uh, plays vital role in uh, every aspect of life. Uh, education is not preparation for life, education is life itself. Uh, education uh, has been uh, declared as a compulsory unit uh, to get education for all people, including normal as well as disabled children, so uh, they can able to get uh, a suitable oh, social... Hello? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. By the passage of time, uh, people get awareness uh, to the fact that Disabled uh, children have same rights and play in the society. Disability has been uh, defined as a standard uh, impairment of uh, some organ or brain, uh, which results in uh, impairments of uh, certain uh, functions. Occupational therapy is also providing required uh, results regarding disabled and occupational therapy designed to improve positive changes in our child's reality, behavior, or adjustment. Uh, it focused uh, on the primary level of disabled education and provides a measure for uh, foster learning of mentally uh, retarded uh, children through occupational therapy. The core of occupational therapy is uh, to enable an individual to interact, uh, satisfying a range, range of occupation that uh, will support his or her daily life activities and uh, achievement uh, within our society. Next, review of related literature. In every domain of life, uh, the mental health plays a vital role to make life good 
and uh, healthy. It's helped to develop a good citizen, active member of the society, family institution, organizations, country. Uh, it contributes to choose the, a better life and help to uh, take a good decision in the life of individual, on self and for the others. Over 50 uh, million people uh, experience mental health or uh, neurobiological disorder around the world. These disorders uh, constitute uh, five, ten leading causes of disability around the world. The occupation and the activity which they are uh, enacted uh, can serve various functions in daily life. Occupations provide for the essential needs of the organism. Uh, the health and well-being of an individual uh, is influenced by their uh, what he does. Uh, occupation from uh, form uh, an important part of each person's uh, social identity and social status. Occupational therapist claims there is a link between occupation and health. Uh, at the uh, beginning of 20th century, uh, almost uh, all psychologists and uh, the uh, uh, therapists uh, considered these uh, things uh, that mental uh, health is uh, related to the occupation. Next, objective of the, of the study is uh, to investigate, uh, number one is uh, to investigate the participate uh, uh, of an occupational therapy with uh, profound mental disability to engage in their occupation. Now, next is uh, to identify the signs and symptoms which indicates the needs of occupational therapy for a child. Uh, number third is to examine the instructional uh, use by therapies for betterment uh, and, and uh, adjustment of disabled child. Research methodologies are uh, research used uh, both uh, types, uh, qualitative and quantitative population was a Karachi, Size two schools data collection uh, collected from uh, 170 trainers and uh, 15 parents. Data evaluation uh, from uh, statistically uh, evaluate, evaluation and the research tool used uh, by researchers, uh, questionnaire and interview. Uh, conclusion is that uh, occupational therapy enables an individual to engage in. Um, effective activities in the daily life. This therapy helps to improve the daily life and develop the child's uh, social and interpersonal skills and enable them to become an effective member of the society. Uh, this supports and uh, promotes learning and gives children an understanding of appropriate behavior. Hence, the occupational therapist is uh, concerned with the clear picture of child's development and strives to ensure that all aspects are being addressed uh, so you uh, a child can achieve his or her uh, maximum potential. Occupational therapy provides families uh, to identify and support their child's uh, holistic development through using a child's in, uh, interest. Hence, uh, occupational therapy understands the impact of the environment on child and uh, can help parents and teachers to develop strategies that can help a child to perform better in the environment that they find challenging. Uh, thus, occupational therapy plays a unique role in uh, modifying the environment in order to uh, facilitate productive and meaningful use of uh, physical and intellectual uh, capability, cap uh, capacities of uh, concerned children and enable them to uh, contribute their role in the society. Now there are uh, uh, 20 results. Uh, I think I have, uh, I don't have this uh, uh, slide right now, but uh, the parents results and the 20 results are uh, uh, something uh, the same uh, results because uh, every parents uh, nowadays uh, in uh, current era, we know that every parents are aware of, about uh, their children, uh, mental health and physical health, and they're concerned about the cure of the mental disabilities and they uh, go, uh, through a uh, dispute and uh, find uh, some uh, some uh, uh, just like that uh, they uh, want to uh, know their child mentally uh, ha mentally helpful and uh, they want their their child also uh, the their occupational skills uh, if we have if uh, the if uh, they can uh, adopt the occupational 
uh, skills uh, they can uh, uh, able to uh, they can able to active member of the society and they can uh, take their part in the country uh, as well now the recommendations are here occupational therapy uh, their practice and activities in general school as well conclusion i have done uh, ma'am uh, i'm on recommendations please uh, occupational therapy should be made affordable uh, for children and families to access its uh, services without any hurdles uh, uh, therapists must ensure uh, on equal access and participation in education of all child therapists uh, should aware parents about the scope and functions of occupational therapists and its implementation in their region uh, there must be at least one occupational therapist in every school uh, for helping children with learning difficulties i think uh, this uh, uh, recommendation jo, uh, is uh, very important in every school not in uh, only in a uh, specialist uh, children school but uh, as well as the normal school occupational therapy sessions must be conducted for parents and teachers to make them aware of uh, useful strategies university should, uh, should introduce occupational therapy uh, programs and courses for students with an affordable uh, more specialized equipment is uh, needed to be used in school under the guidance of occupational therapist parents should also cooperate with occupational therapist and do their best for the well being of their child uh, state to uh, thank you uh, in the end the uh, references and thank you so much um thank you very much uh, hena um i hope you will stay with us if there are any question then you will be able to uh, respond to those question later on um uh, without wasting time because we don't have time i am moving to the next uh, the final speaker uh, unfortunately she is not with us our uh, final speaker is miss uh, negat basit um due to internet uh, problem she was not able to i think uh, make the presentation but i hope she is attending the uh, conference i don't know uh, anyway we are going to um, play the recording her recording um, uh, let me briefly introduce her ms sanigat basid has been working as a teacher educator for english since 2007 and as a teacher educator for early childhood care and education with guide punjab since 2013 presently she is training teachers on the single national curriculum for early childhood care and education and so far she has trained a number of teachers and today she was uh, she is going to talk about the uh, she will share her study in which she has uh, um studied that what kind of problems the educational managers and teachers uh are facing in punjab to implement the single national curriculum for a child care and education so i wish i would request you to play her recording thank you miss nigat are you with us or not of learning the early years are very important for acquiring ideas skills attitudes linguistic skills fine motor skills basic mathematical concepts the maturity with environment and scientific skill which are the basis of our learning process during this period of early childhood learning the environment around the child plays a key role history of early childhood education in the first education conference held in november 1947 uh, and there is included early childhood education ec was given proper importance by the policy makers in the developing countries as early childhood care and other activities related to ec as one of the six goals of efa at the world education conference 1990 curriculum implementation the term curriculum is a comprehensive area it covers various aspects concepts and activities that student learn in the development of the curriculum and assessment procedures there are various aspects that need to be taken into consideration the teachers should possess complete knowledge regarding the needs and requirements of the students 
of the students. They should share ideas and suggestions with each other. Possess adequate knowledge and information of the academic concepts and approaches and possess the traits of intelligence, resourcefulness, and consciousness. Because in this uh, introduction, there is a physical development, social and ethical development, emotional development, language development, mental development included. So uh, the worth of the study is to examine the problems which are being faced by educational managers and teachers during execution of EC curriculum. First of all, the study will provide guidance and solution to all teachers who are teaching primary children, especially EC class. The study will also uh, provide assistance to officers who mentor ECs. It will also guide the specialists of education so they can better plan for basic education. The objective of an examination proposition is to introduce and legitimize the need to consider and exploration issues and to introduce the down-to-earth manners by which this examination ought to be held. The plan components and methodology for directing the examination are represented by principles inside the overall control in which the issue dwells. So rules for research propositions are more demanding and less formal than an overall task proposition. Objective of the study, identify the problems being faced by teachers in implementing EC curriculum to compile suggestions and recommendations for minimizing problems during implementation of curriculum in early childhood education. Limitation of the study, only public schools were under the present study and private schools were not included in the study. The present study only focused on those problems which were making it difficult to implement EC curriculum. Research design. The study was descriptive survey and the study was quantitative in nature. Descriptive survey design was used to collect data and describe in a systematic way. The aim of this study was to find out the problem faced by educational managers and teachers during implementation ECE curriculum through asking questions to the carefully selected sample. Study area. Faisalabad is the biggest city of the Punjab province. Faisalabad has huge couples. Uh, city of Pakistan. District Faisalabad has six, three, uh, six uh, tehsils. This study was conducted in all tehsils of District Faisalabad. The primary name of Faisalabad region was Lailpur, started in uh, 1904. Faisalabad is the third most crowded city in Pakistan. Faisalabad is second, the biggest in the eastern area of Punjab. Faisalabad is a significant modern city of area Punjab. It has been loaded as to be Manchester of Pakistan. We can't hear maybe. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. May Bahans Agi Kare Jahanta Kuponchi. Topic of today's article is a study of problem being placed by education and teachers in implementation of EC curriculum. Introduction of this topic is that. And concepts and approaches. The level was is 4.00.98, weighted score 717, and 4.00, weighted score 79. Tools for pre Faisalabad, multi skills of descriptively selected samples. Feature descriptive in the study. The present study only focused on those problems. Only public schools were under the present study, and private schools were not included in the study. The present study only focused on those problems which were making it difficult to implement EC curriculum. Research design. The study was descriptive survey and the study was quantitative in nature. Descriptive survey design was used to collect data and describe in a systematic way. The aim of the study was to find out the problem faced by educational managers and teachers during implementation EC curriculum through asking questions to the carefully selected sample. Study area. Faisalabad is the biggest city of the Punjab province. Faisalabad has huge couples, uh, city of Pakistan. 
district faisalabad has 636 tehsils uh, this study was conducted in all tehsils of district faisalabad the primary name of faisalabad region was lalpur started in uh, 1904 faisalabad is the third most crowded city in pakistan faisalabad is second the biggest in the eastern area of punjab faisalabad is a significant modern city of area punjab it has been alluded as to be manchester of pakistan sample sample is a small group element drawn from population sample is true representative of population list of total ec schools were collected from qaid e azam academy for education development qaid uh, former director of the uh, former director of his um, of staff development dsd faisalabad multi state sampling technique was used for taking sample the district faisalabad was divided into six tehsils sample size was 239 by using survey uh, system confidence level was 95% and confidence interval was 5% only due to closure of schools for pre question year myers to covid 19 it was unable to collect data from all sample size so sample size was reduced from 239 to 200 research instrument for the data collection a well structured closed ended question comprising 60 statements was built uh question has different statements for both teachers and educational manager likert scale was used to give opinions due to covid 19 schools were closed so data was collected through online data collection the first component of data collection is that uh, it is the task uh, difficult task to collect data uh, during covid 19 so researcher got to contact numbers of respondent from school education websites and called personally and also sent questionnaire link through whatsapp and mail uh, some respondent did not answer the question few respondent was visited personally google forms were used for this purpose data analysis the collected data were entered to spss in order to develop spread sheet computer software statistical package was social science spss were in 26 was used to reach the conclusion frequencies percentage mean weighted score and standard deviation was used. calculated from spss and used to interpret and discussion of the result main findings main findings regarding uh, factors affecting uh, curriculum implementation majority of the respondents said that regularity of students positively mean 4.00 weighted score 799 curriculum implementation rank ranked as first according to respondent majority of the students uh, think that extra majority of the respondents think that extra duties on teachers affect negatively uh, then the mean score is 4.00 which is score 799 on curriculum implementation and facilities in school affect positively mean 4.00 which is score 799 ranked as second and third accordingly according to respondents motivation and dedication of teacher mean 3.97 which is score 794 and the work environment of class mean 3.97 Weighted score seven nine four affects positively on curriculum implementation ranked as four point fifty four three nine. Majority of respondents pointed out that untrained PC caregivers uh, mean four point zero two weighted score seven two three creates problems in curriculum implementation ranked as first accordingly. According to respondents, unavailability of PC caregivers mean three point nine eight weighted score seven one seven. And overcrowded classes mean three nine eight weighted score seven one six make problems during curriculum implementation and ranked as second and third respectively. Majority of the respondents think that less use of helping material mean three point nine eight score seven one six and irregularity of students mean three nine seven score seven one five three. um uh, now it's the time for questions um dr nasima if you are there uh, irshad has posted a question here he says um during pandemic children couldn't go uh, to uh, go out to play in the park so they become addicted of the electronic gadgets um what is your suggestion maybe he is uh, he is asking you to you know uh, tell him any alternatives to these electronic gadgets or keeping children away from the electronic gadgets dr nasima 
thank you, uh, ma'am, and thank you, uh, Irshad, for asking this important question. This is uh, the major challenge we all parents are uh, uh, going through this uh, pan during this pandemic and after it. Even now, uh, it's a little. Uh, uh, the, the life is a little relaxed, but uh, children have been addicted to uh, the, the, the digital gadgets. I agree with you. So for that, when uh, we uh, read the literature as well as when we uh, talk to the experts and in our own experiences, the best suggestion is we need to time uh, for the gadgets. We need to have screen uh, time. So uh, first we need to sit with the children and make a plan that how much screen they are allowed to watch in a day. So that is one of the strategy we need to do for the uh, in the beginning. And then for the rest of the time, what should we do? My presentation focused on the play and its importance uh, and its implication for the child development. So I will relate it, uh, your question with the same. So play is the best uh, activity we can have at home when children are free. So uh, we should be engaged with uh, children uh, in their play. We should arrange play dates uh, with them. We should plan that what uh, activities we will be doing today. One of the parents or any caregivers, if parents are busy, then at least uh, siblings or grandparents or any other family member who is uh, uh, who okay. have some time so they can sit with the children and plan and then execute the free time accordingly. So play is the best activity during the uh, pandemic or uh, non-pandemic. So we need to normalize that parents or adults can also uh, be, uh, can, can play. This is one of the traditional mindset that uh, play is children's work. P parents uh, will not be able to play. So we need to uh, remove this misconception. We need to normalize that uh, play is important uh, for children. So for their development, we also need to be engaged in the play. Without parents or without caregiver support, children uh, children's play is incomplete. So when we ask them to play, so they may not play on their own. So uh, uh, it's better to be engaged with them. This, this is my own personal experience that when I asked them to go and play, so they ended up going back to the TV or uh, any gadget, they pick uh, it again. So uh, what I do, I engage with them. When I am free, I engage with them. When their father is free, so he engages with them. Or any adult from the uh, household, we take them out when they are out. So we go with them in the garden and then play accordingly. So play is the best alternative uh, for the screen uh, thing. Reading books, uh, uh, identifying children's interests. So bringing uh, home uh, books which interest uh, your children is another uh, alternative. So reading is very important. Uh, reading uh, uh, fictional uh, things or non-fictional stories so uh, reading uh, is important so engage them in reading writing is important so uh, engage children uh, so you we as parents if we will be engaged with them that is the best uh, alternative to the media or screen um, thank you so much dr nasima um, any more questions participants if you want to ask any questions please let me know raise your hand or write your question here please Thank you so much, uh, all the presenters and all the participants um, for, you know, um, listening to these presentations very attentively. And now uh, it's the time to listen to our worthy chair of the session, Dr. Neem Zafar. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Saab. I request you to conclude the session for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you give me the host rights as well? I just need to see, show a couple of slides. Okay, um, okay. First of all, it is my proud privilege to be here amongst the August audience. And I thank the organizers and Pakistan Alliance for Early Childhood Development, especially Fatija, uh, for inviting me here and um, asking me to uh, give up the concluding remarks. Uh, I'm also very grateful to all the five speakers um, 
who have contributed and who have uh, uh, actually laid down the most important part of this session. And also to more than 50 participants who listened to the <clears throat> uh, activities uh, intently online and also in the conference room. Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, challenges when we are working online. <clears throat> And um, we have faced a couple of these. Uh, one of the speakers could not come and uh, talk and her uh, recording also uh, got disturbed. And also we, but on the other hand, uh, it also gives us opportunities because we were able to listen to Madiha from the UK, which otherwise we might not have been able to do so. So there are pros and cons of technology and we must uh, rather get used to it now. Uh, and coming to the specific papers, I think uh, I will start with the, the first uh, paper uh, that is uh, from uh, Anila Mukhi, an excellent uh, intervention on the parenting, the principal models and uh, the work that she did in her study. Uh, I think uh, the important areas are that we should know what we're talking about. And once we are talking about parenting, I think the the most important thing is um, just let me share the screen, please. Mm, there I am. So, I'll, I'll just briefly talk a few words about parenting. And I would like to inform you what parenting is actually. Can you see the slide, please? Okay, uh, it, while talking about positive parenting, we must know that the most important thing, and I'm going, not going to take a lot of time, but the most important thing while we're talking about positive parenting is the best interest of the child. So that has to be taken into consideration. And the best interest of the child in order to enable the child the full development and it has to be non-violent, empowering, nurturing. So all these components have to be incorporated in that model. So um, yeah. and then about the goals of parenting. A few words about this particular slide that I like the most because it gives us a holistic um, picture of what we really want from our child. We want our children to be intelligent. We want them to have stable emotions. We want them to be morally sound. We want them to be, you know, socially adaptable and socially acceptable. And we also want them that if there is any adversity, they can handle it well. And in our uh, religious context, we want them to be at least, if not more religious than our own families. So these are some of the goals that we have to do. And these things are important. And when she was talking about the, the difficult areas and especially the most, um, you know, violent forms of punishment of the families, I think these things are important. And when we are talking about the parenting styles, she discussed the authoritarian style where there was a lot of punishment to the child. And she thought, talked about the authoritative style where we need to work with the child, uh, give them uh, a lot of uh, information, support them. And that actually is the better one. But we must not forget the last part, which is the permissive style where the child becomes the parent or the child becomes the boss and the parents actually uh, allow them to do whatever they, uh, he or she wants. And that actually leads to more violence. And you have seen in the uh, Islamabad case of Noor Mukaddam uh, that the parents have till the end, they have tried to support their child uh, and probably they were as responsible for the crime as the child uh, oh, well, now he's an adult, but uh, as their child is. So I think these are some of the things. And uh, this is one that I wanted to highlight. These are the 
principles that you would like to talk about sharing the tip sheets in the COVID times. We have, if somebody can write down these uh, COVID19parenting.com. We have this, uh, these uh, tip sheets translated in Urdu as well. These have reached about nine, uh, 195 million people around the world in 90 different languages. And they tell us a lot about uh, what we really, uh, you know, uh, how we should be caring uh, for, the, for the children. And let me, if I can, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, so one of these here is um, uh, on, the, uh, on the screen time as well. And when talk, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. So that was about the, uh, the paper of uh, Ms. An uh, Anila. And I think it was an excellent study, but we also need to talk about some aspects where we are dealing with children in good families. She has concentrated on the difficult families and which are obviously, which need a lot of attention, but children need attention in all families. And, and uh, some form of violence is occurring in almost all families, uh, not to the gravest extent, but we need to concentrate and her um, model, the SDIR model, I think, which is an excellent model. The first part um, should, sensitization should be for almost all the families. The second paper was uh, from Madhya Sajid talking about caring of the caregivers. And as I mentioned, I don't need to go into the details, but I mentioned that we conducted a similar study and we found almost the similar results, especially for the carers and also for the children. Um, and uh, the um, most uh, talking about mostly about the the women working, and we obviously um, in that study, uh, as she has also mentioned, that these things are almost uh, similar. I have I'm a part of International Society for Social and Preventive Pediatrics Working Group on COVID, and we have found that the, the there are differences in the upper middle income group countries and in the low middle income group countries. Here, I think financial problems have taken the precedence. Over there, lockdown and psychological issues have taken the precedence, but here earning and then uh, violence because of that have um, you know, taken the center stage. Uh, talking about third paper from Naseema Zainul Abedin, um, while she's talking of play, Another very, very important study, and I am uh, actually, I learned about the different types of play that she mentioned in her introduction. And yes, it is extremely important. Let me tell you, we, uh, with uh, British Council, Pehchan did an intervention about a few years ago in schools of Punjab. And what we found was astonishing. There were no activities for the children in the school. They were not even given color pencils. They did not have any play uh, football or, a, or any kind of a ball. And all they were allowed was that during the recess, they were allowed to just run around in, in the, in the uh, grounds. So we started, developed a, a dosti package where we provided them with uh, things to play. And through that intervention, the playing, um, you know, small group play and small um, play on their own, the overall environment of the school improved. The children were now more interested in studies. There were less um, dropouts and they were more interested in coming to the school in the morning. And also regarding the question on the screen time, let me tell you, uh, 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 you have pointed out very well that we need to replace this. Unfortunately, in our study, even pre-COVID, the time that children were using on the screen in our study, that was uh, more than 50% of the children were spending more than two hours uh, of screen time. And in about 21, 22%, they were spending more than four hours. And this more than doubled. So uh, the screen time for about 80% uh, children in their families was more than four hours now. 
and for more than uh, six hours it went for something around um, you know 20 to 30 percent we were even spending more than six hours so this becomes an extremely um, uh, you know um, disturbing fact because through online then there are a lot of predators and there is a, a problem of child protection as well so we should be caring for that uh, we uh, I should take just a couple, a couple of minutes about the principles of uh, screen time. There should be no screen time under two years of age. There should be minimum screen time afterwards. There should be no alone time. The screen time has to be mixed with family interaction time and with physical activity time. During the COVID, children were not allowed in the parks. They were not allowed uh, in, in, the, uh, in the activities. But now things have opened up they can at least run around in the small grounds adjacent to their houses. They should be allowed to move out of the houses, obviously under supervision, but they, in Pakistan, children play a lot on the streets. So they should be allowed to play on the streets under supervision. So we should not keep them in the homes. So that is, I think, a, a key message for screen time and for play in the in the children and schools obviously in the once we are talking about the uh, single national curriculum this uh, play activity should be a part of each of these school activities uh, the fourth paper on of hina gulzar on occupational therapy and it's um, you know uh, it's it's a very difficult area working with children with uh, special needs uh, especially children with difficult circumstances we know that they are abused a lot they are neglected a lot and uh, we need to work for them. Unfortunately, uh, some of the slides were very heavy and she was reading through the slides. So things were, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, an advice to uh, the last two speakers because they were probably reading through the slides uh, at times. And it is better that we uh, learn a bit about the how to present as well in, in, in the in, in these uh, conferences. So, uh, but occupational therapy and different therapies, uh, we, the most important thing I think there is that we should have um, an individual uh, planning and individual goals. Uh, small achievements are, uh, are extremely good. The children and the parents should uh, celebrate the small achievement, especially if the child is able now to hold, um, hold things in his hand, his or her hands, start eating, start uh, interacting, start moving around independently. So these are all things with, which they should celebrate. And the last paper uh, which uh, we received, the, uh, the problems faced by educational teachers, again, um, it is a Punjab initiative and we couldn't hear uh, the end of it. But yes, this is time that we should all sit together and take early childhood development as a very, very important area. And remember, let me tell you, repeat, that early childhood development is not birth to eight. It is minus nine months and even earlier. Adolescent girls, should we should start concentrating on the adolescent girls, then uh, premarital and after marriage, immediately after that, uh, from conception to the first two years, the, th the first 1,000 days are essential. And we should be looking at the health aspects. We should be looking at the protection aspects. We should be looking at the, um, the uh, terbiyat aspect, as we call nurturing. And these are all essential in, in our work. And I, I, I'll just stop here and uh, thank you very much. I think we have done a wonderful um, uh, session and I congratulate all of you. So grateful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sir. Thank you for so you know beautifully concluding the session and thank you for preparing those very useful slides. Um, over to you, Uruj. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. At the end of the session, I feel deep deeply gratified that this global gathering has highlighted the significance, challenges, and current practices related to parenting and teaching styles for early childhood care and education before, after COVID-19 pandemic. The session was consisted of two speakers, three papers presenters, and a session chair. Session chair, Dr. Naim Zahar, sir, please accept our heartless gratitude for your precious time and sharing your experiences with the people around the globe. 
a special thanks to our speakers, to Ms. Alina Mukhi and Nadiha Sajid for sharing such informative and thought-provoking content. I am thankful to uh, thankful of Ms. Nikhat Basit, Ms. Hina Gulzar, Dr. Nasima Zainalabadi for presenting your research papers in the session. Lastly, many thanks to Madam Khatija Khan, CEO of FA and a moderator of the session. Madam, your active and dynamic participation has made this conference a successful event. With Thank this, you. our session has come to an end. Stay happy, stay safe, and stay tuned with us for the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am Tahir Mahmood, Assistant Professor in Federal College of Education as moderator of the session. And along with me uh, is Ms. Ba Muzaffar. Uh, Assalamu alaikum uh, and a very um, a good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Ms. Ba Muzaffar and I'm also, along with Sir Tahir, uh, Mr. Tahir, I'm also the moderator of this session, uh, which is titled Teacher Education Session. And uh, I'm working in Federal College of Education as a lecturer in education. Now, uh, over to uh, Mr. Tahir. Now, how uh, he will tell you about the sequence of this uh, whole session. Thanks, ma'am. I will request Professor Dr. Nabi Bakhsh Jumani Saab to chair the session. Dr. Nabi Bakhsh Jumani Saab. Sir, you are requested to chair the session. To chair this session, we are in the third session of the second day, and our theme is teacher education. Uh, along with Dr. Jumani Saab, we have Dr. Maureen Manning from USA, Dr. Zarina Akhtar from International Islamic University, Islamabad, uh, Professor Dr. Ramatullah Bhatti, Assistant Professor Alama Iqbal, Open University, Islamabad, and Dr. Fauzia Ajmal from International Islamic University, Islamabad. It gives me immense pleasure to see all the featured panelists in this conference. Thanks to all the distinguished intellectuals for sparing your precious time for this conference. Let me share with you the flow of the session. Due to time limitation, I am sorry that we have just 10 to 12 minutes for each worthy speaker and panelist to share their views and valuable thoughts. Session will start with the keynote address by Professor Dr. Navi Bakh Jamani Saab. After that, worthy panelists will share their views on different topics. Following the discussion by the panelists, there will be the research presentations by the three presenters, and then we will move towards the answer question session. Then the session chair will express his views about the session, and finally, the session will be summarized by the moderator. COVID-19 has affected all walks of life, and similar is the case with the education. Educational institutions integrating and strengthening all other social institutions were badly affected by this situation. In this situation, every country has tried its best to continue and restore the educational activities at every cost. In this scenario, role of educational leader is very important as they have an important task for continuation and restoration of the educational activities. This session is an effort in the same direction. We hope that end of the session, we will be able to suggest mayor to overcome the challenges faced by the educators by this pandemic. First of all, I would like to request Professor Dr. Navi Bakhsh Jomani to properly open the discussion. Yes, please, now session is open. Dr. Nabi Bakshumani is working as Vice President at International University Islamabad. He is among the very few who have experienced or successfully launching online and distance. Yes, sir, you yes. can start. Thank you very much. I, first of all, I uh, say thanks uh, to the management of uh, the conference and the management of the Federal College of Education for uh, uh, inviting me in such a, a wonderful uh, uh, event of the knowledge sharing uh, by the uh, researchers and the teacher, teacher educators across the globe and particularly in the Pakistani context. And I uh, then congratulate to the uh, organizing team for um, arranging this type of the event that is really timely needed in Pakistan. And uh, now it is because of the COVID and the start of the new fall semester and everywhere, 
and everyone is busy and they're creating such opportunity for the researchers and the practitioners is really appreciable. Uh, I was asked to talk about the accreditation and the licensing. Uh, I, as a teacher educator and a researcher and the administrator and the having the opportunity of uh, uh, working as an administrator, chairman of the department and the dean and etc. I, uh, particularly as a practitioner teacher, teacher educator, I realized that uh, the, the sense of the concept of the teacher professionalism is uh, really missing in terms of our work environment, in terms of uh, our curriculum, in terms of the environment of the you know, training of the future teachers, either it is the teacher of the school or the teacher of the college or the university or the teacher educator. This sense or this type of the uh, personality that we need a professional teacher, this is missing. Uh, if, if uh, be, I have also experience of working as the member of the National uh, Curriculum Review Committee, as well as the member of the Accreditation Council in Pakistan, I realized that uh, our focus is, uh, though our focus is on the pedagogical and the professional courses, but the inculcation of the professionalism and the future teachers or the teacher educator is missing. Because the teachers, uh, in Pakistan are throughout the world, except the most advanced countries like Australia and America and the UK, et cetera. The teachers are controlled through the professional bodies and the accrediting bodies and the, um, through the licensing and the accreditations. That is not really in practice uh, as far as the licensing is concerned. As far as the uh, accreditation is concerned, that is not a new Oh, that's not an old one, but it's a new concept in Pakistan. It is started in the first decade, it's another second decade of the 21st century. Therefore, we as a teacher, as a professional teachers, we take it as that um, teacher educators, we, I feel, and I want to share my sentiments and the experience in my keynote speech that we failed to inculcate the concept or the inculcate the, the really the um, aspect of the performance and the dispositions in the future teachers, uh, uh, the concept of the professionalism. And as I highlighted earlier, that this is because of the um, lack of the accreditation councils and the lack of the licensing concept in Pakistan. As I will again reiterate that the Pakistan the concept of the accreditation came into being in the 10, 20, and, uh, and that second decade of uh, the 21st century. And the National Accreditation Council of the Teacher Education Pakistan started uh, working. But as far as the curriculum is concerned, that is the domain of the National Curriculum Review Committee under the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan that focus is usually on the, on the, more on the content. Content, I do not mean here the content courses. I mean here the content either of the pedagogical courses, either of the content courses. So we focused more on the content and the topics and the chapters or the units instead of uh, the meeting that are, are addressing the true spirit of the professionalism. Professionalism is to be inculcated. Professionalism is the, is the composite of the theory and the practice. And that we have always, as a researcher, we always say that there is a gap in the theory and the practice in the, in the, in the, in the in, in, in teacher education or in the teaching professions or in, in most of the professionals. That's why there is the internship and there's in the medical profession, once the theory concept is, theories courses are completed, then one has to go for the practical courses that is missing in Pakistan. They, the sets and the values and the strategies of that is need to, that, uh, that are needed for an occupation that is the future profession that are not uh, really practiced, not uh, taken care in Pakistan. Uh, 
the, uh, when we talk about the uh, professionalism and teaching, we talk about the like, theory and the practice and the ethical roles and the issues and the challenges in the teaching. What are the issues and challenges in Pakistan? The issues and the challenges are that the teacher really? educators, uh, what they in the, what they teach, uh, the, the future teachers of the schools, that uh, is not really commensurating or not matching in the true spirit what he or she has to practice tomorrow in the schools. Um, only two subjects are. Uh, uh, of, of the school subjects are taught during the four years of the school education. And uh, if we talk about the um, advanced countries, rather, uh, if let me give the example of the Turkey, that, that the teachers have a specialization in the subjects, the teacher of mathematics, teacher of English, that we don't have in Pakistan. So that the basic issue is, we create the teacher, we prepare the teachers to teach in the schools, but we compromise on the school-based subject and what professional traits are the attributes one is supposed to carry with him or her to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the uh, workplace at the school or the college, etc. And but, um, that, that there is a critical issue or the challenge in Pakistan has been challenged in Pakistan about the professional qualification of the teachers. Uh, if we have a look at the um, education, national education policy of 1992, that is uh, promised in this policy that the teacher, the duration of the teacher qualification of the Pakistan um, in, in uh, teachers in Pakistan would be extended. But then we see at the policy of 1998, then uh, 2006 and uh, nine and 17, we, we applied, we changed the teacher education qualification very late. Uh, though there were the promises in most of the education policies right from 1974 and onward, but we could not it. And there were very, serious efforts at the part of the government, like in 1992, a very huge projects of teacher training, uh, teacher training uh, project in Pakistan, uh, assisted by Asian Development Bank was uh, launched. That was from the reforming the teachers, the professional continuous development of the teachers and the entry qualification, the revising the curriculum. But as far as the professionalism was concerned and the teachers accreditation issues and the licensing issues could not be addressed, unfortunately. When we talk about the licensing, uh, this concept is, uh, is still new in Pakistan. Though there, then the um, education policy, the previous education policy during the days of uh, uh, that was worked when during the days of General Musharraf, it was uh, decided that uh, the accreditation and the licensing would be introduced in Pakistan, and then the project uh, funded by USAID on the teacher education. Uh, was introduced and uh, through this project, the accreditation council in Pakistan was established and the task of the licensing was also um, given to the, to the body, but it could not be introduced. The reasons to me as a, as a practitioner teacher that the, there were two issues. One, uh, the the legal role or the status or the, or the statutory role of the accreditation body, like in Pakistan, Pakistan Medical Council, Pakistan Engineering Council, as, as the Teacher Education Council could not get that type of the status. There are also more than 17 councils. They have not the similar are the equal status of like medical council or the engineering council. And that this, is, this could be one of the reasons. And other is uh, we have uh, about uh, more than 600 teacher training institutions. So the private sectors and the public sectors uh, and 
then I, I was highlighting the other reasons that we could not uh, really implement the, the accreditation or the licensing of the true spirit. Uh, that was the lack of uh, the, uh, the spirit of the implementations. However, accreditation has has been recognized and the most of the teacher training institutions departments and the colleges are now in the in the in the embed or in the um, have uh, been accredited by one or other uh, way other way means they are at the zero level or at the one or other category so but that uh, the accreditation of the programs and when with the accreditation of the programs at one hand and the curriculum, national curriculum review committee works on the other hand, and the implementation of the teacher education programs at the practicing uh, at, the, as, uh, at the teacher training institutions or the departments. These are three different pillars are the stakeholders. The fourth one is the school. So the accreditation of the programs and the curriculum review committee of Pakistan and the teacher training institution and the, the workplace that the future schools of the uh, workplace of the they, they, they all the four stakeholders don't have any mechanism of the coordination with each other so that the two concept as far as the reflections as far as the evolution as far as uh, as the improvement is concerned that's why they through the accreditations that it's a real sense of the professionalism is still uh, missing Uh, uh, in Pakistan, uh, the National Accreditation Council is working with the true spirit, as I said, that it is implemented, but the impact of the professionalism is not visible because of the certain reasons that we discussed. Uh, and when we talk about the licensing, licensing concept that which is really prevails in the America or in the Australia and in the advanced countries that's not here in Pakistan, even at not in the zero level that's not introduced in Pakistan. And what is that? The teachers are to be, uh, has to undergo for, uh, uh, for the for, for assessment, for the test, for the examinations to as to 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 get licensing of the teaching. That is, for example, in America, each state has a state license, and those is teachers that qualify the that the test uh, through the, um, the 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 licensing body. The teachers are authorized; they are entitled to teach in these schools, and the, the status is given on the basis of the teachers which a teacher acquires in the through in, in the examinations or through the tests by that body the teachers of the high level teachers of the mediocre level teacher of the specialized level so that is not in pakistan and that in, in, in the advanced countries that the national licensing and the provincial or the state based, based licensing and and we talk about the accreditations and the licensing that uh, is for the quality of the teachers. Accreditations, through the accreditations, we control the quality of the department or the college. Through the licensing, we control the or the improve the quality of the that, that teachers. So when they, the both at the teachers' professionalism or the teachers' competency, teachers' performance, teachers' dispositions when they are assessed through the through the licensing process, through the accreditation process, then comes the quality in the teachers or the uh, teacher education programs or the individual teachers. How to uh, get international recognition? Where, the basic uh, uh, criteria is the basic indicator is the internationalization of the curricula and syllabi. We in, in an international Islamic university where I work, we started some uh, joint programs, uh, a proposal on working joint program with one UK based university. The first condition from that UK based university was to share the curriculum to make it uh, uh, um, internationalized so as to make compatible 
between both the universities. So if the curriculum is not uh, compatible with the international or the syllabus is not um, meeting with this, uh, the international challenges, then we cannot have international recognition or international uh, level of our educational programs. And uh, let me again uh, indicate that our exchange programs are joint programs with that university. The conditions was how we can mobilize, uh, how we can exchange our teachers and students with each other. There are that again talks about how what is the standard or what is the accreditation or the recognitions of the teacher education program in Pakistan and what what, what is the level of that. Uh, uh, curriculum is it compatible with that uh, other side of the uh, um, of that university and the definitely the all the entire process of educational process teaching process or the learning process is uh, revolves uh, revolving around the standardized learning outcomes there are global trends and we, when we talk about the America, the Board of the Teacher Education Accreditation Council and uh, the NECETE and the third one is CAP, these are the different accreditation council in the America. And the CAP's standards in Pakistan, we have different standards. And the, when we, um, if we compare, if any students or the researcher work on the comparing on uh, comparing of the professional standards of Pakistan with America or other country, you will find not a big difference. You can find the difference of, um, of replacement of some standards in, in terms of the serial numbers or et cetera. But as, as far as the strategies are concerned, as, as far as the implementation of the concern, that is the huge and the remarkable difference from system to system, from institute to institute. Therefore, if we talk about CAEP, these are the standards, content and pedagogical knowledge and the clinical partnerships that the practice and the candidate quality recruitment and the selectivity and the program impact, the, what is the impact on the society or the individual. And the fifth standard is the provider's quality and the continuous improvement and the capacity. And in fact, if we talk about the Australia, the Australian Institute of the Teaching and the school leadership was established in 2010. And it, it, it uh, acts on behalf of the Australia's education ministers because it's, it's every state and the territory and the federal have separate systems. So this is the accreditation system in the Australia. And uh, if, and the other one is AITSL program. These are the standards of uh, uh, this uh, institutions or the organizations. If we talk about the India, they have separate systems. I have uh, compared uh, the Indian system of teacher accreditation with the Pakistani systems. Uh, I would not say that which is inferior and which one is the superior, but it is the um, significant difference between both the both the teacher education programs because we have in Pakistan adopted uh, already adopted four year teacher education programs teacher training programs but uh, in most of the SARC regions they don't have such type of the four years teacher training programs therefore their standards and their requirements are our assessment of uh, accreditation and assessment system is different. Licensing and that accreditation in uh, Pakistan. We discussed about the, uh, the, the licensing in Pakistan is uh, nowhere in Pakistan, but the efforts of the licensing uh, are made. And documents, you can find that uh, government of Punjab and government of uh, Sindh has done uh, some appreciable work as far as the licensing is concerned. But that was the sequential type of the effort. Once the accreditation process is fully launched and appreciated by the stakeholders and followed, that will be followed by the licensing in Pakistan. Provincial department, I said that they have started on the working on the licensing and accreditation is done. In Pakistan, accreditation is done by through the NECTI, 
that is uh, federal setup and all the provinces uh, and uh, even Kashmir, they accept the, uh, because the, the degree of the higher education commission is, um, accept, is applicable on them. Therefore, they um, have to undergo the accreditation of the National Accreditation Council of Teacher Education in Pakistan. So there are different standards of the National Accreditation Council that are really with the, they, they, they need to be revised with the passage of time. And I know that the Accreditation Council of Pakistan is working the revision of the, uh, the pro formas and the standards of improvement of those standards. Uh, in terms of the with the need of the time in terms of matching with the revised curriculum of uh, the teacher education programs etc so next is, uh, as we know that accreditation council works to, that uh, evaluates the programs that, that that before offering the programs they have zero accreditation so before offering the programs or during the offering of the programs, they have to get it accredited. So these are the standards of uh, accreditation in Pakistan. There are different standards. And uh, I, I would take this opportunity to highlight here that uh, the university where I work, that's the International Islamic University, that has got the uh, X category and uh, that is a highly appreciable category. There's no one uh, in Pakistan is, uh, teacher education institutions having W category. Only five or six teacher education institutions got the X category. International Islamic University's Department of Education is ranked in the X category. That is uh, very um, appreciable um, in uh, higher education commission and that's really appreciated. I mentioned that the Sindh and the Punjab government has started working uh, for the accreditation and the licensing in Pakistan. Uh, so thank you very much. This is all from my side. And uh, any question for me, I'm available. And this is from Punjab. Uh, Punjab government and the Sindh government has done appreciable work on uh, licensing and accreditation. Thank you very much. Uh, Daksab, thanks a lot for sharing uh, in detail, the nature and importance of licensing and accreditation of teacher education program. You have not only told us the uh, ongoing policies regarding licensing and accreditation of teacher education program in Pakistan, but compared it with the developed countries of the world. We are very thankful to you uh, for providing us in detail information and giving your uh, suggestions for improvement of the sector. Sir, I am very thankful to you. Uh, now, uh, before moving back, I request uh, Ms. Ms. Muzaffar uh, to take over. Um, uh, welcome, Dr. Maureen Manning, uh, in our uh, teacher education session. Um, I would I would request Dr. Maureen Manning to share her views on teacher education in global scenario. But uh, before uh, she takes her start, I would like to give a brief introduction of Dr. Maureen Manning. She is an international trainer, presenter, and keynote speaker on the topics of global education, teaching English to the speakers of other languages, intercultural competence, and a number of study programs abroad. She has also worked as adjunct professor, teacher trainer, and professional development facilitator in United States of America, Asia, and Europe. Thank you so much, Dr. Maureen, uh, for giving us your precious time. Now, uh, you please start uh, your discussion on the uh, given topic. Thank you. Yes, good good afternoon to you. It's morning here, um, middle of the night uh, in the US. I'm so thrilled to be here um, amongst all of you esteemed colleagues. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Um, as you heard in the introduction, teacher training is central to what I do, <clears throat> not only here in the US, um, but in the other schools that I work with across the world. Um, and so hearing and learning from all of you colleagues as well um, really helps my practice and helps me grow as a practitioner. Um, I'd love to, to share some of the, uh, the pieces that I have prepared for you this morning. But first, um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on um, my esteemed colleague who just spoke um, 
about some of the pieces about state certification and and absolutely right and, and and that's one of the central issues here in the US as I see it and that's where I wanted to start with you this morning is what does it look like in the US from a pre-service education perspective and then move into the in-service teacher piece and what that looks like um, during pandemic and post pandemic as well and what the future of um, teacher education looks like and how the pandemic has impacted that, or has it really? Has it changed the hallmarks of quality teacher education at all, or are those hallmarks still central uh, to what we do and what we've always done as providers of teacher education? So um, the first point, uh, yes, to follow up um, on the professor's comments about state certification here in the US. A key issue here is that state certification, as he mentioned, is very different. And so with a sometimes transient population, that causes lots of difficulties and teachers being almost stuck, forced to stay in the state where they currently reside because it means jumping through so many hoops and so much red tape to get additional certifications in different states. So for example, if I move to the state next door, which is very close, which is just a drive away, unless that state has a reciprocity agreement with my state, I live in Boston, so my state is Massachusetts, unless another state has a reciprocity agreement, then I would have to go back and gain additional certifications on top of my doctorate, on top of my certifications, um, causing lots of difficulty and also a financial impact that goes along with that as well. Um, our military families are highly impacted by that um, state regulation as well. So if there's, you know, oftentimes we, we find that a spouse that's in the military, if they are going to another, moving to another location, to another base, and their spouse is an educator, they are facing all sorts of difficulties in getting that, um, that certification accepted without having to jump through all sorts of hoops and gain additional certifications, possibly go back to school. And again, there's a financial implication that goes along with all of that, as we know. Um, also want to mention that in the recent years, in the past decade, teacher education, pre-service teacher education, as well as in-service here in the United States, has two central uh, foci. And the first one is special education. The second is education for English learners or formerly ESL, uh, now just EL or ELE, -E, English language education. Knowing that many of our English learners, for them, English is not a second language, but it's an additional language to possibly the numerous languages that they speak. English learners is the fastest growing population here in the United States. And therefore there's a large emphasis in pre-service teacher education about how do we teach a growing population of, of diverse learners here in the United States uh, who speak multiple languages, who have a wide variety of experiences, some of whom are have interrupted learning. Uh, so because of this growing diversity in our country, um, a country that has long been diverse, a country whose foundations, its very foundations has been built on diversity. How do we best prepare teachers to honor, acknowledge, recognize, and celebrate that diversity, the diversity in their classrooms every single day? Um, so that has moved beyond pre-service education, and now is a requirement for teachers to maintain their licensure. Um, in the state of Massachusetts, where I live, teachers need to be recertified every five years here in Massachusetts. In order to do that, not only do they now have to take the certain number of hours in content and pedagogy as before, but now they have to take 15 of those hours specifically in topics of special education. They also have to take 15 hours specifically in education around English learners. 
This sends a large and strong message from the state of Massachusetts that these two categories, these two populations of learners are really um, at the forefront uh, of what we should be concentrating on. And really what that means is diversity in the classroom, not just special education students, not just English learners, but focusing on diversity, focusing on differentiating our instruction and how best we can do that. So that's an overall of pre-service education in the US. But so much of that also applies to in-service education. And that is more my area of specialty, working with in-service teachers and doing continuous professional development and sustainable professional development. What does that look like now that we are in a pandemic era? And what are the implications post-pandemic? So I'm going to share my screen here with you and to discuss the future of, te of teacher education, more from the in-service uh, PD, professional development, uh, as we call it. So what I wanted to discuss in the, in the time that we have left together in my piece it is about providing quality teacher education post-pandemic. We're not quite there yet in the post-pandemic piece, but we're getting there. Uh, every day, hopefully we move a little closer to post-pandemic. But in the meantime, how are we offering uh, teacher education now and what does it look like in the future? In order to have that discussion, it's important that we discuss what is quality teacher education? What are those hallmarks? What are the must-haves, the non-negotiables? What does that look like? And then finally, how are we meeting that moment? What are we doing now that meets the needs of our teachers, given the fact that some of us are still uh, participating in distance learning and hybrid learning? Yes, some of us are back in person, but the needs of our teachers have changed. The needs of our students have changed. The needs of our colleagues have changed. How are we meeting the moment? So the future is here. The future of professional development, the future of teacher education is here. In March 2020, it drastically changed for so many of us with reverting to or with moving to distance learning in so many places in the world. So given that and given the place that we are now, again, some of us are still distance learning, some of us are in a hybrid format, and some of us are fortunately happily back in, in, in person with our educators, with our students. What are some of the concerns that we have about offering teacher education in 2020, thinking of March 2020, where we were then, and today and then beyond. And I ask you to uh, put any comments that you might have about this in the chat. What are some of the concerns that, that we have about pandemic and post-pandemic teacher education? I'll start. Um, one of the concerns that I had about offering teacher education, this is something that I do, I do this every day, I'm used to being in front of educators every day, um, and I feel that there's a, a connection that we have when we're in person together um, that may not translate across a screen. How do we engage folks when we're not there in their physical presence? You know, I feel like you must have to have an absolutely dynamic personality to be able to come across the screen and really grab them, engage them, get them learning. The same thing can be said for our breakout rooms. Typically during teacher education sessions, we start with whole group. We introduce our focus, our agenda for the day. We have an introduction of the topic and then we move to some small group work so that teachers can learn and share with their colleagues, learn from their colleagues, share their vast experience. Um, how do we do that effectively when we're relying on breakout rooms in Zoom and we're not in those breakout rooms to circle around and, and offer feedback, offer help, offer that support that so naturally happens when you're in others' presence, but is more difficult when we are virtual. So that's a concern that I had moving to mostly online format when it comes to teacher education. Any concerns that you have that you would be willing to share in the chat?
anyone uh, if anyone uh, if anyone have any question uh, you can please write in the chat box later on we will discuss that in our discussion session thank you so let's talk about that then what does quality professional development or teacher education look like in any given year because if you have a quality program of teacher education, then there are certainly some key elements that are woven through that will transcend issues such as technology, um, which sometimes gets the better of us. It did for me this morning, very first thing, logging on at 4 a.m. Sometimes, um, despite our best efforts, technology is not always our friend. So how, um, how can we best prepare ourselves for that? What are the key elements that will transcend technology? Well, that will reach across the screen through time uh, differences, through language differences, through um, the use of Zoom or Google Meet or whatever platform you're using. What are some of those key elements? So some of the quality teacher education components as I see it uh, in the work that I do is the relevance to content. So often our teachers are asked to sit in generalized sessions. Um, here in this conference, we have the, the ability to choose sessions that really work for us, that meet our needs. And um, what I find so often in teacher education is that it's very generalized. There are far less specifics. Now, if you are a specialist working in a specialist area, for example, a special education teacher or a teacher of English learners, there's not always a piece for you. And as that um, piece, are, those pieces are the two most central pieces to teacher education currently in US, specifically in the state of Massachusetts, so important, as I mentioned, that they are requiring that now for your recertification, how are we then translating that when we are working with sustainable teacher education? What, how are we using that model of differentiating instruction for our teachers so that they are getting that quality teacher education that's relative to their content? So often I've been in sessions that are pretty specific to classroom teachers, yet, there are teachers in there who teach physical education, who teach art, who teach English learners and, and ELD or English learner development, language language development, whose that might that content might not be relevant to them. So wouldn't their time be better served in a different session by adding an additional teacher trainer so that they could get content specific and relevant to their needs? A hallmark of quality teacher education helps teachers plan their instruction. So what are the specific takeaways? What are the strategies that teachers are going to come away with that's going to help them plan not only the instruction, but also the delivery? So how are we helping them increase their knowledge of content, but also helping them translate that to pedagogy as well? So they're getting the content information, but they're also getting information about pedagogy and delivery. Um, and community, getting folks engaged. How are we engaging folks, particularly if we are on a virtual platform? How are we reaching out to them? Are we going into breakout session? Are we engaging them in the chat? Are we um, encouraging them to be present, taking off their mute, taking off, uh, putting on their video and really engaging with the presenter and also with the with each other, with their colleagues. How can we best do that? And often that happens when you can read body language, when you can see facial expressions, when you can have a conversation with them so that it is a community of learning. It's not sage on the stage um, offering up their advice, but it's really community building, it's shared knowledge. And what it does is speaks to and honors the vast knowledge that our teachers have already. Our teachers are experts, they're in their role because they have an expertise in their field and they have a quality delivery. And that's why they're selected for their positions. 
um, regardless of whether they're teaching in an elementary school or in a higher education um, environment. So let's honor that background of our teachers and get them engaged. Um, sustainability. When we're planning our teacher education um, or professional development components, it's important to have sustainability in mind so that teacher development is not a, what we call um, a one-off or drive by teacher education where they're sort of just driving through like a drive fast food drive through picking up a little information and then driving on. We want to make sure that it's part of a general plan. And that's why we do a lot with strategic planning of professional development in the work that I do with the different universities and different organizations is developing a strategic plan that includes the teacher education component as um, a vital element of that. How does this teacher education fit in with every other thing that we do with all of um, the, the important pieces that we're talking about this year? What is our plan for this year based on our university's goals or our school's goals or our district's goals? What are those goals? How does the teacher education then reflect those goals? And then how does the specific component of that teacher education also speak to individual teachers needs. So it's really funneling down from the overarching goals and then to very specific even classroom or subject goals for our teachers. So keeping all of those pieces in mind. And then the last question, this is really a reflection question for you all and you can certainly put your reflections in the chat and we can talk about this during our Q&A. And I really truly invite during the uh, Q&A part when um, our lovely moderator signals that we are ready for that part, I would love to have a discussion with you about how you are meeting that moment. How are we taking what we have been given here in this um, pandemic era in which we're living in, how are we transcending? Um, across time and space and virtual platforms to meet the needs of our teachers. What have we done differently? And then again, what are we doing that is exactly the same because we know it's a hallmark of teacher education that regardless of format, time, space, location, and language is always going to be a key element of quality teacher education across the world. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maureen, for your uh, valuable uh, thoughts. We would love if we had plenty of time. Uh, we, want, we wanted to listen to you, but sorry, we have some time constraints. Um, anyhow, thank you so much for, your, for sharing your uh, knowledge and your experiences and your uh, research-based findings with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, uh, over to Sir Tahir. Thank you, Madam Ms. Uh, now, I will request Dr. Rehmatullah Bhattisa, a great name in teacher education circle. Currently, he is working as assistant professor in Alama Iqbal Open University, Islamabad. He is coordinator of PhD education and MPhil education programs at Alama Iqbal Open University. He is with rich background of working with several public and private sector organization in the field of teacher education. Rasab, accept my request to share your, your experience about teacher education in Pakistan. Janab Dr. Rehmatullah Bhatti, sir. Bismillah rahman rahim First of all, I'm really thankful to the organizer of this first international conference in Federal College of Education Today, I would like to have a perspective of teacher education in Pakistan. Currently, according to Economic Survey of Pakistan 2019-20, approximately we have 15 are 16 lakh teachers working at different levels of Pakistan. If we see the training programs provided in the country, 
first of all with the emergence of pakistan we started with jv sv and v these programs work better for a long time with the changing scenario of pakistan we developed many national education policies and we also have different commissions for improvement of education in pakistan keeping in view the different reports about jv sb and bt government of pakistan reformed these programs and renamed as ptc ct ot and ba if we see the history of education these programs worked for a long time but with the globalization of the education now we are in third generation of education training programs we have replaced ptc ctot with ad program associate degree in education and ba programs and now ba programs are of three streams ba four years which is also called ba honors and we also have ba 2.5 years and ba 1.5 in all these programs the main objective remained to equip the prospective teachers with subject matter knowledge pedagogical skills learner psychology or particularly developing attitude toward teaching and self confidence in teaching empowering learners it mean develop the skills in the teachers to have independent decisions in teaching learning situations and adopt appropriate use of instructional facilities to keep all the teacher education programs at par government of pakistan develop national professional standards these are 10 standards which covers all the areas of teacher education if we have a brief look on these professional standards they cover subject matter knowledge human growth and development knowledge of islamic ethics values and social life skills instructional planning and strategies assessment learning environment effective communication proficient use of information and communication technologies collaboration and partnership continuous professional development and code of conduct and teaching of english as a second language if we have a deep look on these professional standards government has kept in view all the opinions expressed by educationists at different levels before the development of these national standards and they are very comprehensive and to implement these professional standards as dr jumani has earlier said higher education commission has formed a body for accreditations council for teacher education program which is called net to ensure implementation of these professional standards net has also developed a conceptual framework and we all teacher educator knows they visit 
the training education institutions for accreditations of their programs. Their conceptual framework is very comprehensive. For example, they check curriculum and instructions, curriculum developed teacher education institutions for prospective teachers and assessment and evaluation system developed by the degree awarding institutions, physical infrastructures, because mostly teachers complain after training, they face physical infrastructure in the institutions and human resources. The teacher institutions do not have deficiency of faculty. Similarly, finance for teacher education institutions, research, culture, and the most important one, which is lacking in previous our programs was community links. Now, question arises, ki having professional standards, which are very comprehensive, having NACTI, to ensure the implementation of these professional standards, why parents prefer private institutions? This is the question. Similarly, public sector trained teachers are not performing at par with private trained teachers, it means that society is asking, is pre-service training essential? Why teachers do not implement training gained in training institutions? Or is there gap between training provided in the institutions and the teaching learning environment. Research shows why parents prefer private institutions, though their teachers are not trained at such levels, which is provided in teacher training institutions. According to different researches, parents feel that their children learn well in private schools. Children feel comfortable environment in private schools. And the most important one, the teacher learn, students learn according to their pace of learning. And the views of students are valued. It means they are participated in teacher learning process and receive positive feedback from school teachers, they have good relation with teachers. They get proper attention of the teachers. They feel secure in private schools. They are treated in respectable manners. Their needs and interests are always taken seriously. This is the research-based findings ki why parents prefer private schools, which raised a question on the quality of teacher training provided in our institutions. Next challenge. This is the one challenge which is being faced by private public schools. The second is globalization. Now, Globalization of education has demanded quality and excellence. Now, this quality and excellence is the demand of globalization. If teacher education programs do not fulfill the required international quality and excellence, the generation trained, taught, 
in our institution would not be able to compete globally. As it is said that no education system can be above the level of teachers' education. If teachers are not highly trained, well qualified, par at excellence, they cannot train the next generations. Now, according to my understandings, how we can face these challenges. Number one, teacher educators mean we are who are providing training in teacher training institutions, we have to be role models. The first thing we have to be motivated and satisfied with our professions. And second one, we have to be reflective, resourceful, and receptive. Reflective. When I teach the class, I should reflect on my interactions and try to find the room for improvement in my tomorrow class. Second one. The complaint by the working teacher in public school is mostly if there is no environment for teachers. If teacher is resourceful, he or she can modify, develop the environment for his or her teaching in the class. And the third, respective. Receptive teachers is open-minded. He or she go to the class, go to the society with open eyes and with listening ears. He do not claim to be perfect. He always want to learn to improve his strategies. If this reflectiveness, resourcefulness or receptiveness with motivation is in ourselves being a teacher educators, our trained teachers obviously will reflect these characteristics in their class. And I hope ke, inshallah the result will be for that. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for sharing your valuable uh, experiences regarding teacher education uh, program in Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Ramtullah Bhatti Sahib was talking about the historical background and gradual development of teacher education programs in Pakistan, highlighting the standardization process of teacher education in Pakistan. He also uh, talked about the challenges faced by the teacher education uh, programs in Pakistan. Dr. Sahib, I am very thankful to you on behalf of FCE. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing your very valuable remarks with us. Uh, next. I request Madam Ms. Muzaffar uh, to start uh, call the next chat. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramatullah Bhatti, for sharing your uh, Beyond Price uh, views with us. Uh, now uh, we have uh, Professor Dr. Zarina Akhtar with us. Uh, before she takes her start, uh, I would like to introduce her briefly. Uh, she is working as assistant professor at International Sami University, Islamabad. She has diversified experiences in teacher education and uh, assessment in education and trend, trend setter in teacher training as well. Uh, she is now, uh, she's requested to bless us with her very precious thoughts about challenges faced by teacher education. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zarina, for sparing your precious time with, for us. Uh, now we would like to uh, uh, listen to you. Please discuss your... Uh, thank you, Ms. Bhatt. And uh, thank you, the team of the conference, uh, that you have given me the chance to present my thoughts. And uh, I will cut 
down my presentation because of the time constraints and i directly start my uh, talk with the challenges or faced by the teacher education during covid 19 when this pandemic happened we faced uh, like and because of the lockdown uh, every institution was uh, closed and uh, then the, there was a question for teachers and students that what they do now and how they will handle the teaching learning process and it will how it will be continued so uh, the first thing was the challenge we have faced is that digital forums were not available to us and then uh, some of the institutions and uh, iiu also started uh, discussions and teaching learning process on social media and they use whatsapp groups and then Uh, with the passage of time we have developed the learning management systems and uh, you know, some universities uh, developed microsoft soft team and other uh, softwares for continuing their their process of learning the next challenge was the, the digital skills uh, of teacher educators and students they were not developed so the the person the people were not aware and then we have trained we have uh, like managed and arranged different uh, workshops for the uh, for the teacher educators for the teachers for for whole university and then we uh, have a videos prepared videos for the learning of uh, have and acquiring the digital skills about uh, uh, continuing the process of learning and then major comp the now i will uh, discuss the major components of teach related to the teacher education the first component and the major component was teaching practice and it was um, our students were lack to follow the teaching practice in schools because schools were closed and they were not able to continue the this this uh, experimental or this practical component in true sense in and the uh, the next thing uh, which we have faced is in classroom we have to we are supposed to develop the dispositions in students and uh, for this we pre practice dispositions and we learn and assess Uh, the, the dispositions in the class, and it is a major component of the national professional standard. And it was lagged because of not having no classroom settings, and on online classes, it was not possible to uh, assess, to practice, and assess the disp dispositions of the students. And uh, uh, other than this, we lagged with the pedagog pedagogical skills practices during uh, during the classes, like. The, in face to face classes we have a te have micro teaching skill micro teaching lessons students are supposed to present their lessons and uh, uh, in this situation it was not possible to present these things and in true spirit then we uh, i was also taking one of the pedagogical course and uh, my students also faced the problem and i was worried that how i can uh, assess their pedagogical skills because of this if they are this component is missing then we cannot uh, the students cannot be at the level so dunia se bhi ji so uh, but we did um, uh, first uh, we requested our students to prepare their lesson planning in the video form and then they share their videos in the um, online class but there we face some many problems like the the voice and the internet connections and in next semester it was uh, like students were familiar with this situation and they were supposed they were requested to prepare the present the live uh, sessions like lesson plans in live video so at their home they uh, open their cameras and they start the presenting their lessons and in this way we have conducted the sessions and along with these things uh, there are some other challenges faced uh, to the teacher educator to inculcate different uh, practical aspects or different skills in the teacher uh, prospective teachers such as like in school management there are different activities which are supposed uh, to be inculcated into the students but we are not able to manage these like event organizing activity was not been possible and similarly the research skills uh, were not been uh, were not been uh, Uh, inculcated in the students students who have worked during the this pandemic and with the online sessions they have they are lacking with the uh, research skills um, along with these uh, issues are these challenges which are been faced by the uh, teacher by the by the students and teachers 
in the teacher education department there are some other challenges general challenges which are been uh, faced i will take the advantage of this forum and i will highlight those challenges which are uh, faced to the teacher education first of all the the status of the teacher education degree it is not clear that either it is a academic degree or it is a professional degree so first we have to think and we have to fix it that which degrees are academic and which are professional the second thing is the budget for the teacher education like it's very low budget is been uh, utilized for the for the improvement of teacher education and then the the status of the education teacher education institutions it is also a question like uh, previously gsets were uh, been handicapped because they were so uh, they, those institutions were for the ptc and the ct teacher ct training uh, program but after 1990 they were been handicapped and they were uh, so they were stopped uh, playing their part and now uh, we have started bs education at the universities and bsc is uh, like and uh, higher education second higher secondary uh, programs are been shifted to the schools now our colleges the status of our colleges are uh, are a question uh, if they are they have started the bs program in education but the teachers there they are not teacher educators so what type of stuff what type of activities they will inculcate in their students i don't know and then uh, we don't have a continuous policy the teacher training institution of our professional development so there is a there is a need of having systematized systematic professional training and professional uh, development policies for the teacher educators the first, the next is like uh, the link between the teacher education curriculum and the national curriculum is missing like teacher education curriculum is been developed by the hec and national curriculum is developed by the ministry and uh, the the teachers we trained at our institutions they are supposed to teach those subjects and those concepts when they are they don't know when they don't know the strategy so there must be a link developed between these things so this is also a big challenge for the teacher education program the the teacher trainers the trained teacher like the prospective teachers are not trained according to the market need that's why Uh, dr ramatullah bhatti said that uh, we have a professional standards we have nectis standards even then the parents are willing to send their children to the private schools and uh, what is the reason the reason is that we are uh, training our students based on the curriculum which is which is prepared by the hcc and we are not training them for the curriculum which they have to implement in the schools and uh, national professional standards are very good they are there but we do not uh, consider them while we are developing the the curriculum for the teacher education programs uh, we have to focus by like many standards we are not uh, it, these are not implemented in real sense further we have multiple degrees of the teacher education programs and uh, in 1990 the ct programs were stopped and after that in 2013 we started the bed elementary and bed uh, secondary bed elementary programs after 23 years but the situation is that uh, the recruiting agencies are not willing to hire the teachers willing to hire the students which are been have which have been de have degrees uh, from the teacher education institutions and they suggest for the induction training for their own and in this way what is the purpose of these teacher education programs if they have to in, have to prepare their own induction programs and they have to implement those then then the the status of these teacher education programs is a big challenge for the teacher education uh, uh, scenario uh, we have uh, uh, now we have uh, we have to finalize we have to fix it that uh, how the technology can be integrated in the teacher education program so that if we have to go for the distance learning or online learning then the teachers and the students know the issues uh, and to hand and are able to handle those issues uh, the last thing which i want to discuss is that necti is there necti's professional necti standards are there but it need to be revised that the necti standards for bs program are same for, uh, as the necti standards for the phd program both the degrees and both the requirements of those degrees are different so there is a need to have a different standards and different evaluation criteria for both the programs 
so these are the some challenges uh, which are been uh, faced by the teacher education in program teacher education some are for the teacher education institutions some are for the teacher educators and some are for the teacher for the prospective teachers so there is a need to address these issues and even some uh, at some stages uh, induction trainings are been suggested that maybe for the three uh, months they have induction training and then for the next three months they have induction if there is a no continuity between the training they the impact will loss and many research studies uh, show these results and if uh, if we have a continuous training for one year for nine months then why we have stopped the beard uh, one year program so if we are going to the pre previous situation then uh, why there is a uh, to why to stop this uh, pre service teacher training programs if we have to plan uh, induction training for 9 months and for one year for 9 month the training for the 9 months is maybe degree program or it could be the certificate program but it is not a training training is a for short period and there is a need to focus on one thing we have the multiple degrees like b ed elementary bs education ma education phd ms and uh, we at 1.5 so we for multiple programs thus the curriculum the pro, the content the students are uh, like practicing is almost same so why what is the need of having different or uh, multiple degrees so my question is the is for the seniors my question is for the for the discussion of this forum and uh, thank you for providing me the chance to highlight these issues of teacher education thank you i hope i am in time uh, uh thank you so much uh, dr zarina uh you have uh, shared a uh, very valuable uh, knowledge and research based knowledge with us uh, but uh, again uh, due to shortage of time we have to move forward thank you so much ma'am for sparing your time next uh sir thank, thank you thank you madam ms from muzaffar uh, we were picking the pearls of the experiences of dr zarina after uh, now we request uh, dr fozia ajmal before going forward i would like to make a short introduction dr fozia is working as assistant professor in international islamic university islamabad she has been gifted with innate and privilege of working as director female campus and student advisor directorate of distance education her research interest include pre service and in service teacher education and bridging the gaps between the theory and practice her research is getting space in the national and international journals Uh, she is associated with several organizations in the field of education and training uh, dr fozia i would request you start uh, and uh, my second request is that please uh, be limited as we have time limitations we are already uh, going back thanks a lot uh, dr fozia let's start please uh good afternoon and uh, uh, since yesterday i have been um, listening the con attending the conference and i have got gathered different ideas uh, regarding the teacher education and uh, i was thinking that in every session uh, whether it is the blended learning whether it is the um, inclusive education the end result end is the conclusion uh, in conclusion and recommendations everybody is saying that the teacher education is required so i think that the teacher education is the key to the uh, progress so um let's start with the question what do you um, do as a teacher when we pose this question we get multiple answers like somebody would be saying that uh, i am teaching somebody would be saying that i uh, am doing the research along with that somebody would be mentioning the uh, subject uh, they are teaching that means that uh, we are usually thinking that the teaching is the delivering of knowledge but it is uh, not uh, correct in the current scenario we uh, nobody 
usually answers that I am making the students learn. We are focusing on the previous context, 20th century uh, until now, and uh, we are still fail to um, uh, go towards the students concept. That is why there is a need of changing the, the teacher education setup. Uh, I must, I'm skipping a few slides uh, just because of the time. So let's go quickly uh, for the comparison of the educational concepts in 20th and 21st century. That becomes the base for the changing nature of the teacher education. Previously in 20th century, we were focusing on the theoretical foundation, but now we have to move to the practical foundations. And as other panelists have mentioned, that we have to uh, uh, do the transition from the theory to the practical and giving uh, the focus on the creation of knowledge rather than the rearrangement of the knowledge and rote memorization. Yesterday also, uh, uh, Dr. Munawar Mirza was saying that we are uh, much focusing on the right rote memorization and initial skills of uh, the uh, Bloom's taxonomy. But now uh, with the 20, 21st century and the demand, demanding nature of the teacher education, we have to focus these points in our teacher education programs, whether it is in service or pre service or the induction training, so that uh, we would be able to cope up with the challenges. Uh, some of the challenges uh, Dr. Zarina has already mentioned. So, uh, from person's growth to personality growth and ability of, uh, of uh, knowing to ability of doing the things. That means the practical skills need to be inculcated and strengthened during the teacher education programs. So that would be providing a base for not uh, boring us the ideas, uh, but rather creating the new ideas. So creation is the key towards the progress in 21st century. And uh, our teacher education program should be focused on uh, preparing the uh, self-reliant teachers. So once we would be giving them the chance to do uh, whatever is required as uh, Dr. Ahmed was saying that we are not providing them with the um, decision making skills. So uh, once we would be transforming our uh, teacher education program, especially the pre service teacher education programs, according to the changing requirements and challenges of the 21st century, then we would be uh, offering them to um, apply the knowledge which they are learning in the uh, exact uh, concept. And then uh, uh, our assessment is uh, usually focused on the knowledge, but um, we need to focus on the assessment based on what they have learned and how they can practice it. And are we preparing the teachers for the changing demands? And uh, for that, we need to inculcate uh, different learner-centered teaching methodologies um, in our curriculum and in our pedagogy for teacher education. So we need to focus for the understanding and doing and we have to provide the opportunity of uh, discussion and sharing the ideas and development of uh, specific skills which are required for becoming the uh, effective teachers. So that also links with the, uh, what uh, Dr. Moran was saying that we need to focus on the quality of teacher education and maintaining the um, standards and going towards the lesson shore and uh, going towards the high standards of accreditation of our programs. So, uh, so these are usually um, particularly the demands of the teacher preparation programs um, and how we can do it. Uh, we would be acquiring information through various sources and blending them with pre previous information which the learners are having. So that they would be developing a link and uh, through developing those links, they would be uh, linking it with their personal experiences, with the experiences of other persons. And then uh, th it would be providing them for the base of uh, creation of knowledge. So the creation of knowledge would be uh, going towards the transforming our educational system. So here are a few demands, um, uh, knowledge demands, skills demand, planning demands, management demands, research demands, and personal demands, and professional demands. So we need to inculcate all the levels, all, this, all sorts of demands in the curriculum of teacher education and also in the pedagogy. Uh, sometimes we see that the curriculum is made in a very uh, good way, but the pedagogy is not um, mentioning it um, properly. And uh, uh, linking it with the inclusive education, so there are individual differences uh, and we need the teachers to 
uh, inculcate those inclusive education strategies in uh, their teaching so in teacher education programs we just not uh, only need to focus on the theory of inclusive education and the strategies of differentiated instruction but also give them the practice during their teaching practice or uh, during their uh, simulation practice during the classes so that they would be able to cope up with these challenges and next one is uh, uh, training the teachers for uh, developing the partnerships because we can't work in isolation partnerships are important and for developing the partnerships within the organization and uh, along with the other organizations because internationally when we see uh, the teacher education institutions are linked with the uh, schools and other educational institutions so that link is missing and the partnership can develop um, those links and uh, i would recommend uh, some specific courses for teacher educators that has been mentioned by dr jumani and dr zarina also that if we would be able to train our teacher educators in a particular sense then they would be uh, highlighting those skills and highlighting those uh, uh, required competencies in um, their teaching and training and research and evaluation that is in need of the r and improvement and revision in curriculum and instruction sometimes we devise the curriculum but we do not alter our instructional methods and along with that in service training is also so much important because uh, uh, that also has to be need based because uh, uh, once we are doing the in service training just for the sake of training that is not uh, uh, achieving its objectives and developing competency in the use of latest technology and latest methodologies of teaching so that is linking with the uh, current scenario also that we are uh, going online and but we are just confused that whether uh, our teacher education would be online and we are teaching them uh, to go in schools or colleges and um, teach in, at campus so it it has to be a, a blend of uh, uh, both modes of teaching so i am ending with these 21st century skills and uh, these are the skills for the 21st century learner that they need to be creative they need to be innovative they need to have critical thinking and problem solving skills collaboration and leadership skills lifelong learning skills uh, they need to have the digital literacy and communication skills and along with that they uh, must focus on the ethical citizens also so uh, uh, for developing all of these skills in the students we have to focus on the teacher education that how the teachers would be prepared to develop these skills in our future generation so teacher education is the key of developing all of uh, these skills and uh, that is the reform which is required in teacher education so that is all for my side uh thank you so much dr kozia for your uh, well enough thoughts thank you so much for sparing your precious time for us now uh, let's come towards the research presentation as we uh, shared the sequence uh, with all of you uh, according to sequence it was miss farida's turn but uh, 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 on uh, uh, madam neelam request we are uh, requesting uh, her uh, to kindly come and uh, share her research article with us uh, the title of her research article is reasons for choosing teacher profession in pakistan she is from uk uh, dr ne neelam nawaz uh, you may uh, take start please टू share findings of my study which was uh, conducted as a result of my phd and uh, i have provided a link on the powerpoint if you are interested you can read the full phd thesis uh, from this link you can download it and you can read it and if you have any questions then you can contact me via email address that i will post in the chat and it is also given on the powerpoint so this the purpose of my study was to analyze the training teachers uh, reasons for choosing the teaching profession and in this study i have tried to understand which kind of the people are interested in the teaching profession 
and in my study i have observed that the social cultural and religious norms of pakistani society play an important role in choosing the teaching profession and findings of my studies uh, suggest that gender is also an important reason for female trainee teachers to choose the teaching profession as teaching is considered a good suitable and respected profession for females um, in pakistani society and uh, we already know i will skip uh, i will just um, stay brief on some slides we already know that uh, in pakistan the budget allocated for the education is extremely low and it has been um, mentioned in various research studies and uh, as a result we lack our research on the lives of teachers in developing country of latka conducted a research study in 2007 and he mentioned that we lack our research on the uh, lives of teachers in developing countries their motive for entering the occupation despite the low remuneration their resources of job satisfaction and their promotion strategies and opportunities whereas a great deal of research on the these issues has been approved in anglo american and other developed countries uh, however countries like pakistan india ghana there is no trend on trying to understand what problems are faced by these young people so we can make teaching profession attractive for uh, talented people um for this study as a population of this study i chose a teacher training institute of pakistan and um, plus there were the participants from uh three other institute but most of the participants uh, were from a one big teacher training institute um which has over 1400 students in it and it was offering um over 15 degree programs so here is the total uh, population uh, in of the study i conducted data from year 2 training teachers only uh, from some of the programs and teacher trainers these were the teachers who were providing uh, training to these training teachers and head teachers are the head teachers of the schools where trainee teachers go for their teaching practice and uh, in this table i have presented uh, the type of the research particle uh, participants their population their sample and their percentage in sample now for this study what i did i used ground theory methods uh, i used ground theory methods because i really want to to understand their perspective i have not used a question or anything i conducted one to one interviews i conducted focus group discussions so i can uh, fully understand um i am uh, i assume you are all educationist and you are aware about the gondi theory method that it has different phases and um, each phase passed through different processes the first phase was coding the transcript and formation of the categories second phase um i form conditional relationship guide to understand how these categories are linked with one another then i use coding reflecting matrix and then at the result by looking into the data i formulated the theory and i explained uh, what are what are the reasons for these young people to uh, join the teaching profession in order to establish the trustworthiness of this data i have used a triangulation technique data was not only conducted from the uh, collected from the trainee teachers but teacher trainers and head teachers were also uh, included and then um, ethical considerations i have uh, given anonymous names to all the participants on all the information was kept confidential and before collecting data permission was um, seek from the head of the department and before interviewing um, verbally permission was taken from each and every participant as well so in the first phase there were only two participants i conducted one to one interview uh, but after completing my first phase uh, it was a trial phase um, i decided i should uh, uh, i should uh, conduct focus focus group discussions uh, with trainee teachers and then um, i have collected uh, conducted one to one interviews with teacher trainers and head teachers okay analysis and interpretation of the data as this data was based from the two participants only and they were interested in the teaching profession because of, because of their low grades family pressure and uh, they said they were ready to leave the pro profession when i asked why they said because it is low paid and we would like to uh, go for an alternative profession where we can be highly paid so in the phase 2 there were more participants and there were four to 10 um, focus group dis 
and they were focus group discussion and in each group there were four to ten participants there is a brief overview uh, in this table you can see uh, there are there is a list of in the first column there is a list of various programs and number of uh, focus groups selected and uh, how many participants were from each group then what what does this data suggest i will focus on that um, what i did i categorized data into various um, uh, categories and these are the categories that I have formed as a result of data. Some of the participants uh, suggested they have chosen the teaching profession because of the Islamic pro, uh, perspective of the teaching profession. As you know, this is the profession um, of our Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in our holy book, there is um, emphasized on the importance of gaining education and giving education. So there were some training teachers who said, we wanted to choose this profession because we are Muslim and it is a profession of the prophets and we want to carry on that. So they were having the true inspiration from their religion. There were also some young training teachers who said they wanted to bring a change in the society. So they said in our society, um, there are many flaws and by choosing the teaching profession, they wanted to get rid from those flaws like uh, dishonesty, theft and uh, terrorism. They want to educate people. They want to make them good citizens. And some of the trainee teachers in there said they have inspiration from their own teachers. Like they said, when during their educational career, they were inspired by someone and they wanted to be teachers like them so there could be good teacher in the field. There was um, also a big group of the participants who suggested that teaching is considered a suitable profession for the females. There were some females in this category who said, the norms and culture of the Pakistani society compelled them to join the teaching profession. They said, our parents said, our husbands said that we should choose the teaching profession and this is the only profession where they are allowed to work and they won't allow them to work out of the uh, house if it is any other profession. Because uh, as we see, there are some of the schools which are girls only. They said, uh, uh, we will not allow them to interact with anyone else. And on the other side, there were some females who said teaching is a convenient job for female and it is something that is manageable if they want to work. They can manage this job with the household activities, therefore they have chosen the teaching profession. And um, in the last category, I have put teaching as a second choice profession. So in here, there were some teachers who said that we have chosen the teaching profession because we were unable to become doctor, we were unable to become an accountant, we were unable to become a solicitor. So their first choice was something else, but when they were unable to achieve that one, they came into the teaching profession. So here is a overview of different type of the teachers who have chosen to become a teaching profession in this slide. I did not only collect the data from them, I also uh, collected data uh, from the head teachers of the schools where these teachers uh, go for their um, uh, uh, teaching practice. The research data obtained from the head teachers confirmed all previously established reasons for choosing the teaching profession mentioned by the trainee teachers, except one, which was to bring changes in the society. When I spoke to um, uh, the teacher trainers, the teachers who were providing um, uh, training to these training teachers, um, then uh, the data suggested that um, uh, the subcategory formed under this theme are the Islamic perspective of the teaching profession to bring the change in society, inspiration from other teachers, and suitable options for females. Similar to the trainee teachers, teacher trainers also suggested teaching is suitable option for females because of the norms and culture of the uh, Pakistani society in the two ways that I have already established. And they confirm most of the students came to this profession because uh, they are unable to uh, get success in their first option. So in this figure, in the last figure, um, what I have done, um, uh, in this Venn diagram, you can see uh, there is a list of all the categories. Uh, you can read them. Um, I have provided a match where they all agree and disagree with different colors. Uh, and uh, the category B was only mentioned by trainee teachers uh, being changed in the society. Whoever had teachers only mentioned the category H, inspiration from other teachers in their family. That was common among them. And for the teacher trainers, it was the category G. So uh, the 
it has opened many questions uh, for the educational institutes and the government of the Pakistan and the policy makers that what type of the teachers they want in the teaching profession and how they can raise the standard of the teaching profession. Obviously, they need to pay well to the teachers. They need to make it attractive, more attractive for the young, young talented people. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me via email. I will just stick to my time limit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neelam, for sharing your comprehensive research. Uh, it was really uh, very uh, knowledgeable research. Uh, and you know, uh, we will uh, email your uh, research article to all the uh, or to all the panelists and uh, the audience who will uh, who will have who will uh, who will love to uh, read your article. We will provide them the details. Thank you so much. Next, we have Ms. Parida with, with us. Uh, Ms. Parida. I would like to request you to uh, present your research article on teachers' professional development and students' performance in an open classroom environment between Islamabad and Oida City. Ms. Kipala, Ms. Mayanis, please uh, be brief and quickly as we are running out of time and after we have another session to start. So please. Uh, you have eight to ten minutes. So please finish with another one. Thank you. She's having some internet here. She's having connectivity issue. So, uh, Dr. Kurat, if you can listen me, then uh, you, you may start because I think uh, Ms. Farida has connectivity issue. So, uh, Dr. Kurat, you can take start until she uh, will come back after this. I think uh, both of them have some uh, internet issue. So um, until they come back, we can start our uh, question answer session. So you may ask the questions on the panelist discussion and the one research article which was presented by uh, Dr. Neelam. If anyone has question, you can please ask, uh, ask us. Okay, uh, in the chat box, I have seen one question. Uh, like there, uh, uh, there's a uh, somebody has texted a question: Why teacher education is not in right direction in Pakistan? So I request to the panelist, uh, can you respond to this question? I repeat the question: Why teacher education is not is in is not in right direction in Pakistan? Uh, Doctor Fozia. Or uh, I request to Dr. Rahmatullah Bhatti kindly respond to, to this question. As I have presented in my discussion, if we see the perspective of teacher education in Pakistan, we are moving in right directions. Have a look on our programs at the time of emergence of Pakistan, and there are some reforms in our education policy. And as you see, in current education policy, we have even focused on early childhood education also. All the areas which were being ignored, they are being included. And we also have, uh, as I may talk about our university programs, and I am founding coordinator of all weird programs in Islamic Growth University, we have developed keeping in view the global challenges as well as our national context. Therefore, we are moving, I think, in right direction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, there is a question, uh, Dr. Fozia said that uh, we have to transform information to knowledge. Uh, I will try, uh, like to move forward to Dr. Maureen uh, Manning to respond to this question that how can we move uh, from knowledge toward learning? Dr. Maureen, do you uh, hear me? Can you, can you repeat that, please? Dr. Fauzi has said that there is need to move transformation into knowledge. 
uh, my question is that how can we, can we move forward from knowledge to learning? I believe a lot of that has to do with the co-creation of knowledge. What is knowledge? How do we co-create together? And then how do we apply that into the settings in which we work or teach? Um, so that has also, I think, um, that concerns pedagogy and how we are offering up this content, this knowledge. Are we, again, I mentioned in my presentation, is it sage on the stage, which is you know, strictly lecture style, or is it more of an authentic learning, a co-creation of this knowledge in which we are a, a learning community, a knowledge community where we're building that knowledge that's based on our backgrounds as a reflection of who we are and all that we bring to the table as learners, whether we are lifelong learners and educators and uh, the facilitators of the dis this discussion or rather newer learners uh, who are new to the table. Everyone comes with that, that diverse background. How do we build this knowledge together? And then the second piece of that is how are we applying that to our environments and who we work with as our learners. Mr. Tahir Vahabhusar, if you allow me, I would like to add something in knowledge into that. Yeah, why not? Sure, sir. Sure. According to my understanding, when a student gets ownership of knowledge, it becomes learning. As such, if he has acquired or gained information and not reconstructed according to his own experiences, it is just knowledge. When it becomes his or her ownership of that knowledge, it becomes learning. And students become able to apply it in his or her life. And the application stage decide he or she has learned or not. If he has not learned, he cannot apply. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to both the worthy panelists, Dr. Mori and Manning. That is what I said that uh, uh, we need to transform our, our assessment also. Our assessment is just focusing on the rote memorization and um, like we okay, are. Uh, if anybody have, uh, uh, like that. has any other question, you can ask us. Or you can write in the uh, you can write in the uh, chat box. I want to add one thing. If there is no question, like uh, Kosia said that we have to transform the assessment procedures. So I will uh, say that we have to focus on the three aspects of assessment: assessment mm -hmm. of learning, assessment Not as learning, and assessment for learning. Then we can transform these things into the student's life and into the uh, uh, daily uh, daily life application. Thank you. Chat box. Uh, Ms. Nadia has mentioned two questions in the question answer tab. And uh, I would like to comment a bit on it. First yeah. one is about public private partnership. And she's asking that can a person be changed as in? Yes, I, I feel that a person can be a change agent in his or her own capacity. Because if I am working and I am working deliberately for the transformation um, in my own context, I would be successful, hopefully. But uh, the collective effort obviously would be better uh, a lot more than that. But just thinking that uh, I, as an individual, what I can do, um, it would be of no worth um, and I shouldn't do, do it. So I shouldn't be left behind. I should be moving forward. I should be motivating myself and motivating others for that. Because if uh, the uh, organization and institutions are not taking uh, those much steps, then as individuals, we can take. And yes, we can go for the public-private partnership also. Um, I have mentioned the collaborations and partnerships in my presentation that um, when we would be discussing it with, uh, with others, when we would be collaborating, then um, the things would be uh, easier to move forward. And the second so question she has uh, about the cultural challenges. Um, yes, we can um, cater for the cultural challenges also, like dealing with the diversity includes the cultural differences also. So when uh, we focus on dealing with that diverse uh, um, 
individuals that include the cultural differences uh, differences in the learning styles or intelligence then there are different strategies of uh, uh, dealing with those uh, strategies and that has to be addressed properly in the teacher um, education institutions because uh, when the teachers go to the institutions for job they are not those much uh, capable of uh, dealing with these diversity and cultural challenges thank you so much uh, dr fozia and dr uh, zarina for your detailed answers uh, i think ms farida is back ms farida quickly start your uh, presentation hey, assalam alaikum and good afternoon to all our respected teachers and fellows and other participants and now i am presenting uh, my uh, and uh, thanks for giving the opportunity uh, to present my mini presentation or mini article which i am presenting here let me okay the presentation topic is teacher professional development and students performance in on in open classroom climate between islamabad and quetta uh, city uh, the outline of my presentation is definitely it is uh, it is all um, all uh, on the uh, it is all concerned with the research paper and the introduction of open classrooms uh, uh, it is uh, a teacher um, and this is the way we are teacher want to see other teachers in action and focus on uh, open classroom open classroom is uh, 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 classrooms is on teacher behavior and the open classrooms and the strengths of uh, this uh, it is a site uh, site based or site expertise model and informal uh, model where teachers take uh, take action on the research and the general objective of this uh, uh, presentation is uh, sorry i am not wait okay the general objective of my presentation is to to probe the uh, to probe the professional development of teaching and uh, teacher performance of to the student informally in open classroom climate and in between the two cities and the uh, specific objective which i have taken for my study that was to investigate the relationship between teacher professional development and student performance in an, uh, in an open classrooms and to examine the compare uh, the comparison of teacher professional development of student performance in open classroom between two cities so here is the uh, two um, uh, the the two objectives which which where we uh, where i want to investigate the relationship and the difference between two Uh, things okay the problem statement definitely or indeed in pakistan teacher professional development is not equal uh, not equal in a, in a uh, culture or uh, every uh, every province and city has their own culture their own uh, values norms and objective objectives and knowledge pedagogical knowledge and the teacher self um, uh, self efficacy so uh, because of this the uh, because of this therefore the uh, point of uh, interest was to investigate the level of teacher Uh, to investigate the level of teacher professional development and student open classroom climate and uh, it was uh, 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 the problem statement was this okay now coming to the hypothesis okay hypothesis of my study was there, uh, there is no significant relationship between teacher professional development of student performance and the second was there is no significant difference so these both were these both were the uh, uh, was the Uh, um, the assumptions and the significance of the study was it is it is uh, it is regard to pakistan uh, present study hold exceptional significance to examine the impact of teacher and professional development uh, of student performance in an open classroom uh, climate and the second was find the finding of this research will be outstanding um, because of edu educational uh, because of educational okay and this study is is significant in a number of ways to help the to help the suggestions and uh, and of bringing teacher professional development it will be a valuable valuable addition uh, for the literature review and academic performance in a, in a relation 
uh, teacher quality of teaching and this study will be lead uh, to teacher in a knowledge and issues at the first step and it can be lead the solution as such as the study provides to 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 scope valuable regarding to the topic of future okay now uh, coming to the uh, limitation of the research it is limited to the uh, it is it was um, this uh, study was limited to the time span and a small area was covered in this uh, topic uh, um, because it cannot break it, uh, it it cannot predict the self efficacy and achievement of, uh, of the other areas and not uh, no longitudinal um, uh, design was used uh, because of the um, because of the time span and uh, during the period of pandemic uh, lockdown situation it was carried out um, it it was carried out, out the verbal like uh, like uh, closing of educational institution and uh, fear of pandemic uh, might be uh, might be the reason of uh, alternate and the result from uh, from in a cardinal uh, situation and uh, then the theoretical framework uh, theoretical framework of this study was uh, i have uh, divided this study um, uh, this study study in uh, two uh, in uh, in a comparison of uh, two things one was teacher professional development which is affecting the teacher student performance and the student achievement and uh, when coming to the uh, to the literature review literature review uh, uh, literature review related to this topic i have studied uh, oecd uh, 2010 uh, um, uh, 2010 and uh, one uh, also uh, the pre service education of teacher has uh, shown the teacher uh, with better uh, comprehensive uh, com com uh, comprehensive preparation and participation of more likely to feel better and appear in more efficient teaching methods that was from key 2012 and the professional development from icce uh, is also uh, investigated or uh, or reviewed uh, for, for the purpose of this study and uh, uh, including uh, including uh, civic and citizenship education that was also for the purpose of this study I, it was also reviewed for this uh, and uh, to the, uh, pro, in 2015 and 2017 oecd report was also included in this review uh, review of study the methodology uh, of Sarita, study, yes, excuse me yes uh, sorry uh, for uh, interrupting you uh, so i request you please come on friday because uh, we also have another session to uh, start so please come on the friday friday Okay, coming to the finding. Uh, so my my research uh, my research was between uh, between two uh, colleges, and I have taken uh, forty students uh, as a sample, and the sample and sampling sizes was also uh, through a research um, uh, techniques that was validated and pilot tested reliability instrumentation and data collection was uh, also that all uh, that was also included in this uh, topic. And uh, when I made on the analyze my topic with the, uh, with these the uh, two. To check out the uh, to check out the significance level for significance okay. level I have uh, taken 0 0.05 uh, the significance uh, alpha level for this uh, and uh, uh, after this uh, analyzation uh, here is uh, here is 0.483 which is uh, which, which is significant and uh, and the second uh, uh, the second significant uh, was and the second um, uh, assumption was which i have taken for this it was also significant uh, significant the value of this and uh, uh, ms prita what were your major findings the major finding your major findings the major findings was uh, that uh, the major findings was, was that uh, case, uh, okay um, in table one it showed it shows that the relationship between teacher professional development of and student performance and finding revealed that performance of uh, positive or positively correlated with the level of teacher professional development so it was found that the, the teacher professional development must be enhanced to increase the performance of uh, of student and in addition the study describes the difference of uh, teacher professional development student performance with the capital city uh, and quota and the result of the study indicates that the level of professional development among, uh, among teachers and students performance was reported higher in capital city islamabad as compared to uh, city quota and uh, the uh, conclusion is also the same uh, the same things uh, i also 
not very same, but the, uh, coming to the practical implication, practical implication for my study that uh, the study uh, geographically uh, was geogra ge geographically broad and sample derived from the two different uh, cities of Pakistan and the, uh, and the study will help to assess the higher development related to student performance between two cities recommended for the further research. Okay, for the further research, uh, it should be carried out on a large scale. Uh, Thank you, uh, Madam Ms. Muzaffar. I will request Dr. Ramatullah Bhatti to very briefly uh, conclude the session. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am very obliged and pleased to conclude this session. First of all, this session was inaugurated by Dr. Jumani. We focused on the role of professional standards and IT. Then the second panelist was Dr. Maureen Manning. We also focused on quality of teacher education in international perspective. And Dr. Zarina very comprehensively discussed the challenges of COVID-19 and particularly he focused on unawareness of teachers and students about technology and focused on how we can arrange teaching practices for teachers in this scenario. And at the end, Dr. Fauzia compared very comprehensively teacher education programs in the 20th and 21st century and highlighted the main resilient features of the 21st century. And at the end, there were our two young scholars, Dr. Nilam Nawaz and uh, Madam Farida Yasin Ray, the young scholars, very comprehensively touched the very interesting, important topics, classroom, open classroom, and uh, studying the how students and why students choose teaching profession. And I congratulate these students, and I am thankful to panelists who participated and comprehensively give their opinion about academic education. Thank you. Dr. Saab, thanks a lot. Uh, I am very sorry that uh, due to time constraint, we couldn't listen in detail the uh, presenter. Uh, I would like to acknowledge and appreciate the presence of session chair, worthy panelists, and participants for their active participation sharing their valuable thoughts and spending their precious time. Your contribution will come with valuable outcomes in the coming days. I pay my extended gratitude to all the distinguished speakers on behalf of Director and Secretary FT. A thank to all the presenters, distinguished scholars, and the worthy panelists. Thank you very much. In the name of Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful, Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, and greeting to all participants around the world. We welcome all in the session theme, STEM and STEAM education in two-day first international conference 2021. Global academia during and post COVID-19. I, Sayyida Kaukar, Assistant Professor Chemistry, and Dr. Shahzad Ahmad, Assistant Professor Mathematics, will be the moderators of this session. Objective of this sessions are to provide awareness about the concept of STEM and STEAM education, to highlight the current trends in STEM and STEAM education, role of single national curriculum for science subject. Dr. Nasser Mahmood for a brief talk. Title of the talk is concept of STEM education. Uh, Professor Dr. Nasser Mahmood name is the prominent figure in the field of education at national and international level. Currently, he is working with Allama Iqbal Open University Islamabad as professor and dean faculty of education. Thank you, sir, for joining our session. 
word was sir my 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 player ji my player bismillah rahman rahim uh, good afternoon to everyone who has joined us from pakistan and abroad uh, I, i hope there are few people with us from abroad as well so we we'll preferably keep our conversation in english uh, i'm privileged to have this opportunity to to share with you my understanding uh, about stem education and later on with an amendment like steam education the concept of it has changed so primarily i'll be focusing on the two three aspects of it just to provide you and all of my listeners here with a platform on on which we can uh, keep our discussion moving ahead in coming uh, presentations as well science education first thing then we'll talk about what is this concept of stem science education in pakistan's perspective how we dealt with science education in this country uh, in last 5 7 6 7, 7 decades since our independence then i'll try to connect this talk to to the concept of stem in its essence how the concept was envisioned and then whether we are able to uh, move ourselves toward it or not conceptually and practically from both aspects and then we will see that the need of it if we are trying to shift towards it in the context of our commitment to this uh, uh, sdgs sustainable development goals the very widely heard 21st century skills nowadays and then we'll come to this single national curriculum so we'll be talking in the backdrop of these three things see our commitment to the world in the form of sdgs 21st century skills which which the world assumes as the basis of economy or the basis of economic growth uh, as a kind of human resource we need in order to move towards that economic growth so are we doing it or how can the stem concept can help us and then obviously as i said how far our single national curriculum the idea of that uh, has been successful in transforming ourselves from this so just just starting from this uh, with a brief overview of what science education uh, how the way science education has been dealt in this country we we put a lot of emphasis a lot of importance on science education in the country as long as our documents are concerned as long as our rhetoric is concerned but it's quite unfortunate to see that there is no science education policy till till now as a part of our education policy we have addressed the topic in the very late, in very late after our independence and then even when we addressed it we treated it like education general education or all other ways the, the way in which we teach all of the subjects we took it almost in the same way with an exception of adding practical work to the to the science science education policy does not does not merely means that how we will be teaching science it is about conceptualizing the way the kind of outcome or the kind of graduates we want to have from these classes and directly linking it to the to the progress of the country directly linking it to the higher education so if we look at it from curriculum pedagogy and assessments point of view we in our curriculum we modified the content over time which we wanted to teach from time to time and we we updated it the way we want the way we thought it is suitable for us and we did it with every curriculum revision and same is the case with the single national curriculum we have revised it again and that has brought some improvements in the quality of content we given to it as far as pedagogy is concerned we very rarely to my understanding we very rarely focused on on emphasizing or enabling our teachers to use the pedagogies which are specifically associated to the teaching of science 
we train teacher in all those general pedagogies which are used to teach any other subject like english urdu physics english urdu and um, um, uh, park studies and so on we use the same pedagogies we thought will be good or will be useful in teaching science except using certain names like discovery teaching like uh, inquiry based method like questioning technique we use their names and if we look at the training manuals we developed and the the lines on which we trained our teacher in the last 4 5 decades our trainings rarely include anything specific on it so we we obviously lack teachers who are good at using these methodologies in teaching and then when the world moved toward with this with this uh, environment in the country our schools are rarely equipped with environment which is required to teach science for example laboratories are all ill equipped we know that before that in our early grades like grade 1 to 5 we we teach science as as we teach islamiyat as a textbook open the book reading is the primary method in most of the places in our schools where people where students used to read the text from the book and then teacher explains it and they memorize it or remember it this does not help us in any way in learning science or either developing scientific attitude in our student this is helping in none of these ways to us so on the other hand laboratories as i said are either uh, not available if they are available they are not equipped if they are equipped to some extent then not our trained staff is not available to to help our students and teachers to learn uh, those things so there are so many deficiencies we have been across in my understanding across the years we have facing with then at this particular juncture with this environment at hand we re- we came to know about this concept of stem which primarily talks about um, teaching science mathematics engineering and these together now when we when people talk about this science technology engineering mathematics all grouped in one 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 thing we assume that this is a kind of uh, uh, technique which is come to in fact it is simply the idea behind is to develop a curriculum of science which involves the concepts given in all these subjects to be studied in an integrated manner in order to help us to make it relevant to life relevant to uh, our daily practices it's not like a combination of four subjects to be taught stand alone i mean it does not mean that we'll be teaching our students subject of science then a technology then engineering then mathematics generally in schools we teach science and mathematics and the component of technology and engineering to my understanding is the an idea which we to which through which we connect the daily life problem to the uh, to the con- to the subject of science and mathematics and that will be taught in a way where that learning this this kind of combination can directly help our students to to resolve their daily life issues the challenges which we which we face in that and i have been th- when i was preparing for this so i went uh, went across a survey which tells us that if they asked to more than 100 people in different parts of the pakistan about their the science teachers about their idea their concept of stem and the ideas are as varied as is the number of people number of science teachers they surveyed everyone takes it in its own way which primarily does not resemble to the idea floated by the people who talked about stem they all take it as something for combination of four things four stand alone things put together in order to make it like a scheme of studies in fact it's not like a scheme of study it is like a concept in which science and mathematics is to be taught and science and mathematics to be taught using the the problems which we face in our daily life they connect to technology they connect to our processes of solving problem and then 
we use those techniques in order to resolve our, our daily issues. So with this idea, we need to assess that if we agree to it, then whether our schools, our science teachers, and our policy, obviously first place, are they in line with this concept of STEM? So my straight answer to this will be no. We use this word frequently, but if we look at our preparation, our preparation and our line of working does not uh, coincide at any point with this concept of STEM. Now we are trying to make activity-based books. This is the first step which we probably took towards uh, this idea. In this single national curriculum, we claim that our books are more interactive, uh, science books particularly, are more interactive and they offer more space for students to think, to innovate, to collaborate. Now, it is yet to be seen that how well it works for us because they, they are just being implemented in grade one to five from this year. But I'm afraid only books will not help us. Only having such books, even if they are well-written, that will not help us unless we support this or our governments support our organizations or schools with proper environment. By environment, I mean the labor if laboratories are required, if experimental spaces are required, if play areas are required for that, they are equipped properly with that. And then we have teachers who are trained to do this. And by training here, I does not mean knowing to use methodologies by having a mindset which is required for this kind of education. We haven't invested on it yet. So with, with all this in mind, I suppose okay, this is not going to help us the way we are actually expecting from it. When it gets to connecting it to 21st century skills, the people very clearly say in 21st century skills, and I'll name just few of them, like being creative, being innovative, having ability to collaborate with others, being able to critique something. These are some of the skills out of a long list of 21st century skills. Now, our students, if, they, if we expect them to have these skills because we believe that in coming age, in coming years, only those nations can survive in which the, the people have this kind of set of skills with them. Our school environment, particularly at the moment, is not supportive of the further development of any one of these skills. So in absence of that, in absence of the, of the environment or facilities, in absence of the teachers who have skill to do that, I think it's, a, it's a quite a large an ask from the teachers that we will be able to produce some, something like this, the graduates of science uh, who are able to have all these skills. So if we are serious with it, I would say many, many of uh, those who matter in this regard are with us, in, at least from the Federal Directorate of Education. We expect that if this is to be implemented, if we really agree to this idea of STEM, rather, scheme ki baat abhi maine nahi ki, because we, uh, the, the part of arts means the, the life part of it to be added to it. But at least if we talk about STEM only, even then, our directorates does not have to ensure the availability of book only, in, but in, in addition to that, we should manage schools where bottom line facilities and trained teachers are available for that. And then there needs to be a continuous way of monitoring the progress of students to assessment while a component and otherwise we'll never be able to keep record of what is happening and what is not happening. So, the, the, the dream, I would conclude it here by saying that the, game, the dream of moving towards a science education, which directly helps people in improving their lives in, and directly helps students to acquire skills to make their lives better is a very good idea. And that 
without this we will not be able to to progress as community but just by aspiring it to happen it will not happen we need a, a planning which needs to go beyond preparation of documents beyond preparation of curriculum and it must address other issues that i as i said provision of facilities laboratories kind of activities which which help student to do that and which helps students to learn these 21st century skills if all this is to be arranged as a package and we start reforming it from grade 1 from students of primary school and then gradually take it up to the to the to the upper grades in only by using that technique we'll be able to accomplish it at least in coming 10 12 years we'll start moving towards it there's there's nothing like that we think about it today and tomorrow it will happen if we if we make our directions correct today and continue with it for coming 10 years only then we'll be able to see the see the change the kind of change we are looking at so i'll, I'll close my talk here i'll close my points which i wanted to make now one last thing stem education at the moment in pakistan i could find only 3 to 4 documents which explains which talk about stem status of stem education in pakistan the most tangible thing i found in all those is there is a department of uh, teacher education in stem in university of education and that which is tangibly present i don't know what they are doing but at least they have something other than that i couldn't find anything more than a wish list on all those documents which i found uh, in order to know about the state just i could not but the camera on the thank you very much i'll stop here uh, if you have any comments or anything you want to add so give it for your and valuable talk on the topic of concept of stem education thank you sir Okay, so reading i would like by prashazad over to you sir thank you everybody for joining our session me here dr shahzad ahmed assistant professor federal college of education h9 islamabad this session is about stem and steam education stem is an integrated teaching approach within the general science curriculum to purposefully connect science with the real world the goal of the stem approach is to develop a holistic understanding of science by engaging students in authentic real world application of science once meaningfully integrated with other disciplines like technology mathematics engineering this purposefully integrated stem experience prepares student for the 21st century career pathways now i start the paper presentation session with the permission of our distinguished panelists it's our pleasure that dr mohammad mubashshir dogar dr mohammad tanveer afsal dr farhanda rashid choudhury and ms sidra jawad are panelists for this session
before the actual start of paper presentation, I like to share. If you have any question, please raise your hand or you can type your question in the chat box, but don't miss to write the name of panelists to whom you are going to ask your question. Our first presenter is Ms. Sidra Iftakhar from Alama Iqbal Open University, Islamabad. She will present her research talk on the topic, special cognition and learners readiness towards STEM in post pandemic. Over to Ms. Sidra Iftakhar. Uh, I am Sidra Iftakhar from AIOU. Uh, first of all, uh, I am very thankful uh, for this platform, uh, Federal College of Education, Islamabad, uh, to appreciate my uh, participation in the conference. Uh, I am here to present a research paper entitled Spatial Cognition and Learners Readiness Towards STEM in Post Pandemic. Assalamu alaikum. I am Sidra F. Kushnoot from Alama Iqbal Open University, Islamabad. I am presenting for Federal College of Education, Islamabad, a research paper entitled Spatial Cognition and Learners Readiness Towards STEM in Post Pandemic in collaboration with my supervisor, Dr. Farhanda Rashid Chaudhary. Here is the abstract which I was uh, submitted here. The introduction, spatial cognition is the mental process to manipulate the visual information, including visualizing objects from multiple perspectives human and problems. basically concerned with the processes of how humans acquire, organize, and use the spatial information, which is readily presented. Spatial cognition is an important component for predicting success in STEM. Spatial cognition enables to organize, reason about, and help to make sense of information regarding imagined space as well as the real. Spatial cognition influences the learner's readiness towards STEM course. Problem statement. According to the literature, many longitudinal studies um, demonstrated that spatial cognition is strongly related to students' entrance in uh, entrance and success into STEM disciplines. Here, the STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The pandemic outbreak forcibly transformed the way students were learning, which may affect the readiness of our learners towards STEM in post-pandemic situation. The sudden and abrupt change in teaching and learning during pandemic may affect the special cognition of the learners due to the change in instructional medium. Therefore, this study was fo focused on presenting the current view of special cognition and readiness of learners towards STEM subjects. But in the context of Pakistan, special cognition was not widely focused yet for entrance into STEM subjects. Here is the li some literature review which I used to uh, gather the information uh, for my research article. Shazad, she is not audible. Can you resolve her issue?
composed of 100 science students. However, the data was collected. Okay, actually we have recorded version of last presentation and due to some connectivity issue, it's not properly uh, played and that's why uh, we have to move forward. Okay. Thank you Mira, for being a part of this session. Uh, now I'd like to invite and introduce Dr. Mohammad Mubashar Dogar. He will share his remarks on this presentation. He is a prominent figure in the field of scientific research, especially climate change and environmental sciences. He is currently serving as a senior scientist at the Global Change Impact Studies Center, Ministry of Climate Change, Government of Pakistan. Thank you, sir, for joining our session. Over to Dr. Mohammad Mubashir Dogar. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for me to be part of the STEM session. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. I especially thank to Professor Dr. Samia Dogar and her colleagues for organizing such a wonderful event. Many congratulations to the management of Federal College of Education for this greatest effort. Uh, I would like to emphasize here that as you introduced, I have participated and worked in renowned top-ranked institutes of the world. I could mention some of the names like New York University in the United States, Cornell University, University of Arizona in the United States, University of Helsinki in Finland, International Center for Theoretical Physics in Italy, and many others like Hokkaido University in Japan. So uh, as far as this topic is concerned, a special cognition plays an essential role in every everyday functioning and provides us a foundation for successful performance in scientific and technological fields. This type of research uh, is very important to find out the readiness of our young brains towards STEM education. And this type of uh, research would help us to emphasize the weak areas in learning and would urge the STEM teachers to do, to do their best to help the students towards effective scientific learning. So I have uh, noted some of the points in this uh, research. Uh, she has presented uh, this research in a very good manner. And uh, as far as the scientific aspect of this research is concerned, I have noticed that there are many other factors that need to be included in this research. Like uh, I have uh, just listed few of the points or the factors that could enhance the, uh, the effectiveness of this study, like physical and men mental health of the STEM student. A healthy eating and exercising habits will result towards a healthy mind and a healthy mind will lead towards healthy learning environment. I feel while choosing the samples that she has uh, taken about 100 uh, samples from Islamabad and included uh, her conclusions based on these uh, 100 uh, research students. So I think she should also consider uh, the, the effective and healthy minds and also should include the, the physical condition of the students. Like if she has taken all the students which are healthy and they have healthy minds, definitely they will have uh, effective uh, learning and understanding ability towards STEM education. And they will have definitely the, uh, this uh, spatial cognition very well. And secondly, the environment and the uh, conditions, 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 conditions uh, uh, the STEM uh, field and the learning of the students, uh, especially the spatial cognition. So the environment also depends uh, very much and the climate change uh, also uh, could affect the learning environment of the students. And the third point that I, I could mention is the student and teacher relationship.
can you hear me hello hello dr shahzad can you hear me it's okay now dr mubashir carry on okay 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 so i was mentioning about the student and teacher relationship a very good relationship is required uh, between the student and the teacher because uh, if the relationship between student and teacher is not good the student cannot ask the questions uh, for effective learning and definitely his uh, learning towards these science subjects uh, these stem subjects will will get affected a lot so we need to include in this study this kind of factors and i would also like to mention the the role of uh, uh, parents uh, in this uh, stem learning because the parents could also uh, give a effective role towards this stem learning education so all these factors need to be included in this study anyhow finally i would like to emphasize that it's a wonderful study where uh, many salient features of uh, spatial cognition uh, and stem learning during covid-19 pandemic are addressed and they are addressed quite nicely and i i am impressed that our researchers and educationists are doing a very good job <laughs> so in this research it was recommended that the science curriculum should be designed in such a way that incorporates spatial cognition skills among students so keeping in mind all the factors that i mentioned like the healthy minds healthy uh, eating habits student teacher relationships and the parents role they all need to be addressed uh, while doing this kind of study so that we could have the effective results that need uh, to be implemented and the policy could be made at uh, national curriculum level for uh, teaching as well as for studying these kind of uh, stem subjects so thank you very much once again for having me here and these are my remarks okay sir well said uh, thanks for highlighting areas that need to be improved thank you sir for uh, your precious time and for sharing valuable information and knowledge thank you Okay, our next second presenter is Mr. Masoud Ahmed from Alama Iqbal Open University, Islamabad. He will present his research talk on the topic, a study of integrated science process skills of secondary school students. Over to Mr. Masoud Ahmed. and today i am going to present a study of the integrative science process skills of secondary school students <clears throat> this is the outline of my presentation uh, when we talk about science process skills the first things come in our mind that we are living in 21st centuries and we should have 21st century skills and for the success of uh, learner uh, learner should have should develop such skills science process skills are basis for scientific thinking and research when the student understand the science process skills science becomes more interesting to them uh, the national curriculum 2006 also also demanded that uh the learner uh, should have uh, skills which are necessary for scientific process a person can only be scientifically literate if he have integrated science process skills uh we have different education system in pakistan public school system and private school system the performance of private school system is better as compared to the performance of the public school system this better performance uh, whereas the public school system has greater physical facilities in spite of greater physical facilities the public school system's performance was poor so in this study we actually uh, we have explored the reason behind the poor performance of the public school system we have go through uh, several researches uh, due to shortage of time i am skipping them 
the objective of my research study was to compare the performance of public and private school physics students in integrated science process skills at higher secondary school certificate level. Uh, we were tested three hypotheses in this study. The first hypothesis was related to formulating hypothesis skill. And the second hypothesis was related to controlling variable skill. And the third one was related to interpreting data skill. In this study, we used causal comparative research design. And we have examined the effect of school type on mastery of integrated science process skills of physics students at higher secondary school certificate level. The population of the study was male grade 12 physics students of pre-engineering and pre-medical group of public and private sector colleges of city Rawalpindi. We have used purposive sampling technique for the selection of two top level colleges of city Rawalpindi. One was selected from public sector and other one was selected from the private sector. So the sample of study was 60 students 30 students from Government College Askar Mal Rawalpindi and 30 students from Kips College Chandni Chok Rawalpindi of City Rawalpindi. We have selected four experiments in this research study and these experiments were selected by analyzing the experiments of the National Curricula 2006 of grade 11 and 12 and we have selected those experiments in which integrated science process skills were present. After selection of experiments, we have developed two research instruments for data collection. The first instrument was observation sheets. And the second instrument was worksheets. Um, Observation sheet consists of items related to the integrated science process skills. Reliability of the observation sheet was uh, calculated by using Cronbeck Alpha and its value is 0 0.73 and so on. So, so the observation sheet was reliable. We have also validated the observation sheet. We have developed worksheet in three different phases and the reliability of the worksheet show, the result shows that the worksheet was also reliable. We, uh, we interpret our result by using the criteria given here. Uh, this is the first result of the formulating hypothesis skill. This result shows that the students perform the private school students performance was better as compared to public school students performance as the mean score for private school is 2.92 and it was 1.84 for public school the significant value the significant two tail value shows that there is a significant difference exists in terms of formulating hypothesis skill between the public and private school students so null hypothesis was rejected this is the result for controlling variable skill. And this result also shows that the private school students performance was better as compared to the public school students. And P value shows that the null hypothesis was rejected. This is the result for interpreting data skill. And this result shows there is no difference in interpreting data skill level. Both public and private school students performance was equal but it was noticed that performance of both public and private school students was very poor in interpreting data skills this is the visual representation of the uh, uh, comparison of public and private school students and it also shows that private school students performance was better as compared to public school students performance uh, on this study, we have concluded that there is a statistical difference exists between public and private school physics student performance in formulating hypothesis skills and controlling variable skills. Uh, student performance was uh, low in interpreting data skills and formulating hypothesis skills. This was 
maybe due to the reason that the students uh, have uh, less uh, conceptual understanding of the formulating hypothesis. This is the uh, summary of the conclusion. Formulating hypothesis skill level of performance was low for formulating hypothesis skill and for controlling variable skill, student skill level of performance was fair. For interpreting data skill, student skill level of performance was low. Uh, on the basis of this study, we recommended that teachers should use should should not only rely on books for creativity. They must involve students in experimental process by conducting experiments in laboratory. Teachers should give more attention to develop integrated science process skills in students so that their reasoning, evaluating, and problem solving abilities in hand. Teachers should give attention to build in their student graphical analysis skills. Thank you for this Okay, thank you, Mr. Masoud Ahmed, for being a part of this session. Now I'd like to invite and introduce Dr. Mohammed Tanvir Afzal. He will share his remarks on this presentation. Uh, he is an educationist and currently he is working with Alama Iqbal Open University Islamabad as assistant professor quality of education. Thank you, sir, for joining our session. Over to Dr. Mohammed Tanvir Afsal. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shazad and your team, uh, Kokab, because uh, you have provided me opportunity to conclude this one and be a part of this particular session. It's a great opportunity, which has, uh, uh, and also I can want to congratulate you that uh, during this pandemic, you have. Uh, created such a such a uh, environment that the people are there and they are going to discuss these things which are which are very important for our education and this is the great initiative uh, of fce <coughs> federal college of education regarding um, this presentation i am going to focus on the integrated skill the masood has presented the case whether the integrated skills the students of public sector or private sector, whichever, uh, who are a better in uh, integrated skill. But our case is, uh, I appreciate Masood uh, for presenting uh, this particular topic and he has worked on it. But the case is uh, a bit behind we have to go. When we are moving for, from STEM to STEAM, this is actually the thing that whether the integrated skill or we can say that 21st century skills that uh, 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 problem solving, creativity, critical thinking, innovation, whether we have in, induced, in, uh, introduced this in the, in the science education, we want to, our purpose is to develop the scientists. And when we, we are developing the scientists, we are only focusing on the product, that how, may, how much marks they have got, how much uh, score they have got, and we are focusing on the summative assessment and the skills which, which uh, the students are getting. But we are not focusing upon the skills, which are the soft skills, which are compulsory for our scientists, because when you are going to observe the phenomena, because what is the science? Science is our nature. And we have to observe our nature and then critically think of, on it. Then you are going to formulate the hypothesis and you are testing those ones. Therefore, it's compulsory for the uh, teacher educators and particularly the teacher educators of science education, that they, they should focus on these particular skills, which uh, uh, Masood has highlighted, the integrated skills, so that we may develop those skills in our, in our young generation. If we are not, because these are the skills which normally the students are getting from, from their context, from their home environment, but these are not being taught into the schools, into the colleges. Therefore, we have to integrate those skills into, into our curriculum. And then we have to focus that. When I say into the curriculum, we should give up some weightage to it because we, we, are, we are conducting the assessments, end term access, assessment, um, although I, I'm, I'm not agreeing with it because our education is a process. It's not a product. So we have to focus on that process that 
during that process with what the activities which we are doing giving assigning to our students what the challenges which we are putting to our students then we are going to develop that uh, those skills in them therefore uh, i would like to say that it's uh, it's a very good uh, research which uh, the masood has conducted but the important thing is that how we have to integrate these integrated skills into our curriculum and whether there we have we have thought about it and whether there is a plan in the next 10 years that we are going to integrate those and if this is this is definite that if we are not going to do this one we will we will lag behind because always it depends upon that what you are doing you will you will you will be at the fruit of that so uh, that's all from me uh, and i congratulate masood for presenting this research thank you sir well said if anybody have any question dr mohammad tanveer afsal is here with us you can share your question okay sir i have one question what may be the reason uh, between public and private sector keeping in mind the integrated science process skills with reference to this study as mr masood have mentioned that uh, mean score of public uh, sector is less than private sector uh, shahzad it's a, it's a very important thing that uh, we are having uh, in the public sector we are we are having less although we are having more resources but we are having less activities to perform uh when when you are performing the co curricular activities because these are the skills which are being developed uh, outside the textbook outside your normal curriculum so it these are the co curricular activities so in i what I, i have observed uh, that in 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 that area in uh, the private sector we are having the more activities which, which will which are uh, uh, that they are enabled to develop those skills into the public sector although we are having more resources we are having uh, in the in the uh, uh, pu public sector sorry in the private sector they are developing more activity and in the public sector we are having more more resources but our teachers are reluctant to conduct those uh, those kind of activities so as a teacher we are giving less time to our students for the development of those integrated skills that might be a one reason here well said sir thank you sir for sparing your time and sharing your thoughts uh, we have shortage of time and quickly move for the next presentation our third presenter is mr masood ahmed from alama iqbal open university islamabad he will present his research talk on the topic analysis of single national curriculum for science with respect to national curriculum of science 2006 similarities differences and innovation over to mr masood ahmed uh, the title of my second research study is analysis of single national curriculum for science with respect to national curriculum of science 2006 similarity differences and innovation as i said earlier in pakistan different system of education are working and each system of education has its own curriculum uh if uh, same is the case with all provinces uh, each province has its its own course work and this this uh, this uh, these different system of educations um uh, create disparities in the mind of the students the present government has taken an initiative to develop a single national curriculum for unification of education system uh, the vision of the single national curriculum is to have one system of education for all in terms of curriculum medium of instruction and assessment and 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 to provide fair and equal opportunity to receive high quality education before single national curriculum uh, national curriculum 2006 was implemented in um, 
in national education system but uh, but it was implemented only in public schools now the single national curriculum uh, uh, the at primary level has been developed and it it is implemented in um, uh, in national uh, in school education department finding of uh, rind and mogal 2020 uh, in a research study that the national curriculum 2006 was not uh, uh, implemented properly was not implemented properly and uh, it just uh, focused on the transfer of knowledge and ignored the conceptual understandings uh, so why we uh, why we have a need of this single national curriculum actually curriculum development is not a static process but change changes with needs of the society uh, the single uh, in in this study we have explored whether the single national curricul curriculum uh, has changes as compared to national curriculum for science 2006 so the objective of this study was uh, so the purpose of this study wa was to analyze the two curricula elements two curricula documents ncs 2006 and snc as 2021 so that similarities differences and innovation can be determined Uh, in this study uh, we have used document analysis method mixed method research design was employed quantitative and qualitative data qualitative and qualitative data were collected during the analysis of the document analysis was made on seven aspects of the single national curriculum and national curriculum 2006 uh, we have focused on content strengths uh, content standards benchmarks students learning outcomes skills and attitude and science technology engineering and mathematics uh, the taxonomical examination of slo was carried out to see the difference of the two curricula five educational experts were involved in taxonomical examination and the cognitive level of slo was decided by the mutual consensus of the experts this is the overview of the single national curriculum 2021 and national curriculum 2006 and from this we have seen that Almost same distribution is for single national curriculum 2021, national curriculum 2006, except in in the content strand of physical science, in which we have 13 benchmarks for SNCS and seven benchmarks for NCS 2006. This is the grade-wise taxonomical distribution of the learning outcome for NCS 2006, and it shows that comprehension and analysis level, uh, uh, the SL lows, comprehension and analysis level has high weightage, whereas evaluation and synthesis level has very low weightage. SL curriculum for science 2006. This is the grade-wise taxonomical distribution for single national curriculum for science 2021, and we again see that comprehension and analysis level has high weightage in SLO distribution, and evaluation and synthesis have low weightage in distribution. this is the taxonomical comparison of the this is the taxonomical comparison of the two curricula and we have seen that comprehension and in comprehension and ap application level and in synthesis level difference was exist this is the uh, comparison for grade 5 for both curricula and in grade 5 we have seen that for knowledge and application difference was difference was found for knowledge and application uh here is the visual representation of the two curricula um, uh, on the basis of taxonomical analysis 
and we have seen that uh, uh, in, for in, for different domains for comprehension, the percentage of SLOs was greater in SNC, and for uh, for synthesis, the percentage of SLOs was greater in SNC. Whereas in all other levels, the percentage distribution of SLOs was greater in NCS. Uh, we have also st uh, studied the connection of SLOs with science, technology, and society. And it was found that the, uh, the single national curriculum has stronger li link with science and technology, science, technology, and society, whereas national curriculum of science has weaker link with science, technology, and society. We have found different, uh, we have found similarities the, uh, the similarities between the two, cara, two curricula is that in SNC 2021 and NCS 2006 is based on six strands. Both have same six standards. Both curricula emphasis, emphasize that students should use their knowledge and skills to solve the problem of society. Both curricula emphasize the constructive and participatory approach for teaching and learning science. Uh, these are the differences and in innovation. Uh, 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 the major difference was found that no proper, uh, the proper instructional process is missing in NCS, where it was present to some extent in the form of suggestive activities in N SNCS 2021. Uh, on the basis of this study, we have concluded that uh, a, a curriculum is a uh, uh, On the basis of this study, we have concluded that. Uh, from taxonomical examination, it was concluded that no major change was noticed in SLO distribution among the two curricula. Uh, a new sub theme, technology and daily life, was introduced in SNC to promote the skill level of the students. This shows that SNC has greater focus on skill development of the students. Uh, on the basis of this study, we have recommended that. Uh, as curriculum is a writing document, so it must be developed according to the need of this writing. And in 21st century, focus is on skill development, so we should increase the weightage of skill in our coursework. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Masoud Ahmed, for being a part of this session. Now i like to invite and introduce Dr. Farhanda Rashid Chaudhary. She will share her remarks on this presentation. She is an educationist and researcher in the field of education. Currently, she is working with Alama Iqbal Open University, Islamabad, as assistant professor, faculty of education. Thank you, ma'am, for joining our session. Over to Dr. Farhanda Rashid Chaudhary. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Dr. Samia Rehman Dogger and her team for organizing this conference on a significant theme that is global academia during and post um, COVID pandemic. Um, secondly, um, it is very interesting to hear about sub themes on the STEM and STEAM education. Um, as we know that during pandemic, STEM education is mostly affected. Um, as uh, Masood has also shared his uh, findings, that um, he found that uh, students were possessing um, a very little level of um, science process skills, which are very much essential to apprehend the scientific phenomenon. So uh, as we know that during pandemic, students could not have hands-on experiences of science. So there is need to provide an extensive hands-on activities and learning experiences to the children in the post-COVID era so that they can have a clear understanding of the scientific phenomenon. Uh, similarly, uh, the focus of this um, the, uh, this conference is also on the uh, STEAM education. So, uh, because we know that uh, uh, along with the STEM, STEAM is uh, nowadays very much um, popular in the academia, and uh, it is a very new concept because uh, the artistic uh, uh, sense or art, art subjects are being included uh, along with the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So, um, there is need to uh, address this concept, and there is 
need to sensitize the educators about this uh, uh, this concept and its significance because uh, I, I i have experienced um, that most of the uh, science teachers they do not give due uh, weightage to the arts and humanities they are much focused about the scientific phenomenon or science subjects so um, uh, uh, i think that along with the stem steam is also very much significant nowadays Okay, now I would like to give my feedback about the presentation of Mr. Masood Ahmed, uh, which was on the analysis of the single national curriculum for science with respect to national curriculum of science uh, um, 2016. He has presented similarities, differences, and innovations. Um, first of all, I must say that it's a very good analysis. The researcher has focused on the latest change in curricula. As we know that the government of Pakistan has taken an excellent initiative to introduce um, single national curriculum with the vision that there must be one system of education for all. And when we say that one system of education for all, it means that it is in terms of curriculum, it is in terms of medium of instruction, and it is in, in terms of common platform of assessment so that all children have a fair and equal opportunity to receive high quality education, which is obviously the SDG 4. So um, as a single nation curriculum, which is SNC, that is a step in that direction. Uh, so being a science educationist, I have uh, keenly observed the objectives of single nation curriculum regarding science uh, subjects of different grades. For example, it is interesting to note that the concepts of science are present in general knowledge subject um, from grade one to three with a focus on activities, which, which means hands-on activities. Similarly, the general science of grade four to five is having uh, inquiry-based learning, integration of ICT, and integration of STEAM, which is uh, most significant that now SNC, which is single national curriculum, it has focused on STEAM education also. So there are many aspects which can be studied about single nation curriculum since it is in, in, in the development stage. So I must say that the uh, scholar must um, uh, do some research about other aspects of the research. And as far as Masood is concerned, he has presented a good analysis of uh, SNC with respect to um, 2006, which he has considered as the frame of reference uh, to compare with. So um, I'll also suggest uh, to put forward the findings of this study to NCC uh, as the National Curriculum Council Ministry of Federal Education and Provincial Training Government of Pakistan is still working uh, to update and finalize the single national curriculum. So finding of this study will be beneficial for the concerned authorities. And uh, using this platform, I would request uh, Dr. Samia Dogar and the other um, members of uh, her team to um, uh, make a consolidated report about um, uh, the STEM and STEAM education and uh, put forward the recommendation, recommendations to the authorities. Okay, I will also suggest to conduct several other studies to improve the draft of single nation curriculum by taking different variables. Um, as we know that uh, Pakistan contested 14th um, trends in mathematics and science education in, in 2019 and um, among the low middle income countries, Pakistan ranked the second last one. Um, however, Philippines was the worst one. Uh, by the way, the score of Pakistan was um, three 28 and the score of Philippines was 297. And um, surprisingly, Singapore uh, scored high in, um, in, in the team's, um, uh, team study, in team's evaluation with an average score of 625. And not only uh, on the whole, but Singa uh, I was uh, uh, reading the report of the teams, uh, Singapore, the students of Singapore um, of grade four, uh, they scored maximum in mathematics, the students of uh, Singapore in um, science of grade four, they scored maximum. Similarly, the students of Singapore in grade eight, they scored maximum in um, uh, science and the uh, students of Singapore of grade uh, eight in uh, mathematics, they scored high. So in mathematics and science, the, uh, the students of fourth and grade um, uh, fourth and eighth grade, they scored outperform. They, they, their score were higher than other countries, uh, which are uh, the most advanced countries which include China and other countries. So it means that uh, we must also strive for it and we must also be part of the next uh, upcoming team study. I don't know um, uh, we as a nation are, uh, are preparing our students for that or not, but um, uh, we must not decline it. We must be part of it so that we can gauge um, the innovations which we are taking um, in, in the field of education. So, okay, uh, ma'am. 
okay ma'am sorry okay. for interrupting uh, okay let me conclude this that okay, uh, okay. so sorry, therefore i will suggest uh, to conduct another study uh, i was just uh, talking about teams because teams is also being considered in the development of single nation curriculum uh, masood has conducted a research with respect to uh, the curriculum of 2006 i am focusing on this that uh, this is a way forward this is a, a recommendation you can say that we can also conduct a study with respect to teams that whether we are aligning um, our science and mathematical curricula of single nation curriculum with the teams standards and last but not the least uh, i would like to congratulate the whole team uh, for the excellent coordination and timely execution for conducting this con a successful conference and looking forward to see you in the coming conference i love it and okay. goodbye madam shamsa aapko bhi acha ho okay okay Thank you, Madam, for sparing time and sharing your valuable information and knowledge. Uh, this is last session of sec uh, two days first international conference due to shortage of time. We skip the last presentation, and uh, in the end, I like to say thank you everybody for being part of this session. Keep joining; it's still going on. Over to Miss Saida Koko. Thank you, Dr. Shahzad Ahmed. I would like to invite and introduce Dr. Shamsa Aziz. for session concluding remarks she is an educationist and researcher in the field of education and currently she is serving with international islamic university islamabad as associate professor and chairperson department of education thank you very much dr shamsa aziz for joining our session and being a part of our conference over to you assalam alaikum and good evening uh, first uh, just a correction i am no more chair person i have completed my tenure <laughs> okay <clears throat> first of all i want to convey my gratitude to the fc for providing me a chance to be a part of this international conference and as we are <clears throat> proceeding towards the end so i congratulate you all who are in front and who are behind the scenes for the successful conduction of their first ever conference and hope the free kind of scholarly events could be continued in the nation in future covid-19 pandemic has taken away many things and changed the social and cultural fabric around the globe and perhaps most greatly perhaps the most badly affected sector is education but the other side of the story is that countries like pakistan have traveled a journey within one and a half year which otherwise may take decades in terms of integrating and using effective and efficient with the technology in teaching learning process not it all not only trained our students but for our teachers and even academia in this field moving towards the stem and steam this covid 19 has badly affected the stem and steam because it has been compelled to cut short its practical and lab based activities <clears throat> not only in teaching and learning but also in the assessment phase just think about those higher secondary school students who have just completed their higher secondary education without having any opportunity of practical aspects within their institutions and their assessment also based on their theory and know they have entered some of the university have admitted those students and some are in the process so they have entered into the professional life that depend on those skills which they should attain in this that very particular two year period of their intermediate so <clears throat> no the way forward in post covid phase is the time where we should think 
plan and implement. That is disconnected. Practical aspects of STEM and STEAM in a hybrid mode. Maybe by the using of simulations and use of technology for practical activities. So that, may God forbid, if we have to face this kind of situation in future, we cannot uh, uh, deprive uh, our students and they would be able to comprehend that uh, major component and most important component of their curriculum. Because STEM and STEAM is actually integration and development of five C's, that is creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, communication, and above all, curiosity. I may not be wrong if I say that STEM and STEAM is basically aimed at to produce love of learning in our students, and it cannot be done only in theory classes. So we have to think about it, that how we can use the technology and computer-based simulation activities for the performance of practical examinations. At the end, I want to share my reflection about the current session. The keynote speaker, Dr. Nasser, was fo uh, speech was focused on the science, STEM, STEAM, and especially teaching of science education in Pakistan. And he uh, gave us a very clear picture over the last five to six decades, what we have done with the science education. And at the end, he gave a hope that no through single national <laughs> curriculum, maybe we are uh, planning to do uh, rectify our mistakes in the past. The f three papers presented in this session uh, just want to share the key findings of those. In the first paper, it was very rightly recommended that science curriculum should include special <coughs> skills. Then the second paper found an alarming finding that private sector is far better than the public sector inculcating the process science skills in their students. And in the last, uh, again, it ended on a hope that uh, the uh, researcher gave us a comparison of elementary education in single education curriculum and the previous curriculum of 2006. And he concluded that it is focused on development of the skills. So let's hope for the implementation phase of this curriculum. With this, I want to thank you all and wish you all a happy future. And we will be uh, in uh, continuing to see such type of events conducted by FC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shamsalji, for such encouraging and remarkable views about the session. Finally, I would like to invite Director of Federal College of Education, Professor Dr. Ramya. Uh, Samia Rahman Dogar, for a few words, please. Thank you very much. I am. I really appreciate and thank you so very much for your scholarly uh, contribution to this event and supporting. And I'm particularly thankful to uh, Dr. Zia for uh, being here with us and supporting us. Sir, thank you so very much. We are really honored. My, me and my faculty, everyone is on. Thank you, Professor Dr. Samia Rahman Dugar, for such nice words. Finally, we are proceeding towards closing session of the papers international conference 2021, Global Academia during and post COVID 19, organized by Federal College of Education, Islamabad. I am sincerely grateful to all distinguished speakers, guest speakers, scholars, educationists, intellectuals, researchers, and students for participating in this conference. And, and make this conference successful. In this session, we will share reflections regarding conference by our chief guest, former director of the College of Education and participants. I would like to invite Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Dr. 
They are the new vice chancellor of Allahabad Bal University, Islamabad. He is an eminent leader in the field of education and research. His professional experience spans more than 28 years in a diverse range of the establishment of ID Institute and organizational planning and development remain the foremost highlights of this campaign. Thank you, Professor Dr. Zal Sayoon, for being a part of our conference. Over to you, sir. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, it's a uh, uh, big, uh, beginning of the end of this uh, uh, big conference for ever organized uh, by the Federal College of Education in the current situation and on the current topic. I happen to be, uh, I mean, I'm so grateful to the worthy uh, director of the Institute that she invited me uh, to welcome the worthy vice chancellor of a university which is of international repute and that is Allama Iqbal Open University. This college and Open University uh, was almost established uh, in the same time in 1974 uh, in pursuance uh, <clears throat> of uh, 1972 education policy. I call it first ed formal education policy of Pakistan and in which the concept of uh, open university was presented and a federal level uh, teachers training institution was uh, established. <clears throat> it is it's a really a big coincidence that uh, the founder uh, director of this college was a female and even the current director is a female. And I had uh, I have the privilege to be part of this conference uh, in, in the capacity that I was the first appointed uh, former teacher or uh, first teacher in, the, in this institution. So in that sense, I, I have a bigger advantage to uh, welcome the worthy vice chancellor and, the, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Zial Kayyum, who was uh, vice chancellor initially of University of Gujarat and uh, currently is in Alam Akbar Open University. Uh, honorable sir, Honorable Sir, this conference was a very gigantic task uh, undertaken <clears throat> by um, the dynamic leadership of uh, uh, Dr. Samia Dogar and her team, and they accepted this challenge in a time when the, uh, the entire world is facing from the most evil thing ever on earth in the current century or the, in the current time. And uh, yeah, um, uh, they touched upon a subject which is very important. I think there were eight teams uh, for this uh, for this conference. And since last two days, uh, I believe from nine to five, they have been uh, on, uh, constantly on uh, on air, online, and uh, conducted this conference. Uh, Thirteen. It's an international conference, so like thirteen countries. Um, uh, people from 13 countries participated and all the sessions went very well. The methodology for this conference was very interesting and very uh, impressive. And the uh, quality of, uh, I constantly, I was on online and the quality of paper and the presentation, discussion, question answering was superb. I, I uh, would not hesitate in saying that uh, one of the best ever I attended in my life. So congratulations to uh, Samia, congratulations to the entire team. And, uh, and we are further honored with the, present, the presence of you, sir, that you came or spared your valuable time and honored this uh, closing session. Uh, Minister uh, for Education was there and uh, for, uh, for the opening session and all other people were there around. Vajia was there uh, today morning, Parliament Secretary, Secretary of Education was there and now you are closing. So um, on behalf of this college and in on behalf of this team, uh, I take the privilege in, uh, to welcome you for this. Uh, closing session, and uh, it's over to you, sir.
Rahman Rahim. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, Professor Dr. Dr. And uh, thank you very much, the Director of the College, uh, Dr. Samia Dogar Saiba. Uh, I'm really happy and delighted to be with my colleagues. Uh, and it's really a privilege to be in, uh, in, in a forum where all academics are there and they are sharing their views, their experiences. And not only from, from within Pakistan, I can see, as Professor Talat mentioned, colleagues from 13 different countries uh, were participating and they, they presented their research, their views, their experiences. Uh, and collectively, we deliberated upon the challenges faced by the institutions, especially in the covered scenario. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the, the, the thoughts shared during the proceedings of this conference would be really helpful for all of us, and especially for a country like Pakistan, where we are constrained due to really maybe different uh, challenges we, we normally come across, um, which include but not limited to the factors like the connectivity challenges, um, the availability of the digital devices or the gadgetry to the student for the faculty members and the students both. And obviously, uh, a very uh, I mean, an apparent challenge would be uh, the lack of understanding of the online, the peculiar. Uh, skills required to, to impart training and, and teaching in an online world. Uh, these were a few of the challenges. And when I look at uh, the different different sessions, especially during the uh, first day of the conference, uh, whosoever has planned it, it's really mammoth a task, I, I agree. But the topics chosen by, uh, by which were cho uh, chose, uh, chosen by uh, the management of uh, this event uh, were really are really worth praising. Uh, we, they have tried to really touch almost all facets of this whole uh, ecosystem or, or, or the environment. Uh, and uh, I mean, correspondingly, uh, all of us would feel educated and enlightened by the thoughts shared by the experts from all around the world. Um, I tend to really speak about these things in, in, in two different roles. One as a teacher, obviously uh, a teacher who was taught in a face-to-face -face world, I mean, throughout of his career, a teacher who uh, actually has served for almost three decades in institutions where the teaching and learning environment is kind of face-to-face -face, uh, uh, teaching environment, teaching and learning environment, and now uh, switching to a role, uh, a very, very, I mean, I, I, it's obviously, I mean, a matter of prestige and respect when I say that I'm really heading an institution and heading a team of academics at Allah Mike University, which was a university established almost 46 years ago. Uh, and I, I really salute the wisdom and uh, thought of person who then conceived to have an institution in Pakistan when probably nobody would be talking about distance education or online education. So a university established, which was probably second in the world after Open University of UK, uh, and which was a wise to see. And I think, I mean, when I look at the history of this institution, having almost 1.2, 1.3 million students providing access to education to all nick and corners of, nook and corners of Pakistan, uh, at, at different levels of education. So heading that institution is a matter of, matter of prestige and pride, but at the same time, uh, it has its own inherent challenges, especially when, when we talk about living in the technology age, living in 21st century, and then hit by COVID anyway. Uh, so in these two perspectives and roles, I, I, I was looking at the summary of uh, the thoughts shared by different colleagues uh, during the sessions of uh, maybe uh, the first session where the use of technology was discussed, then the, I mean, the colleagues talk, talked about inclusive education, autism, uh, and I mean, touching the educational leadership challenges um, in higher education sector, and especially during the COVID. If I very quickly give, uh, I mean, uh, uh, my view about these things, uh, I think we, we even now are not very much conversant with the needs and, and the choice of technological interventions which could enable online education. 
And I was talking to a colleague just uh, today that uh, one of the reasons why we are apprehensive about uh, online education, why we are apprehensive about uh, the level of learning, extent of learning, quality of learning in an online world is just because of the fact that we are not used to it. We are not trained for it. 98% of the faculty members of this sector, right from the schools to the university level, were not really trained for this purpose. And secondly, um, I, I'm, I'm delighted to see my colleagues from Alamai Khan Open University as well, who, who, who could bear me out and while, while I say the instructional design strategies, and this is what I also learned, and I'm learning, still learning, that the, the design strategies for the content development and for the content design for the courses which are to be offered in an online mode are absolutely different from that we actually use in a kind of face-to-face -face mode of education. Well, yes, we accept that there were challenges. We were really hit by COVID. I mean, if we specifically talk about this whole, whole uh, one and a half years or two years we have spent, um, I, I really salute my faculty members. I really salute uh, the resilience of this society. I mean, the, the, the student community, obviously, who adapted to this change very rapidly. And collective, collectively, we have tried to save the academic interests and time of uh, precious time of the students anyway somehow really managing to continue with academic activities. But there is, I, I really see little effort to improving the state of affairs, probably due to the fact that we at the back of our head have in mind, well, we'll reverse to the normal situation and we'll go to the face-to-face -face mode. So we are not really putting in all efforts to put the environment in place which could, which could really ascertain to an extent quality of education is being given to the students. We are making stopgap arrangements. And in the presence of the current scenario where we even do not have an open distance learning policy in the country. So you mentioned about the first education policy of government of Pakistan, education policy in 1972, we have different draft policies and versions of the policies. Those are now key policy up there. Do we have? an online education policy which governs the processes in this world? No. So in the absence of this policy and taking into account the fact that the faculty members could not be really trained due to reasons for this mode of education and correspondingly, obviously, the students faced challenges, there's a strong need and time has come that we should embrace uh, this fact that the technology, at, like in any, any other field, is need of the day. Technological interventions, whether you talk about face-to-face -face education or you talk about online education in particular, you cannot actually live in this world without using technology, technological interventions, uh, and especially in this online education mode. Uh, so there is a strong need to, uh, I mean, and since Education College, as, as Madam Seba was saying, and uh, uh, Dr. Talat Khurshid mentioned, this college has the mandate, primarily was having a mandate to actually train the teachers. And some or other, like many other places, we, we lost that agenda somehow. Uh, so let, let, I mean, realizing the fact that it is need of the time, let's now, I mean, realign our priorities and prepare the roadmaps for next maybe two years, three years, where the school teachers, the college teachers, and the university teachers are to be trained uh, at each respective level for actually having a good understanding of online education. This is one aspect actually I wanted to talk about. The second aspect, obviously, is about the leaderships of the institutions. I come from a technology background. It's easier for me to understand the need of use of technology. And I've been really advocating it. But this level of acceptance, I, I really find lacking in most of my leadership. I'm sorry, I'm really blunt in saying this, but I, I, I find it, I mean, rel find reluctance when it comes to use of technology and acceptance and embracing the technology in our in our day to day routines, whether it is in administrative processes or it is about the academic processes. So, and there is always a fear of change anyway. Let's accept it, uh, and that fear could really only be uh, addressed if we could train 
the leadership of the institutions right from the school level to uh, to the university levels uh, regarding the benefits advantages merits and challenges obviously which could really they face while while actually adopting the technological interventions into their environments and uh, this brings along anyway uh, the challenges faced in in the classroom environments when we talk about the specially enabled children whether it is autism or any special need uh, boys and girls and uh, the teacher anyway has to be trained so that that category of students can be addressed without really pointing out or maybe giving them an impression to the other class fellows well someone is uh, weak in learning for example or is feeling or facing difficulty in learning they may be slow learners maybe so whether our teachers are trained to really deal with that situation i think mostly not and again now there are very good softwares and even uh, the frameworks available where such students can really be uh, uh, can, can really be provided assistance so that their learning could be really uh, uh, imp uh, can 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 be improved um, early childcare education or early childhood education this is something which we do not we ever talked about uh, my institution, uh, I, I, I can share with you, is going to establish with the help of uh, uh, different development uh, sector partners, uh, a center of excellence in early child, uh, child care education. And a very interesting idea came during the discussions that instead of really focusing on to zero to three, let's talk about minus one to three. A very interesting an idea and Alhamdulillah, uh, we are very much on it. We, we hope that once we establish that, that, that institution, we'll be happy to share our experiences and the facilities to the fellow institutions to the sister institutions as well but we, we really need to focus on and work on these aspects now coming to the other side of the story uh, these are all academic discussions let's face the realities as well my university is a university which operates uh, in almost all parts of the country uh, when we talk about technology when we talk about an online education whether it's COVID or there's no COVID. This solution anyway even can help in uh, improving the access of education in any case. Um, so let, let, let's, let's plan our, our strategies to really uh, use technology, improve the quality, extent of learning, and at the same time, access of education as well. Talking about 250,000, I'm, I'm just talking for a sentence as a, uh, like, like a footnote only. Can we really address 250, uh, when we talk about 25 million out of school children? This could be probably 27 million now because the growth rate actually, whatever children you can really teach who are out of school, by that time you have another few millions when, when you could really train those boys and girls who are out of school. Can you really do it manually? I challenge we cannot do it. One, we need partnerships to address this huge gigantic challenge of out of school children. And secondly, probably with appropriate technological solutions and interventions, we can address this target. But what I was going to say is the ground realities. The ground reality is if you go to or go out of Quetta, for example, in Balochistan, you don't find internet connectivity. You go to the tribal areas, now the merged districts of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, you don't find internet connectivity. You go to interior of Sindh and Thar, I've traveled the whole of Thar. Whatever I'm saying, I've experienced it. I've traveled by myself because my university is responsible for it. I'm leading that sector. My institution is leading that sector. So I should have the ground realities. I, I should see it by my own self before taking the decisions so that the extent of difficulty, difficulties could be really gauged. And um, yes, there are challenges when we move out of the urban areas. So there is a strong need really uh, for the policymakers to plan strategies to take this, to reduce this digital divide across the country. If we really want to uh, achieve the targets, targets of access, targets of uh, providing education to, to, to the masses living in different parts of the country, and obviously if we want to make use of online learning. And this online learning, by the way, is not only to get education or degrees, for example, you talk about skills education. You talk about capacity development and capacity building activities. You anyway have to have environments which could enable uh, these activities at a scale. And I'm happy to share, uh, I mean, that since my institution is part of different policy discussions, 
uh, when we uh, actually shared this uh, with the Honorable Minister for Education, uh, and same was probably conveyed to the Prime Minister of Pakistan, and an interministerial committee was formed at the direction of the Prime Minister, uh, which is what, uh, which has different stakeholders. I mean, the NTC, PTA, telecom operators, uh, Ministry of Telecom, Ministry of Education, and where the Prime Minister has given the direction to uh, to actually uh, as possible, as quickly as possible, to take this uh, uh, connectivity to the remotest parts of the country so that uh, people can be really, uh, I mean, provided that enabling environment where they can uh, then hook on uh, with different learning environments. Uh, secondly, there is another very interesting initiative uh, currently uh, in, in Ministry of Education with help of international donor agencies. <clears throat> uh, normally we talk about challenges we have been talking about faculty trainings, but we, when we, we, we should really be talking about the content as well, especially in the school education. Uh, I mean, it's difficult for the boys and girls of age five, six, seven, eight years to sit before the computers maybe for a few hours. If they don't find the content interesting, they won't really sit before actually on, on, the, on these, at these devices. So the content development was the missing link, I, I should say, which we have experienced in the universities, as I said in the beginning, but which is need of the art that we localized, context, local contextual knowledge is to be present in the content we are actually going to design, especially for the schools, which suits our traditions, norms, culture, religion, and traditions of, of this society. And a very interesting initiative um, has really been started in, at the ministry level where uh, a comprehensive activity is going to really be led by Ministry of Education by engaging ed tech companies from within Pakistan. Uh, Alama Akbal Open University is also part of that initiative. Uh, a directorate of, uh, uh, or a section in the ministry has been established by, uh, with the direct, by the direction of Honorable Minister. A distance education uh, kind of setup has been established in the university. Alama Akbal Open University shall be providing all uh, knowledge support uh, to, to, to that center and any other initiatives in the ministry um, where the contact uh, uh, the, the content shall be designed especially for the schools uh, from grade one till maybe grade 10 i guess and uh, i can see the mastermind behind this single national curriculum thing and uh, different activities which were taken up by the ministry mr rafiq tarsab tarsab assalamu alaikum rahmatullah uh, and thank you very much for joining us. So he was the person, honestly, who steered this activity, who has a huge contribution uh, uh, to, to really contribute in, in his own capacity as Rafiq Tahir and then engaging colleagues and partners uh, to actualize the concept of single national curriculum uh, under the patronage of Honorable Minister and the Ministry of Education on the direction of uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan. Uh, one last thing which I want to say is the choice of technology. <clears throat> um, now, every one of us has experienced different forms of technological interventions during these one and a half years. We rightfully have an idea when we talk about learning environments, whether different kinds of softwares, the meeting softwares can provide that learning environment. I very humbly say, would like to say no. So when I say that there is a need to have a policy framework which governs online education, I the design strategies to prepare the course material to be offered in these environments, the teacher training, and the carrier through which, using which, will take this learning material towards the students. And that carrier obviously is a technology enhanced, technology enabled carrier, which could take the learning material towards the students, which can then have embedded features of measurement at some levels about the extent of learning, about implementing different quality standards uh, within, within, through the technological interventions within uh, the learning environment, which we normally call a learning management system. It could be anything. It could be any software, but it has to be really specifically designed uh, to provide learning environment to the students, 
let's not talk only about online education. That facility is even required for a face-to-face -face education as well. And last thing, assessment methods. The university is also really struggling and putting in all efforts to really come up with the novel way of evaluating the students. I normally say having that 30 years experience of face-to-face -face education at my back, we teach the students in an online mode. And we argue, as I'm also arguing, design strategies, instructional design is different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The student is not learning from the environment. The student is not learning from the peers. Um, it has its own inherent challenges anyway. But when it comes to assessment, we place those 50 or 100 or 10,000 students in similar rooms and provide them a question paper and ask them to attempt those questions. Like any other student who was really provided a 16 weeks of mentoring, counseling, teaching, learning from the environment, learning from the peers, learning from the fellow colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. Come on, what we are doing. Is it right way of assessing these students who were taught in an online environment? No. I mean, I, I can safely say, no, this is not the best way of doing it. What is that alternative way? There are different alternatives. My university has also tried different. The learning management systems have inbuilt components where formative type of assessment can be really carried out. But what if they don't have access to technological gadgets and the internet? Two, what about the summative assessments? Should we be using the same type of summative, summative assessment and the type of questions we normally pose ask in a face-to-face -face model? Answer should be no, it shouldn't be the same. And what is the best way of assessing them? Probably we don't have a very specific research, uh, researched answer of this question, though we have our own uh, alternatives, open book uh, examinations or maybe uh, 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 safe browser-based, for example, computer-based assessments, et cetera, et cetera. But the, yet we have to have a formal framework of assessment, especially in an online mode. Uh, and the, my university would, I mean, we, we are through a digital transformation phase, which is almost over. And inshallah, during the next couple of months, we'll try to really work on the assessment methods with the help, help of my colleagues in the university and fellow colleagues in other universities. So this was something which I had in mind to share. I mean, because I, I, I thought, I mean, I'm talking to uh, the academics, which have varied background, varied thoughts uh, about education and online education in particular. So I may share my views about this whole philosophy of education and especially philosophy education and its change during this COVID scenario. But let's get out of this COVID world, I think. Let's, let's come back. Whatever we have, this is the normal, new normal, whatever you call it, this is what we have around us. Let's do in our own humble capacities, the best way, whatever is possible in our capacities. Uh, and talking about, talking always about maybe troubles, constraints, challenges, which, which came along with COVID, let's not talk about it. Let's talk about teaching and learning. Let's talk about how to improve learning of the students, whatever situation we have, let's accept it and let's move on. And one last thing, I mean, I could only, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking time. Uh, I was overhearing when my last colleague was actually presenting her talk on STEM education, I guess, and talking about PIMS. We have discussed at Alamai Kuala Lumpur University as well. Our we were second from the bottom in maths. And uh, the two others down us were probably Morocco and Philippines, I guess, if I'm not wrong. I'm sorry, I'm, I mean, if I'm a bit, uh, I mean, I'm not able to recall it exactly. And it really hit me. We have been talking about STEM probably since ages. Uh, so this reflects upon, I think, not exactly on the curriculum, upon the teachers' training, their competence, their level of involvement, and correspondingly, which reflects upon the performance of the students as well. Um, 
So I, I, I think, I mean, needless to mention, the teacher training is to be a continuous process. It doesn't stop anywhere. But uh, especially in the school education department and in the, at the level of schools, probably, teacher training is necessarily required. Our boys and girls are also going to the schools. Are we really satisfied with whatever we, we actually get from the schools? Let's accept. Unless we accept there is a need for improvement, we won't be able to improve it. Let's accept it. There's, there's no harm, honestly. It's for the sake of this nation. It's for the sake of this country anyway. Even if we forget about for a moment about TIMS and our performance in TIMS, for example. This is need of the time. We would keep, we'll, we'll keep on criticizing maybe. Uh, I, as a university teacher, would start criticizing my tertiary, my uh, secondary education or the school education. And as a country, for example, when you talk about the standards of education, people always complained about the quality of education and the quality of graduates the universities are producing. Come on, it's all collective responsibility. Can you really expect that the universities can change the personality traits and dimensions of a boy or a girl coming to the universities at the age of 20 years? And who is going to join the university for a particular technical kind of degree or education? Yes, the universities can further polish their skills, their personality traits, their personality uh, strengths, uh, improve the weaknesses, but you cannot really redefine the personality at a 360 degree view, only in the universities. This role has to be really taken up by all ingredients and those ingredients include the parents, the society, and then schools, colleges and the universities. Let's accept it and let's start playing our respective roles as a, as a member of the society as well. Whatever you teach in a university, if we do not see it happening in the society, it is, it is something, a contradiction I'm giving to my boys and girls who are coming to the institutions. Let's accept it and let's play our respective roles at the government level, at the policy level, at the society level, the elders of the society are to play the roles and then the institutions are to play their respective roles. I'm sorry, I'm a bit blunt, but I'm talking like a teacher and a parent as well. And as a member of the society, as a passionate member of this professional community who wants to improve the current state of affairs with the help of my fellow colleagues and with the help of these institutions. God bless us all, Pakistan Sindhapa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Ziaul Kayum, for sparing your time and sharing such a nice and significant ideas. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Maureen Manning from USA for conference reflection, please. She is an international trainer, presenter, and keynote speaker. She has also worked as adjunct professor, teacher trainer, and professional development facilitator. Thank you, Dr. Maureen, for being a part of our conference. Thank you so much for the lovely introductions and greetings to all of my esteemed colleagues here. I wanted to start off by offering my heartfelt thanks to the director, Professor Dr. Samia Dogra, and to all of the conference organizers for their hard work of organizing this interesting, informative, and highly important conference. It was well organized and well executed and the lessons learned from attendance at this conference will surely lead to improved teaching and learning. It was indeed an honor to participate in the Global Academia during and post COVID-19 conference. And over the past two days, directors, professors, educators and aspiring educators have co-constructed knowledge around teacher education in the age of COVID-19. Leaders in the field of higher education shared their experiences, their concerns, their reflections, and their suggestions as to how we move forward in teacher education in 2021 and beyond. And as I reflect about today's events, I reviewed the myriad notes I took during the discussions, as well as the thoughts that I put into writing that will hopefully translate to future action as I plan for future teacher education sessions. Today, during the teacher education panel, my colleagues and I discussed the evolving nature of teacher education over the centuries, and we considered deeply how we create and co-create knowledge. 
Panelists considered both pre-service and in-service education. Today, we heard from colleagues who discussed the trajectory of the education systems as it pertains to varying certification requirements in different countries and even in different areas of one country, such as the US. Panelists shared both challenges and successes about providing teacher education in the age of COVID-19 and beyond. We examined teacher education regarding pedagogy, assessment, evaluation. As well, we discussed professional development given the construct of varying infrastructure and in collaboration with partners. And we discussed the hallmarks of quality teacher education that transcends time, space, and language. For if providers of teacher education programs are basing their programs on quality principles, such as relevant content, participant engagement, sustainability, and high standards, then the vehicle for delivery via Zoom or Google or in-person or otherwise becomes secondary. Moreover, education leaders were asked to consider teacher education as a part that fits into the bigger picture, how it relates to organizational goals while also meeting the needs of individual teachers. And participants were also asked to reflect upon how they are meeting the moment. Given the increasing diversity in some countries and the necessity of distance learning elsewhere, how are we rising to the challenge to meet the needs of pre-service and in-service teachers? And how can we ensure that we continue to move the needle forward in a transformative way? This conference provided us with an opportunity to share best practices and enhance our own practice with concrete suggestions from others. And it is the hope that we will all leave this conference this evening with a renewed and a refreshed perspective, that we are reinvigorated as educators, ready to rethink and revamp our practice as necessary in order to provide the rigorous and engaging education for 21st century learners. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maureen, for sharing your such worth praising thoughts. Now I would like to invite Dr. Hamid for a vote of thanks, please. I am on behalf of my faculty, Federal College of Education. I thank all the participants who have participated in different capacities in this two days conference. I further thank the honorable worthy vice chancellor, Dr. Zal Kayoum, who especially spared time and came in this conference and shared his views regarding the global academia during a post COVID-19. I also thank especially to Professor Taral Khurshid, who has uh, came a long way and uh, participated in this two day workshop. He was uh, almost uh, with us for his maximum time in these two days and has given a very well. I also, I also, thank my colleagues who had been working day and night for this uh, conference for the many days, I say months, uh, which is a success for this institution. And uh, on this, I thank you to become the part of this, or, uh, this conference and hope uh, the next conference will be more successful than this. Although we think we have a very wonderful uh, participation from all corners from the world for this conference. Thank you again for all your participation, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hamid. <clears throat> now I would like to invite former director, Federal College of Education, Professor Rafiq Tahir Sahab for conference reflection, please. Much, uh, I will not make any reflection this conference because uh, the chief spoken, and uh, I'm very thankful to Professor Dr. Zal Kayum. He has very comprehensively 
concluded the theme of this conference. When I was listening to him, I was just thinking that Dr. Zayal Singh was a part of this conference from last two days, and he listened the contribution of each and every uh, participant and each and every you see the pe people who uh, was a part of the different panels. Uh, this was the excellent effort made by this uh, this college and very timely intervention. You see. Uh, the Ministry of Education and all other departments, there are so, so much talking about this COVID situation and the uh, online teaching and so many other things. But unfortunately, uh, we have not done a very conclusive thing where we all sit down and discuss and debate uh, that the uh, this challenge as well as this challenge opportunity. So uh, all the topics, which was uh, discussed during this Tuesday's proceedings was excellent. And I think every participant made have a justice with their topic. Even all the panel uh, from Pakistan and abroad, they have given their very thought-provoking, thought you see, the ideas about this uh, challenge, as well as they have also suggested the different solution, uh, how to handle the situation. And as the Dr. Zayal Kim said, it's not no, uh, it, it should be taken as a routine, as this thing we are doing now. This is the this is this challenge of becoming opportunity, and everywhere in the world, and even in Pakistan, now we have introduced so many alternate uh, teaching learning processes through online and use of the technology. Uh, I would like to appreciate the work of this quality of this college uh, because I stay as a director for this college for some time but this is an excellent you see the contribution timely contribution which is done by this uh, this college and they have hosted our two days international conference uh, I hope so when this uh, uh, two days international conference will be come um, uh, came out as a document that will again be very useful for not only in Pakistan as well as the in the foreign country in the other countries of the world. My conclusion is the leadership, educational leadership, always matters. Even if we talk about the Alamo Iqbal Open University at the moment, so leadership uh, there that that itself speaks that what is happening in the institution. And the same here for the Federal College of Education, that is the new leadership, Professor Dogar. Uh, Professor Dogar, thank you so much and congratulations to your faculty that you have uh, organized very, you see, an excellent event, very timely event, <clears throat> and very, very much related to the present ground realities in education sector of Pakistan as well as internationally. So uh, my best wishes uh, this college and for their future endeavors inshallah and they will be able to host and organize uh, such, some other events like this be the very useful for the uh, for the education sector of Pakistan as well as internationally. Thank you so much and I'm particularly uh, 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 extend my gratitude and thanks to Professor Dr. Durkayum that when I requested him to become the uh, chief guest for the closing, just he took only 15 seconds and said, yes, I'm here to contribute. And today's speech is the, itself a reflection that how much he is concerned is relevant to the theme of this two days international conference. Dr. Sir, thank you so much. I'll just say thanks to the uh, Director of Federal College of Education and faculty members and my colleague, uh, Dr. Professor Talat, is the part of this conference from last two days. I was supposed to come uh, today in the conclusion, in this conclusion. Unfortunately, I have uh, some health issue in the morning, so I requested the uh, director that I will not be able to join you physically because, it, because she was so much interested that Dr. Kiyum is coming and you have to over here and receive him also. I said, okay, but uh, unfortunately, 
Uh, now I'm feeling well, but in the morning I was some little bit healthy. So by prayers and best wishes for Federal College of Education in future also. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing such a nice words. Finally, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Samia Rahman Dogar, Director of Federal College of Education, for a vote of thanks. And I think so, Professor Dr. Ziaul Kayum, Professor Rafiq Tahir, and Professor Talat Khurshid has concluded so well. So I don't think so any more words. Uh, just I would like to say thanks for um, this scholarly contribution and uh, uh, giving me the respect for you are here in my institution on behalf of my faculty, director, and my students, everyone. I would like just say thanks to everyone and all the facilitator, all our supporters, Site Savers Pakistan, Pakistan Alliance, the Google and everyone. I'm so obliged, so thankful from the core of my heart. Thank you very much. Now I would uh, request uh, Sir Professor Dr. Ziaul Kayum for the uh, award distribution. So please. Get ready for national anthem. Stay safe and healthy. Have a nice time. Allah Hafiz.